Hello and welcome to day three of the EDHE Lochotla. It is our fourth annual Lochotla and we're super excited to be here with you as we explore African entrepreneurship through technology. My name is Nziki Mkize. Um, I've had the pleasure of hosting you for the past two days and I'll be here the rest of the week. And alongside with me, I have my co-host, Linda. Hi, Nziki, and how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, I'm excited. I'm like... I know more than I knew on Monday, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, 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 a re it's going to be a really interesting day, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. No, indeed, indeed. And we um, had an amazing uh, time yesterday. Some of the speeches that we heard, um, you know, Prof. Ahmed Bawa, Professor Ahmed Bawa, we also had our minister, Dr. Bladen Zimande, coming on to, to share um, some um, remarks from his side as well. So um, what are you looking forward to today, Ziggy? Um, I can't pick one thing, I must be <laughs> honest. Um, I think all the sessions today have different values and different aspects to give insights yeah. from. So yeah. I'm looking forward to everything I, I could say. Um, but if you did miss yesterday, here's a quick highlight and recap of what happened. We'll be back again tomorrow morning. Um, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow and for another incredible day of valuable insights that we're looking forward to sharing with you. Until then, I'm Ziggy Mkhize. And I am Linda Tata. We'll and see you tomorrow. <laughs> Cheers. I'm sure you can see that that was an incredible day indeed. If you missed any of it, um, if there's a talk that looks like it stands out to you and you'd like to find out more about it, you can go onto the Hoover app and just click on yesterday's agenda or Monday's agenda and you can re-watch those sessions and those clips will be available. And if you have friends who are interested in watching and they just haven't had the opportunity to register via Hoover, let them know they can head over to our Facebook page at EDHE Student Entrepreneurship and they can watch the live stream from there as well. And we also want to hear from you 
so please do engage with us across all social media find us on linkedin facebook instagram and twitter and remember all your comments you can share using the hashtag edh 2020 and also hashtag afrotech i'd also like to take a moment to thank all our sponsors without them this event would not be possible so a big thank you to ucdp a big thank you to university south africa the department of higher education and training as well as the british council now yesterday we ran a number of competitions so for engaging on the hoover app um, we have people on the leaderboard right and there's a winner for that and we also have people taking pictures during the conference linda who won on our leaderboard yesterday so um, yesterday we announced our winner uh, for the photo uh, competition the selfie competition and the very same person is the winner on the leaderboard so the winner for today's prize he will get a take a lot voucher for 150 rands and his name is Ndam Ndamulelo Nelwamondo so he is leading on the leaderboard with 75,400 points I think he needs to give people some tips on yeah. how to earn those points. <laughs> he does, and I, I had a glimpse at the leaderboard as well, and the lady who was number one yesterday, so that was Haza, yeah. um, she was number one, she's number two, number today, two today, so she has given somebody else room. <laughs> um, and you can also still have the opportunity to climb up on that leaderboard. Okay. Um, Haza, you haven't contacted us yet, so our team will get in touch with you to get your prize to you. But um, yeah. yeah, that's our leaderboard winner for today. For today, and we also invite people to continue taking selfies, um, as we've announced today's winners right now. We'll be looking out on the leaderboard um, who climbs up that ladder. And tomorrow we'll announce the winner of the leaderboard as well as the photo competition again. Awesome. So heading over into our first session for today, um, I think one of the big things that have been coming out this week is because of the lockdown and the pandemic and everybody working from home, technology is a big thing. You know, I think we've always known this, but this has really brought it to the forefront. So we're going to be speaking about high tech innovation mm -hmm. in Africa. And I'd like to welcome to our virtual stage, our session chair, Dr. Tandim Gwebu, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Internationalization at Nelson Mandela University. She was born um, in the Eastern Cape and she brings significant leadership knowledge and experience in managing multiple functions and large scale divisions and initiatives in the newly restructured portfolio. Um, which is evidenced by an exemplary career in both research management and higher education sector. Dr. Mgwebu has a PhD in medical cell and developmental biology from the University of Cape Town. She has a management development program certificate from the University of Stellenbosch um, and their business school. And she also has a postgraduate qualification in tertiary education from the University of Melbourne in Australia. She completed her postdoctoral studies and research fellowship at the Institute of Infectious Diseases at Mo in, and Molecular Medicine at UCT. Um, over to you, Dr. Mgwebu. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm uh, introduction. Uh, I must say I'm excited about the session and uh, a warm welcome to, to my colleagues who are the speakers and the, to the team that's joining us virtually. Thank you very much. Um, greetings from the warmish um, Port Elizabeth this morning. And um, I'm going to start sharing uh, my screen about the session before we start. So as you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, our session is on high-tech innovation in Africa, and uh, I will be the moderator this morning, and my name is Tandim Gwebi, as already mentioned. The order of the session is such that we've got uh, three speakers, um, and I will take them in turn as the times indicated. And after each of the speakers, I would like to give just five minutes for high level questions or discussion. And then if we have time at the end, it would be great to have um, a discussion. Just to, to introduce um, the, the session, uh, just a few comments about this session about high tech innovation in Africa. Over the last two, I guess two decades, um, there's been advances in, in Africa, particularly in technology. And these have really shown how innovation can contribute to economic development across the continent. But by understanding how the application of changes in technologies uh, take hold globally from initial discovery to new commercial products, processes or services, 
uh, private companies and firms in Africa can better deploy investment into successful innovations so that we can propel the continent's productivity and growth. Uh, we see a few African success stories that have been highlighted in many platforms. I'm talking about mobile, a phone solar charging, for example, examples in agriculture, in education, particularly in Kenya, in, in, which is a magnet for, for high-tech incubators. Uh, but what we also see is that these are supported by public policy that can influence uh, business growth. And, but we see also obstacles and opportunities that are presented through these obstacles. But by overcoming these obstacles, policymakers can drive technology advances that lead to economic growth uh, and productivity. But also many countries within the continent must contend with skilled worker shortages at all levels. The changing world of work is also presenting many obstacles or, and opportunities. And we will hear about this uh, during this, this session. One of the other things that has been highlighted by many um, tech founders and innovators is the issue of availability of funding, uh, which has been a talking point in many platforms. Um, another highlight that I would like to, 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 to talk about in introducing the session is that of uh, startups, uh, backing startups uh, in the continent. There are many examples uh, of ecosystems that are working within the continent. I can highlight Somalia's ecosystem, for example, which is shown to be thriving against all odds and, uh, and many others that we can hear. But also another motivator is role modeling, role modeling in terms of highlighting Africa's leading innovators. And this has been shown uh, to be effective, not only for in entrepreneurship, but also for research purposes. So I'm not here to speak, but I'm here to introduce uh, my panelists or contributors to this session. We are going to start by introducing uh, Professor Derek Swart. And Professor Derek Swart is the former vice chancellor um, of, the, of Nelson Mandela University and also former vice chancellor of the University of Forte. He now serves uh, as an advisor to the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, Science and Innovation, and also our chief strategy officer um, for the ocean sciences at Nelson Mandela University. So he's gonna be setting the stage and uh, with an opening address on behalf of the USAF World of Work Strategy Group. Over to you, Professor Swart. Good morning, uh, Sistandi, and good morning, my colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, invitation. I'm really humbled at the opportunity to be able to share uh, a few uh, reflections on my side uh, on behalf of the uh, strategy group that uh, of USAF that has essentially been uh, constructed to begin to think about the impact of, of the tumultuous changes of these unprecedented uh, technologies and, and the revolutions in science, in fact, a, in reshaping the nature of work and jobs and careers and so on. And, and so it's really uh, a privilege for me able to um, have this opportunity on behalf of the strategy group. My thanks to uh, Ahmed Bawa, Professor Bawa, and Nora, Nora Clark, and other colleagues who've been working uh, uh, so so well behind the scenes to, to pull this, this together. Uh, um, I'm going to take a bit of a left field on, on, on this because almost every day in my job, I speak about the, the science and the technology issues. In this instance, of course, we're talking about high technologies, but presumably, to the cause of the conference, we will be speaking about all forms of technological change at intermediary and at low grassroots level in the entire national system of innovation. Uh, system of in, uh, innovation. But I'm going to take a bit of a left uh, uh, field here on behalf of the group just to stand back a bit uh, uh, to talk about the why uh, we are doing this. Just to remind myself, certainly, and uh, I guess also reflect on, on you on that and the context within which we are doing this focusing on African entrepreneurship through uh, technology. I mean, the topic is certainly absolutely uh, germane and relevant to the 
to the to the situation facing our country and our world at this moment. We are, in fact, to put it uh, not a finer point to it, in a huge mess. We 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 facing uh, a major challenge today. A crisis is, is is probably the right word. A failing economy, with with some serious consequences facing the very stability of our democracy. Uh, the key symptoms of this economic crisis that is facing South Africa today are well known. Massive levels of joblessness, high and growing rates of unemployment, as we've seen stark levels of social inequality, and a palpable failure, as we've seen, in the public domain by both the state and the private sector to provide requisite leadership to overcome the, these challenges as well. The economy itself is in a structural cul-de-sac, a straitjacket. It has been for the last four to five decades, dominated on the one hand by large-scale firms with relatively or comparatively low levels of innovation or locally driven innovation, low levels of private uh, spend on R&D. Uh, we've just done a major study. I used to chair one of the uh, advisory structures on, on, on innovation, NACI. And we've just looked at the last five years at the trajectory of spending of, of, of the private sector on, on, on R&D and domestically uh, generated R&D, and it has gone one way down. We have an underdeveloped uh, SME sector and informal sectors with very weak uh, uh, backward linkages into the formal and indeed the export economy. And that's just that's not working. We have growing levels of capital intensification that began in the 1960s, so those who you study economic history, followed by similar waves after the 2007-2008 financial crisis. It's accelerated the process of uh, uh, you know, capital intensification. Uh, and currently, of course, it's fueled further by major new advances in, in digital technologies, the fourth industrial revolution, the robotics automation, and, and so on related to the issues that I think presumably we are discussing for, 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 for uh, the duration of this conference. And new forms of social stratification acting on the back of pre-existing inequalities. And it heralds very serious risks to our economy and indeed, as I said earlier, on uh, the stability of our democracy. Technological transformations which is the particular point in, in focus of this conference in particular, has begun to trigger massive disruptions, not just in the, in the production of goods and services, but also and perforce labor markets, of course, as well. And with us, the very nature of work, that's why we formed the strategy group some six years ago, and the nature of jobs and the careers that we've, we've constructed to, to, as proxies of, 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 of those jobs and around which we wrapped, you know, qualifications, frameworks, curricula, forms of pedagogy, and forms of engagement with industry as well. But whilst these particular challenges are historically specific and peculiar to South Africa, it is not totally unique, because much of the rest of the world today, as we know, uh, is facing uh, similar uh, uh, existential crises and threats, and that also heralds new opportunities as well. I want to just highlight five, just for us to think uh, broadly about as we begin to explore deeply into um, high technology trans transformation uh, and uh, possibilities in South Africa. Five overarching pressure points uh, that presents threats to us, but also new opportunities, I guess, as, as well. And they're fairly familiar, but I, I want to just remind myself also of why this is important. Uh, uh, the first is climate change, you know, and with us loss of biodiversity and limits on available natural resources to support human life on our planet. We've been altering the biophysical characteristics, the structures of our, our planet's atmospheres, um, its weather systems, uh, and, and that itself has then triggered off major losses of biodiversity, push species on the brink of extinction. We've uh, acidified our oceans. We've altered the, the structural characteristics of, of the planet as a system, uh, you, you know, over many, many years of industrialization. And, and 
so climate change is an important contextual, you know, uh, terrain in which we're going to have to think about entrepreneurship in higher education and the innovation required to respond to that. Major demographic shifts, changes in our population it has grown, you know, in barely a few decades to over 7.2 billion people on the planet. And within that, we have also seen many intergenerational shifts, a youth bulge in much of, of, of Africa and Asia Pacific. And on the other hand, aging population profiles in the advanced industrial economies as well. The third sort of uh, contextual pressure point is, is of course technology itself. It's both the cause of these disruptions in a way. I mean, that's the irony of the paradox of, of the human story that it's through technological prowess of 250 years of industrial uh, uh, change that we've altered the, the atmosphere, that we've changed the nature of, of, of the planet, that we are now looking at technology too to help us to solve that problem is almost an indissoluble uh, paradox or contradiction, so to speak. But technology is of course fueled by major advances in sciences, in the biological sciences, the biosciences, in the nanosciences, the digital and engineering sciences that are, you know, uh, beginning to change the way in which we think and we act in, in producing goods and services, energy, food, materials, medicine, how we design cities, how we travel, how we communicate and so on. These are profound changes that are taking place in the world today. The fourth, uh, you know, driver uh, you know, which we act is, is economic globalization. Since the early 90s, as you know, we've seen the world becoming much more integrated. It's financial, it's productive, it's consumer systems, all of which are beginning to integrate, but in complex and contradictory ways. The uneven uh, integration of, of, of the world's national economies in, in, in complex and contradictory ways and, and, and that poses new problems to us as well, because it's not a seamless uh, equal process uh, across. And of course, we've seen counter anti-globalization movements also within that, but the logic has been consistent over the last uh, 30 years or so. And then finally, the specter of, of, of global health pandemics. COVID-19 is the latest manifestation of this. Because we are, we are now a, a planetary species, we're living cheek and jowl together, we travel faster, we communicate faster. Diseases also by virtue of contagion can spread much faster across the planet, just like the financial uh, crisis of 2007, 2008 was also a form of contagion as well. These five sort of drivers have reshaped and are constantly uh, reshaping the context within which we have to think about entrepreneurship in higher education. The focus of this particular conference is on one of these overarching pre uh, arcing pressure points, technology, and its implications, of course, for our students, for our staff, and for universities as institutions in the economy and society. But I would presume that you would all agree with me that we can only make sense of the utility of, of technological change and entrepreneurship in the context of these wider existential challenges facing our people and our planet as well. Now, over two decades ago, as Sistani was saying, when I was started as a rookie vice chancellor at the University of Fort Hare, I remember the dominant concerns of my generation uh, were on mainly focused then uh, on how to transform the immediate post-apartheid university system into a mass education uh, system, serving the needs of the whole population. And I'm thinking back about the debates that I had with my colleagues then Bani Pijana, Mampele Rampele, and others, you know, uh, at the time, we were concerned about how do we grow our universities in the context of, of limited and at times falling values of state funding, subsidy, uh, student financial aid, and so on. We were concerned about new sources of funding beyond, uh, you know, fees and subsidy commercial income, philanthropic income, we began to look at the experiments in, in, in uh, those very early debates. We also began to deal with uh, pressures from by, by both government and businesses for us to produce more ready for market and, and, and labor market relevant qualifications and graduates as well. Massive pressure at the time as well. 
And we also looked at ways in which we can encourage our academics to modernize their craft practices to respond to the, what was then the beginnings of a massive explosion in the information society. It's just the beginnings of, of the digital uh, revolution, so to speak. And we were experimenting with lots of strategies how to secure job opportunities for larger numbers of our graduates in the context of the massification of higher education. None of these concerns, if I think back now, uh, if I'm a vice chancellor now, um, none of these concerns seem to have disappeared. And my colleagues are still battling with its legacies and its consequences, but in a world that now seems to, to have utterly changed in the midst of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I really have lots of sympathies with my good colleague, uh, Zeblon, who has just joined the ranks of our vice chancellors. Uh, that you guys are, are really confronting a much more uh, complex, infinitely more uncertain, less stable, and even more demanding context than, than uh, two or three decades ago. And this new context, it seems to me, will require us to adopt totally new, uh, innovative, and if, in fact, sometimes even unorthodox approaches to respond to, to it. Climate change, biodiversity, and resource pressures, for example, will require us to discover smarter, greener, and more renewable ways of doing th uh, and living uh, in the world. Uh, you, you, we have to circular economics, for example, and cir circular production system, green economics, uh, you know, and so on, become much more important now than it was, you know, when I started off. Changing demographics will require us to look at ways in which we can provide meaningful work, you know, and other opportunities for young people, because that youth bulge will have enormous economic, social, and indeed political consequences, as you've seen already in our streets, the vast numbers of young people that are unemployed, sense of hopelessness, and so on. We have to respond uh, to, to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, also in other countries where there's aging population profiles, Again, we're looking at technology to provide solutions because humans live longer, again, ironically and paradoxically because of the successes of our, 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 our previous technologies. And the technological revolution that we're currently going through is pushing us you know, to figure out the ways in which we can use these technologies to, to uh, make our world more sustainable, to feed our populations, and at the same time also this is the other part of the paradox that we have to figure out ways of living with smart machines, with automation, with robotics, with artificial intelligence systems that will govern you know, many parts of, of, of the regulation of our, of our planet and so on. We haven't figured out how humans and these machines will coexist you know, in that future. And of course, economic globalization confronts us with the challenge of, of, of how do we cope with extreme forms of social and economic exclusion and marginalization as a result of this convulsive effects in the market and intolerable levels of, of, of uh, uh, you know, insecurity and inequality that the gig economy often brings up as well. And global health That's pandemics, true. some of them are zoonotic and some of them are climate driven, uh, are challenging us not only to think as a planetary species, but also to transform the way in which we relate to, to natural and, and food systems as well. So the existential pressures have, be, have caused us to begin to think with renewed introspection about the hubris of our technological imagination. We have to really pause, not just go hurtle forward. We have to start beginning to think more, more, more self-critically not just about our achievements and the, and the new possibilities of, of a technological civilization that we are constructing. Remember, in the 19th century, those generations also had these great ideas about on the threshold of a new age. Then it was, of course, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and so on as well. My argument is that as we begin to celebrate the, the prowess and, and the promise of our our, our new te technological capabilities, we must also reflect on its perils, its limits, and its unintended consequences, as difficult as that is, about some of the foundational assumptions on the basis of which we built modern societies, our very way of life, what constitutes a good life, what constitutes a prosperous future, 
I think those are philosophical, not technological issues as well. How we relate to the major uh, and how we, 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 we relate to consumption, production, and so on. Just want to, to, to spend uh, two last points. Uh, I, I really wanted to, to just as, as a way of, of concluding this. So when we think about the entrepreneurial university and the assumptions that we are making about entrepreneurship as, as well, I really want to encourage us to think much broader than focusing only on uh, the, the businesses that we are going to, because about the context in which we are, are going to do so. And, and, and highlight also the fact that, you know, the, the, the great man theory of history, you know, uh, on the basis of which we have described, you know, success of enterprises before, you know, uh, the ideas of individualism, ruthlessness and dominance and so on. Those values are no longer uh, germane to what, what, what is required in the early to the mid 21st century. My, uh, my view is that notions of social cooperation, of collaboration, of reciprocity, and even solidarity are going to be key uh, 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 traits of how we want to, to build uh, the ethos uh, uh, and the goals of our companies in the context of, of the challenges facing our people and our planet. And I hope that as we go through the specific issues here in, in the context of the next few days and so on, we will also step backwards and, 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 and begin to think about the, the, the bigger picture in which we're going to have to try to, to, to make transformative changes. So thank you very much, colleagues. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much yeah, for that uh, uh, context and the why we're doing this, uh, Professor Swartz. Um, I just want to, to highlight some of the things that you've, you've mentioned. Um, about the crisis uh, of, of where we are, the crisis that we are facing at the moment, and uh, particularly the low levels of locally driven innovation that you've mentioned. And you've also presented us with um, the opportunities offered by the global shifts uh, that are happening, for example, in climate change, in, um, in, in demographic shifts, the digital transformation, economic globalization and uh, of course, uh, the global health pandemic that we are facing. And uh, I think you've, you've, um, you've made people to think about how we can drive entrepreneurship uh, using these opportunities um, presented by the, by the challenges, so to speak. And I've got questions that um, are posted on Hoover, for example, directed uh, to you. One of them is from and Damulelo saying, uh, Prof, how do we shape a new generation of young entrepreneurs to think differently and use new and unexpected perspectives to imagine their business products and mission? Thank you, Sistandi. Uh, um, I think that's a very relevant question in, in, in my view. There are two things that humans are not very good at, 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 at doing by virtue of our, I say, our paleoanthropological ancestry, where we come from, in other words, 200, 300,000 years from the savannah to shape the nature of our, our brains and the way we respond to our environment. And it's, it's it, one of the, um, it's a prelude to my answer to the question. We think largely in the short term. We suffer from what I call short termism. Humans, we think about my next meal uh, this afternoon. I'm thinking about tomorrow, what I'm going, we are often unable to think in decades, let alone centuries or millennia uh, for that matter. And the second, uh, you know, sort of uh, human condition that is an inescapable, you know, trait of what it means to be homo sapiens is our reductionism, that we reduce a complex reality to a finite set of variables to make sense, to navigate our way through if you like the proverbial forest, so to speak, as well. The, the topic of discussion, ironically, for me, is an example because we often focus on entrepreneurship and technological innovation, and it's necessary for us to do so if we want to go deep and understand how it works. But in doing so, we often then get the bigger picture in which that is immersed gets lost. And so the way in which I think I when I speak to my students, you know, is to try to, in the context of those limitations of short-termism and reductionism, 
to begin to force us continuously to also think about long-termism and holism. In other words, the lens is not only long, but also wide. So that we constantly, when we look at entrepreneurship and risks and so on, we have to move between these, these two sort of like parts of the extremity of the ways in our ways our brains have been sculpted by evolution as well. So we are not designed to think in that way. In Japan, for example, they have in uh, experiments going for the last uh, few years, two or three years, and in future design thinking, where they literally in cities like Akita Prefecture, for example, they 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 organize communities into two distinct groups. One group, they think about the here and the now and the very specific challenges facing, let's say, water reticulation in a particular town that is not working well and so on. Real existential pressure points and so on for survival here and now. Then they organize another group, if you like, a, a, a you know, test group. They think about 30, 40 years into the future to think, what would, what would the same problem be in the context of, of a future generation? What kinds of questions will they, they pose and what sort of solutions? I think we have to push ourselves to begin to simulate the future as well as the present constantly arguing with each other. Because remember, Sistandi and colleagues, uh, we have a responsibility for generations still to be born. And, and, and therefore, the need for us to constantly force ourselves, our firms, our companies, to begin to think about the inheritance, the legacies that we will hand down to the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Just one last question before I let you off the hook, uh, but we will come back to this discussion if we have time at the end. Uh, there's one question saying, do you think there is enough resources at higher education institutions to assist students to explore high-tech innovation. What is your view on open innovation? Well, since I'm science advisor to, 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 to government and my minister, this is something that I, I'm perpetually grappling with as well. Of course, no, we, 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 we are just not designed. Universities as, as, a, as a system, I'm afraid we've not historically and contemporaneously in the current period, we are not structured for an open innovation system, we, we still are repositories of elite education. All of us sitting in this conversation are a tiny statistical minority. This whole system for me is not a natural system. It needs to be deconstructed. So I, I'm a strong believer in the idea of science and, and society that has to be um, you know, intermixed and that we have to turn the innovation model on its head so that we have a system of grassroots innovation emerging from the ranks of our people, because technology are just simply tools, instruments, ways of altering our world and our, our way in which just like fire was the first, the most revolutionary technology of our species and iron, and of course also now the digital instruments as well. I think that we have to open up the system and universities cannot solve this problem. They have to join forces, as Minister said uh, uh, yesterday in his, in his input, join forces with the TVET sector. And the 2.5, almost 3 million, not in education, training, uh, you know, and employment, the neat generation. That's the, the, the problem that we have to face. The people that are not inside this particular tent having this conversation. So no, I don't think so. The second problem is I don't think the Department of Higher Education and Training and Science and, and, and Innovation on their own have the, or the resources or the, or the stretch for that holistic reach that I'm talking about. We have to talk to DTIC, the Department of Trade and Industry and, and, and Competition. We have to talk to agriculture, to energy, to water and so on to build a much larger frontier through which we can then begin to, 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 to circulate and share resources. My model is based on collaboration, on, on, on sharing and jointly tackling problems that go beyond any single department as well. So the long answer to the very short and important question is I'm afraid we need to redesign this entire edifice on which we sit today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I'm going to move on now to, to, the next, to our next speaker. And uh, on the line, we have Dr. Linda Linganiso. And uh, Dr. Linda is, um, 
is a scientist, an author, and an inventor. And uh, she is um, currently the research director at the Durban University of Technology. And uh, she opens up minds with scientifically based principles of uh, intellectual empowerment. And one thing I can highlight about her is that she's the founder of the Linganiso and uh, Company Consulting, which is a waste management consulting company helping uh, investors invest in profitable enterprises while developing strategies for companies to afford them sustainable businesses. And right coming up now is Dr. Linda Lingani. So over to you, Dr. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Sister Handy, for a nice introduction and warm welcome. I'll try to share my screen. Please let me know when you can see my screen. We can see it. If you can just put it on slideshow. Thank you. Once again, um, a very good morning to you all. I am Dr. Linda Linga Niso, as this Tandi has indicated the Director of Research and, and Postgraduate Support at Devon University of Technology. So this morning, I would like to talk to you about Afrotech innovation and entrepreneurship in circular economy. Okay, I will explain to you why there is um, changing nature in academic profession in higher education institution. And then I'll highlight Department of Higher Education and Training Response, and I will explain to you how the higher education institutions are supposed to be assisting entrepreneurship development in higher education to achieve the goals such as uh, promoting students in innovation and entrepreneurship, promoting faculty innovations and entrepreneurship, and how we can help higher education institutions to increase the third stream of income. And I will go ahead and give you the case study on waste to profit projects, and then I will give you the future projections. The changing nature of academic profession in higher education institution. Why is the academic profession changing in higher education institutions? Higher education institutions are funded by big corporations such as the World Bank. So there are external factors and internal factors driving these changes within higher education institutions. The external factors include socioeconomic issues, political influence, as well as globalization. Whereas internal factors driving these changes in higher education institutions include policymakers, as well as standardized curricula. It's very important to realize that not only the World Bank is, is affecting the way we do business in higher education institutions, there are other initiatives, such as initiatives set up by United Nations Environmental Program, Africa Agenda 2063, the Africa that we want to see, Sustainable Development Goals, Millennium Development Goals, South Africa's Department of Science and Innovations by Economy Strategy. So um, these initiatives were set up by, um, by government and the World Bank in such a way that the academics and students can find a way to work together to help South Africa to transition towards knowledge economy, economy where knowledge is the main engine for economic development. So uh, the need for the academics, now there is a high need that the academics can actually redirect that they are focused towards globalization as um, the previous speaker has indicated, currently, higher education institutions are forced to develop innovative products, which will not only penetrate the local market, but the international market as well. So cooperatism is also forcing higher education institutions to aggressively engage in knowledge-based economies. 
managerialism also allows the staff members in the academic space to shift towards an entrepreneurial culture. And we talk more about marketization, and you can see that the high education institutions now are forced to operate as market oriented firms, which means that um, the research that we perform, we need to find a way where we can then translate research articles into something of value, perhaps a product that can come out of the university to penetrate the, the market in, in exchange for income. So what is our response as, as academic staff members? Our response is only to conform because higher education institutions are public institutions. So we need to conform to approved policies as well as uh, guidelines. What, uh, what is the Department of Higher Education and Training's response to these changes from external and internal factors? DHET has established entrepreneurial development in higher education um, with the following goals to, do, to develop student entrepreneurship, which means that we need to, 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 uh, we need to train our own students and give them target skills and practical skills that will afford them uh, the, 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 the possibility to be able to, to come up with innovative business approaches that will, sust that will um, allow them or afford them profitable businesses at the end of the day, so that after graduation, the students are able to, to, uh, to start up small to medium enterprises, which are profitable in a way, uh, creating jobs and improving economy in South Africa. And the second goal is the development of entrepreneurship in academia, which means that how do we then equip the academic staff members and the faculty members to have what it takes to actually produce and, and equip and develop uh, the, the human capital that we want to see, people will be able to, to turn the world around and, and do, to, to tackle any challenge that is perplexing the world today. And the last goal of um, EDHE is uh, the development of entrepreneurial universities, which means that as academic staff members, we need to find ways to help the university generate the third stream of income, which means how do we then assist the researchers and, and the faculty members, as well as the, the students, to be able to, to, to develop sustainable research units or sustainable centers of excellences and, and, and so on. Okay, starting from the development of our student entrepreneurship, not a long time ago, you could follow the formula, work hard, study hard, go to college and climb the corporate ladder. It was not about choice, passion, interest. It was about compliance. So currently we live in an era where robotics and artificial intelligence will replace the, the jobs and the employments that we have. So the formula is, is failing us. The corporate ladder is replaced by complex maze, as you can see on the diagram. So we can no longer prepare students for the jobs which don't exist but we can train them to be able to identify societal and industrial problems and, 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 and be able to propose solutions. So to do this, we need to find ways to instill entrepreneurial mindset to allow the students to be self-starters and self-managers. So the one way to do this, to create a platform for the students to be able to, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to train them on design thinking basically, let the students redefine problems in an attempt to identify alternative strategies and solutions that might not be instantly ap uh, apparent with our initial level of understanding. So design thinking provides a solution-based approach um, to solving problems. So you want them to be able you know, to, to, to learn, to, to tackle any challenge that presents itself. So to spark the innovation thinking, we need to create opportunities of self-starting as well as self-managing. You want to provide support as well, the necessary support to bring mentors on board, and you also bring resources for the students to be able to be more creative. So you want to encourage them to be able to take risk as well, not to be fearful to take uh, those calculated risks, model the thinking, affirm it, as well as help them to find a community. So as in higher education institutions, how do we then promote, again, promote further student innovation and entrepreneurship? 
one thing that is 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 um is very important for us to to think about is, is curriculum reform because you know we cannot produce the workforce that we want to see if we're using the same curriculum we were using previously so i think the time is now for us to think about ways of uh of um uh of reforming the curriculum, coming up with bachelor degree in innovation, where the students can learn how to how to can learn how to come up with business models, elements that they can use to market themselves and to speak to investors. You want to have some patent clinics within high education institutions to provide law students an opportunity to draft patent applications for students who are innovators. I know there's quite a number of high education institutions who have um, established this patent in clinics. And you also want to offer internships for students to work in startups. So the DVC of research and, and, um, and innovation as well as the research directors are to, to source funds for the students so they can offer those uh, internships so that resources are available. And again, raising, raising funds for business plan competition, if this can be done you know, over the, for a year, you have different types of these programs where students are given um, an opportunity to compete in terms of writing, writing business plans and coming up with innovative elements. And you want to host a multi-level business plan competition as well to encourage the students. And most importantly, entrepreneurship-based academic residential community is, is very important where you actually you know, engage people in community and have and, and have them give them a platform to have a say in terms of what they want to see in their communities and engaging the students so the students can can find opportunities to identify those problems and propose solutions. Okay, moving forward to development of entrepreneurship now in, in the academic space. So the question is how do we encourage faculty innovations as well as, as entrepreneurship? Currently, you realize that DHEAD offers subsidy for research articles only. So we need to, 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 to find a space where we are able to, to, to provide these incentives for entrepreneurship as well as, as innovation. At DUT, we have started um, a program where we teach the researchers, uh, people in management, like anyone who's doing research, including students. And the theme of the um, of, of, of the module is um, is building a thriving innovation ecosystem as well as cultivating entrepreneurial culture. So we want to, to instill the spirit in, 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 in our staff members. So the idea is to offer business of innovation commercialization course, which is aimed at educating both the students as well as, as the researchers so that they can always think about innovation as well as, as, as entrepreneurship because this is what we want to see at the end of the day. So you also want to include commercialization and entrepreneurship activities among the faculty promotion uh, yes, criteria so that if people are innovating more or they're coming up with, uh, with businesses, so you want to promote them based on, 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 on the work that they have done uh, the development of entrepreneurial universities now, how do we assist the universities to, to generate the third stream of income? At DUT next, um, uh, next month, we want to establish a social innovation lab. A social innovation lab will, will, will offer a platform where you have a wide range of stakeholders from venture capitalists, you, you have venture capitalists, you have people working for government, you have um, inventors, you have business people, you have you have students and, and researchers, and you also have, you know, people who have who have come before us uh, to advise. So the, the 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 reason for the establishment of the social innovation lab, we want uh, these stakeholders to be able to come together to to discuss how they can come up with uh, groundbreaking innovations and solutions to the problems which are perplexing the world today, and want our students be part of that to fast track innovation as well as, as entrepreneurship uh, in higher education institutions. So we also want to facilitate university and, and uh, industry collaborations to, to make sure that that uh, partnership is very, very strong because once you get university to start working with industry, you have another opportunity there for students to start solving industrial problems in a way coming up with a generating a, and, and commercializing patents. And before you know it, the higher education institutions 
will be able to establish spin-off companies, which we are planning to establish anyway, to help the, the, the university to generate the third stream of income. And what is very important is to start engaging with regional and local economic development efforts. Because uh, uh, the, the higher education institutions, they want to be part you know, of the local economic development. I'm, I'm quite aware that Technology Innovation Agency has released a call sometime last year to actually you know, get the universities on board to help um, communities with uh, economic development. So I think that's one area that we need to focus on so that the students can be familiar you know, in solving uh, uh, societal problems, being part of what is going on in, 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 in communities. And uh, translating research articles into small to medium enterprises. And we just initiated this program at DUT this year. And the target is to actually um, have 10 SMEs from research articles. And you want to Time active is up, Time is up, Doctor. Just wrap up, please. Okay. That is fine. Okay, so I would like to just uh, highlight a few projects that we, we are busy with. Currently at DUT, we have wastewater beneficiation project uh, where we, okay, the drive behind this project is the fact that the excessive amount of raw sewage is spilling on, 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 on rivers. So we want to translate that into, into water. So the technologies that we developed are optimized technologies for uh, the, the treatment of water. And please check the sustainable development goals seven and six. And we also produced a diesel from biomass and then um, the, 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 the local pain being the fact that uh, we've got availability of biomass from KZ and sugar crushing industries. So that is being well taken care of. And um, again, bioplastic producing PPEs from recycled plastic materials. As you can see that as our population grows, um, Waste material is also, I mean, the, the amount of waste that is being generated on landfill sites increases as well. And you can see that you end up having plastic bags leaking into our ocean system and destroying our biodiversity. And uh, the trade and industry has reported that um, the trade balance for plastic is sitting at minus 15.7. And that figure is um, equivalent to the amount of chipping plastic entering the country. So we are tapping into this valuable resource to produce uh, the PPEs which are in demand currently. And again, we have managed to produce biomaterials from uh, waste, from industrial waste. And one thing that is good about this material is, fact, is the fact that these biomaterials are, are meeting all the requirements according to the South African national standards. And we've got funding for, for, for manufacturing industry. We have identified the beachhead segment. We have the buyer already for these materials. And also uh, we, we're trying to help the municipalities to generate um, electricity because integrated from integrated resource plan, it was clear that industries are struggling with waste and the, the municipalities cannot uh, also pay, you know, the electricity from ESCOM. So we're doing techno-economic feasibility studies to estimate the amount of biogas that can be generated from wastewater treatment plants. And we're setting up this biotechnologies and we've published quite a number of books so that we can help the world to transition towards low carbon and low carbon um, economy. So we have quite a number of books uh, that we are publishing to, to help people wanting to venture into circular economy. So uh, for future projections, as you can see, we're looking at uh, the 3D printing facility. We're busy using it to produce uh, materials, but in the future, we'll be using mobile apps, new sensors, digital utilities for, we don't know how many informal recyclers are out there without um, data, I mean, without digital technologies. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, there we, we, I'm just conscious of uh, of the time. Um, I'm going to run straight to our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Zeblon Vilagazi, and we will take questions at the end for for both of them and for the whole team. There are questions being posted at the moment, and I just want to mention that uh, Professor. Villagazi, of course, is vice principal elect uh, of the University of the Witwatersrand, uh, having been deputy vice chancellor for research and postgraduate studies um, since January 2014. And uh, he's got uh, an illustrious career that you can 
read about at your own time, but I just want to highlight that he has served as the Group Executive for Research and Development at the Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa, and also as Director of Itemba Labs uh, in Cape Town. Uh, over to you, uh, Zeblon. at your own time, but I just want to highlight that he has served as the Group Executive for Research and Development of the Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. Okay, we can we can start. I thank you for the excellent program, and I think it's just it's just incredible how you know the 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 uh, the thread uh, runs across, and we never shared any notes. So uh, that's a wonderful choice of speakers who who have actually laid the scene for for this presentation. So some some of what I might cover here will already have been uh, explained in detail by by my colleagues. So I just uh, skip through them. But I think we live in a world of mega challenges that are characterized by largely this digital earthquake exponential that we call the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's just we are in a continuum of rapid changes that are shaping the way we live, act, and interact with each other. It's man these are manifest in how the future of work will change. We've got a digital earthquake happening in 2030, which I'll talk more about in a short while. It will shape the way we govern the way we even parent in the era of uh, you know study and work from home, and what COVID nineteen has done in actually rapidly moving the future fast forward to us being here now dealing with what we thought was going to be the future of learning, and sometimes this pandemic strategy. But yeah, of course, we've got a lot of um, uh, challenges we need to contend with as a human species. And this requires us to just think, as Derek said, think, recalibrate, and ensure that we don't allow these drivers to overtake us, especially have an impact on Africa, where the excesses of all the global challenges manifest themselves. So you've got to be able to manage these changes and not become uh, laggards and followers of these changes. I mean, uh, it's been mentioned earlier that we are having such a huge impact on the planet. In the past, the planet had an impact on us. Now we have, as homo sapiens, radically altered the face of the planet, both physically, biologically, and technologically. Um, just think about it. If you were to take a snapshot of the last, say, uh, one, um, what, 600 years, right? The gap between the printing press and the telescope, those are the two breakthrough technologies of the time. Gutenberg, basically, the printing press, would have been like the Kindle of today. Uh, the telescope, you know, would have been basically allowed us to see beyond our universe and changed basically even religion itself. It led to the Protestant Reformation and uh, created huge social conversions in the world. The gap between the steam engine, where we've stopped relying on horsepower to commute over long distances, is what? About 150 years? Now think about that period between the steam engine and the moon is again another 200 years. So you can see you're beginning to compact all these great changes over a small, tiny window. Since we landed with the moon, man on the moon, uh, Armstrong et al. in 1969, you've seen the growth in technology where, for example, in the last eight years, you've seen, last 10 years rather, you've seen radical changes in the way we have lived and all these things that development that took place over 10, 15, 20 years, or even hundreds of years were happening over two years, largely driven by what is called the most exponential uh, climate change and also uh, the internet. Now, what it means is that actually for the first time since 2007, human beings find themselves not driving technology, but being driven by tech. That is now we've got to make good of this big technological gap that is happening in front of us. It is manifest in 
in Peruda, you are like years in front of headlights because these things are moving so fast and they're not able to control them. And they're beginning to rapidly move at a speed that our institutions that have been built over the last thousand years from schools, government, universities are not able to cope. So we need to make good of this gap. At the same time, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, over the last hundred years, we have more than quadrupled the amount of CO2 emissions to the atmosphere, right? So this exponentials, both in terms of demography, population, and I would call technological exponential, are shaping the world. And I think they present huge challenges. I'll just focus here on the jobs landscape brought about by this digital tech. Uh, this is a World Economic Forum study. It talks about what's going to happen in the next 10 years, effectively. I mean, this is what is called the uh, uh, um, um, uh, change over point, a transitional point from old economy to the new economy. You can see slides, what are the top. Come again. Slides. We don't see your slides. You're only on the first slide. You got a problem here. No, no, just to move them to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, I've shared them with you. So you can't see the slides. We see it, but you, you, you're still on the first slide. Yes. Can you That's see them now? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, these are the changes that I spoke about, and the fact that you know human growth and the um, and the um, and, and technological growth have overlapped. That now we cannot match this. We have technology that has overtaken our institutional framework. Jobs are going to change. Now, this is the job landscape that's where I was. And that in the next 10 years, you see new jobs emerging. Data sciences, AI, software, uh, general operation managers, and all these tech-driven skills, and most importantly, actually, soft skills are going to be important. I think that there will be more need for psychologists than they, than they will be for even computer programmers, because we will find ourselves having a lot of psychological trauma brought about by this exponential that is moving at a, at a rate faster than our natural evolutionary patterns. Um, if you look at the um, breakdown of, of, of skills, right? So a great majority of our people in South Africa do not have the necessary skills to actually climb on this wave and impact and change their lives. So therefore we need to rapidly, as has been mentioned earlier, recon reconstitute the way we educate. You know, when it takes two years to change curriculum, by the time that two years has come, new technologies have come through. So we find ourselves almost trying to, you know, in, in this what I would call a wild goose chase. And moreover, given this really, really, I need to, sorry, I need to show animations, uh, Tandy, but can you see it now? Yes, I so, can see the slide. Yeah, you can see that. Who is changing this bulk crazy future? All these things come from two universities largely in the world, on the East Coast, or probably MIT, and largely at Stanford, right? So effectively, you've seen this digital concentration being driven by people of one demographic, either working in a college dorm or out of mom's garage, and it's, and it's been mentioned in many movies. And they've changed politics, they've changed the way we live, act, interact, and the cyber physical interaction didn't come out of big industry. It came out of innovators. And Unfortunately, this brings with it a particular gender geographical asymmetry that you've got mostly white males effectively uh, who are young and a sprinkle of Asians from uh, the uh, uh, people who came with the uh, blockchain to all these inventors. So where, where are women and where are other regions and where are other people in the space? So that's where we are. In the context of Africa, with a youth badge, that's where the opportunities lie. So what is the impact of industry 4.0 and digital transformation, the changing nature of work? So we thought that uh, my colleagues did a scoping exercise of African tech ec ecosystems. Can you see the slides now, uh, Tandy? Colleagues, can you see slides? I see the slides, but if you can move to the one that you're talking to now, context in Africa. Okay. Thank you. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay. 
तो दिस इज दिसन ऑफ द टेक हब बेसिकली यू हैव वट कॉल एक्वाड इजिप्ट केनिया नाइजेरिया एंड साउथ अफ्रीका एंड दिज आर द सिटीज आई मीन नो सरप्राइज इज देर यू गोट चिया वन सिटीज Lagos, Cape Town, Nairobi, Joburg, etc., and the middle tier cities and lower tier cities. So, therefore, cities are the drivers of this uh, tech change. Uh, what also one needs to take into account is the fact that you know how is Johannesburg? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll use the context here of something I'm familiar with, the city I live in. Now, this is also you know the number of software companies. I'm using software as an example as per distribution. Funny enough. Johannesburg has a smaller number of software companies than Nairobi or Lagos right although in terms of employment Johannesburg has higher employment ratios because Johannesburg is has a head is a basically host a large number of these uh, international uh, conglomerates so that means that actually in terms of small tech startups south africans are not entrepreneurial at all so these are the reasons and i think it comes to what role universities can play What are your serious obstacles to growth in your business among joiners back? Uh, we need to realize Africa's digital innovation for global markets through skills development and entrepreneurship. And therefore how do you do that? What do we define by digital innovation? I think content, we can all create our own content. We have got enterprise development interacting with the needs of the skills academy and the entrepreneurs for forming this uh, Enter enterprises. So therefore, this is the basic ecosystem, the skills, which is what universities and can 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 do, and other hubs, the clients and the community, the mentors, the spaces where young individuals come and share, and co-create, and co and in in the in that in that space. So the phase that we the model that is being used that actually we need to try to scale here, and we have it now, is the startup, the concept. Young people have got incredible ideas, and then what they do is they play. You create the space where you've got a group of talented young people, and in fact, that's our opportunity. That youth bulge must be used as a dividend, not a disaster. Then we need startups and failures. There will be many of them. Then the next level is on um, scaling up, and again, a lot of our challenges in South Africa is that we don't scale. you know all these things just filter through but if you scale you'll be able to create a new digital economy that is driven by africans responding to our african needs not import, importing technology developing a different context and that technology can invariably in a way help in uh, addressing problems that the key players in the global north don't you know have, have had a blind spot to so as i close is that the way i believe that we can commercialize our research because south africa is full of incredible innovation enterprises there hasn't been that close interaction between universities and um and and, and industry and that's why we have this problem of it, uh, uh, innovation cousin our research over the last 20 30 years has grown exponentially but it doesn't translate like it does in other countries into products services that will spawn new products that will create new industries that and will allow us to be able to manage and not become spectators of this technological curve so it comes from ideation learning business and realizing our market our market is different from the market to not the broader african market than the market that uh the united states like um, you know other countries of the world look at finally the the uh what we need and we choose here again we need finance which we don't have we need to create cross border markets across the continent i mean that's part of the au vision to uh, 267 we need the best practices learn from the best practices across the world learn from their failures we are part of a connected community we need access to mentors and coaches and of course this requires collaboration and r&d partners both in the academy and also in the 
in the um, in the uh, in the in the private sector, small and large scale industries. And the most important partner we need is government. Silicon Valley was spawned by the Apollo missions. It wasn't just geniuses sitting in California who turned this up. It was spawned by uh, people like you know Zuckerberg and all those and, and, and the people who invented the silicon microchip. Those technologies came out of the NASA projects. So therefore the state is a key component in setting that platform. So therefore with the appropriate government regulation, with the appropriate uh, educational and social infrastructure across the entire value chain, from universities to Tibet, we should be able to bridge that gap across the boundaries of this continent. With those slides, I'd like to thank you for the time. I hope I'm on time. Thank you, Tandy. Thank you, thank you very much, Zeb, uh, for that for that talk, and thank you very much for to the to the panelists. There's one question that I would like uh, Zeb to to respond to that has been posted by by our audience. The one is, what are your views on digital leapfrogging in Africa? Your views on digital leapfrogging in Africa? Yeah, okay, I suppose by digital leapfrogging means that you need to, like a frog, go from one, you know, I don't think you can leapfrog. You cannot jump every step. You go to go through the process. Leapfrog has become a cliche. You know, what I believe is that you cannot cut corners. I, I would call digital acceleration. You know, they mean to cut corners, then things go wrong. So you've got to ensure that we, I would see it as acceleration. You need to accelerate and ensure that we plug every gap where possible and allow the speed to be faster than the speed of those that have started ahead of us. It's almost like running a race of people who are on a treadmill who are moving faster than you, they will go to run faster to just be on even keel with them. Right. And uh, one of the questions that was asked um, uh, before, actually even before we started, I guess it's to any of the panelists, is about how accessible are high-tech innovations to the ordinary African? Yeah, can I answer that and I'll, I'll, I'll whilst them on the stage. Yeah. The beauty of tech is that actually, unlike all the technologies that rely heavily on infrastructure, like the railway or the, even the aeroplane for that matter, or the old, to use computers, something that I'm familiar with, like the old mainframe, you required infrastructure and that infrastructure was located in big cities in, 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 in certain countries. But nowadays, Actually, the uh, tech divide is narrower because the access to high tech uh, actually has been, the bridge has been narrowed by the uh, internet, by access to smart devices that can uh, allow you to basically have the power of a computer in your hand. I mean, my iPad here, my computer here has twice, has, is a million times more powerful than the computer that landed the Apollo 11 capsule. Right? So what took maybe a thousand engineers now can be accessed by one hand. So that means that a child sitting in Nairobi, in Mombasa, can access the world of technologies and actually you know, use his or her creative powers to actually come with a new idea, an idea. So actually this tech exponential has narrowed the uh, digital divide in a kind of peculiar way, obviously. Divided also because of the resources and access to the right markets. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Zeb. Um, we've, we're running out of time, and I just want to give uh, Linda just one a closing comment, because we've had quite a discussion with Prof. Swart, and you've just spoken, uh, uh, Zeb. Uh, Linda, do you have a closing comment?
Dr. Thank you, Linda. Linda. Yes. yes, thank you Sorry, so much. Who are you speaking to? Oh, no, no, yes. that, oh. Linda, the speaker. The, you know, she's she's responding. Yes, it's Tandy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's amazing that um, it seems as though we shared the presentations because we're kind of presenting the same thing. So I hope we had impact. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. And uh, I think uh, one of the key things that is coming out of, um, of these uh, discussions is basically speaking about opportunities presented by our global shifts as we see the world changing and how uh, digital transformation is at the center of, uh, of everything that we do. And uh, because we're running out of time, I would like to bring the session to an end now and wish to thank my panelists and hoping that uh, the conversations will be continuing even after the session. I know there will be, there is recording, there are recordings available for this session on, uh, on Hoover and upon request and uh, please keep the conversations going. And uh, to um, ADHE, I would like to give it back to you and thank you very much uh, for hosting us in this session. That awesome session. Um, it is interesting to see how all the presentations were aligned. You'd, you'd really say that uh, you had a meeting all together before you started to prepare your presentations for today. Um, we are running a little behind time, but nonetheless, um, anything that you have missed, please do follow us on EDHE Student Entrepreneurship to view the videos from Monday um, as well as yesterday, day two, and today's video as well will be available uh, after today's program. And what we have coming up in Tiki is um, let the rivers let the river dry, and it is by uh, the UP Choir.
running on the water, coming to the edge, 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 running on the water, Thank you to the UP Choir Tux Camarata for that performance of Let the River Dry. I'm um, composed by Carly Simon with conductors Michael Barrett and Matt Wright. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, thank you so much again to Dr. Tom Guebu for facilitating that first session. We're now going to move over to session two. Linda, what do we have coming up? So in session two, we will be looking at the university as a catalyst for entrepreneurial cha uh, change. And our session, session chair is Dr. Linda Mayer. Dr. Linda Mayer is the new director, operations and sector support at the University of South Africa. She succeeds Dr. Berine Kramer, who hung up her hat on the 31st of December to retire after six years of service. Dr. Mayer took up office on the 15th of January in 2020. She has served in various capacities um, in the higher education sector and has also held the position of the Head of Justice College of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, Chief Director, Corporate Services within the same department, Commissioner at the Commission of uh, Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, and also held various other senior and executive management and consulting positions. Uh, good morning, Dr. Mayer. Good morning, Linda. Very warm welcome to you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to lead the session. And I am indeed honored by the array of speakers that we have today that, that are obviously very well respected in their respective fields. So the session that we will be conducting now is titled the university as a catalyst for entrepreneurial change. When we consider entrepreneurial activities as a catalyst, we have to obviously reflect on the key activities of universities, and we have to then consider what the teaching and learning, the research practice, and the economic development requirements and societal impact and contributions are that we formulate, construct, and contribute to society at large. So within these catalytic domains of innovation and applied research and scholarship, the key fundamental issue is how we enable and how we orchestrate the future leaders of the students that we produce for the future. So we are very honored today in our first session where we will be reflecting on a case study, the best practice in university supported approaches to starting and growing businesses. And our first speaker, is Mr. Christopher Rothman, who is the founder and CEO of Liquid Culture. I must just say both of these speakers that will be in the session, Mr. Rothman and uh, Dr. Kaysen, that I am avid supporters of your, of your, <laughs> of your beer brand, just to, 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 um, to be quite frank. So we have uh, Christopher Rothman, who has an MSc in mycology, biotechnology and is currently completing his PhD in food biotechnology. And he has an array of successful ventures that he has embarked on, but very instrumentally with Dr. Kasson, they, they lead from the front. They lead from an academic genre and platform to the real world where economic development is at the forefront of their activities. 
So over to you, Dr. Rothman, uh, Mr. Rothman. My soon apologies. to be doctor. Soon, soon to be doctor. Yes, soon to be doctor. I always say we mustn't rely on these uh, titles of doctors too much because everyone is always asking us for medical advice and it becomes rather awkward. So over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me? All the audio good? We can hear you clearly. Thank you. That is great news. So firstly, um, unfortunately, Dr. Kaysen will not be joining us. He is leading from the front by giving class at the moment. Unfortunately, due to the session time changes. He could not be available, but let's not keep that. Let's not let that keep us back. Oh goodness, sorry. Okay, let's just share the screen. All right. Can you just quickly tell me? Can everybody see? Everybody fine at the moment? Everyone can see. Thank you. Ah, that is excellent news. So thank you very much for having me today. My name is Christopher Rothman. And as mentioned, um, I am currently completing my PhD uh, at the University of the Free State. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, there have been setbacks. But luckily, that will not keep us back from going forward. Anyway, so I'm here to talk today about um, how we started a business through the University of the Free State, how we were supported, and um, what we believe would be the best case approach for successfully starting and managing businesses through a university. Boy. Anyways, okay, so liquid culture makes yeast for beer. It's basically where we started as microbiologists at the Department of Microbiology at the University of the Free State. We are very fortunate to have a keen insight into these tiny little organisms. And um, just for some reference, I'm just going to give you a little background on the business so that you have an idea of what I'm speaking about for the rest. Each case will be unique for businesses through the university, but for something that's, let's say, in the direction of producing a product and then trying to put it out into the market, and you have an entrepreneur who wants to do that, this would be, in my opinion, the, the way to get going. So yeah, we are in the fortunate um, position to be in the alcohol industry. Well, not so fortunate during COVID, but luckily we will be surviving. So how did liquid culture start? In 2014, we were all still just postgraduate students at the University of the Free State. We were all home brewers, liking to make our own beer at home. And we were competing in several of the InterVarsity competitions, which was also a very good catalyst for commercial training, basically, for young students who are keen on the brewing industry. So this is a competition that's held across South Africa for 17 of the major universities and technicons, where we all get together once a year and we have a big competition. Everybody has a few beers and it gets judged who's the best and there are some awesome prizes. So this really led to a love for the brewing industry. So in 2006, Kofsi Brewing was officially started at the UFS. It's now known as the Craft Brewing Company. And this was with the aims to start a brewing and fermentation school. Um, it was during this period that we started to grow our own yeast because we figured we're microbiologists. We can probably do this on our own. We don't need to buy it anymore. And we found vast improvements in our beer and consistency. Um, as we started growing the things, we soon found out that many people are interested in this and they started supporting us and buying. It's at this point that we identified, well, in 2018 was at that point that we identified a need for liquid yeast in South Africa and as a business opportunity, as there are none such labs currently, well, on the African continent and very few overseas. So we started a yeast uh, research and development initiative um, with the aims of developing the un uh, University of the Free State's uh, yeast culture collection, which is one of the biggest culture collections in the world. And it was basically just sitting there with a lot of potential. And we thought, well, let's see if we can commercialize some of these, give some third stream revenue to the university and also start a company. So the aims were basically to discover and elucidate um, new brewing strains for the market. So in 2018, we felt that we were ready. So this was basically one of our most important steps was we approached the Directorate for Research and Development at the University of the Free State to discuss the possibilities for business opportunities. Um, we had a proof of concept. And we had determined a commercial viability by doing small scale sales to other clients. And we found that this could probably work. So it's at this point where it's very important. You know, we're all microbiologists, we're scientists. We don't really know anything about business. So the DRD and our technology transfer office guided us in the process. They firstly helped us with the techno analysis, finding out whether or not this kind of business would be viable, who would the clients be, teaching us some basic, uh, basic marketing principles. And, you know, just giving us an idea of what the commercialization and business world is like. 
that then also helped us with an application for funding, which was extremely important because as students, you don't really know of all of the funding opportunities that are available. So we did a TI application grant and um, we were lucky enough to be awarded the grant. And once again, this was thanks to our um, DRG really guided us through the process, made sure that we checked all of the right boxes and were appealing for such a kind of grant. So the, what was important was they gave us the freedom to succeed or to fail. Um, it's very important, and I'll mention this a little bit later, that as a student starting a business with the university, you have to realize that it is, it's on you. Nobody else is going to run it for you. Nobody's going to drive you, wake you up early in the morning, tell you to do these things. It's really important that you take the lead. And we were lucky that our director of research and development, especially Professor van Art Smit, Dr. Karen Boyce, and soon to be Dr. Gerard um, Verhoef, they really helped us to have freedom to explore creativity and to get our product out there. They also connected us to various departments on campus who are experts in their fields. And they helped us to find the right marketing strategies, the right, right labeling. As you can see, there's an example of three of our products over there. And um, really helped us to fine tune all of these aspects. So the funds were managed by the UFS. The TR grant was placed in an entity. There was a person involved who had to have final si signing rights on anything that had to be purchased. And um, these funds are obviously monitored by experts on campus to make sure that the funds are astutely and carefully managed. It's not just frivolous buying. So um, they helped us with the marketing, put us in charge with the marketing teams. And it was really amazing to have student involvement. So some students even did their projects on the marketing aspects of liquid culture on how it could be done, how to reach the clients and how to properly package it so that you create a brand. Because once again, we weren't experts in any of this. So the branding was very important. The DRD then helped us with the trademark registration. And as you can see, our logo, the liquid culture is now officially trademarked as well. And of course, space is important. If you are a student and you want to start a business, you need incubation. It's just like a tiny little baby that's just been born. You need a proper incubation and you need the space to grow. So we were very fortunate in the sense that the university allowed us to both continue our studies and to set up a space the way we can work. I'm currently sitting in one of our labs where we are currently doing our production. So this university involvement is very important. I'm going to speak a bit more about that later. So to get to the Department of Microbial Biochemical and Food Biotechnology, this is currently where we are housed. This was started about 50 years ago. Primary focus was on fermentation sciences. So luckily we're staying close to, well, home. We've completed literally hundreds of research projects from breweries across the world. So we've got a little bit of idea what's going on. And, you know, the market was already set. We have over 2,000 isolates of yeast that was in the Department of Culture Collection. Some of them were isolated from the tops of Mount Everest, digestive tracts of butterflies in the Amazon, and from various breweries across the world. And through a University of the Free State collaboration with Liquid Culture, which was now just this little baby company, we aimed to develop and commercialize this um, culture collection. So in 2019, we finally began production and sales. Our customer base grew very rapidly. Word of mouth spread that we were supplying a superior product at a competitive price to what was being imported. And our customer base grew very rapidly. So immediately there was another situation where the universities weren't quite geared for what happens now if you're running a business through an entity. So luckily, once again, we were helped. A separate entity was set up for all of the income and out, um, expenses that had to go through liquid culture. And it was really helpful in the sense that the university helped us with invoicing in the beginning to get invoices out to help collect payment. And it kind of started, we kind of started this little company that was now part of a UFS entity. The income was obviously very well monitored um, through the entity by the university. And once again, this just helped give you that kind of security. So after a few months, actually like six or seven months of sales, we reached a complete break even point where it was now kind of getting weird to run the business through the university and our clients were wondering, but are you university? Are you a company? Um, it was at this point that we were advised by our directorate for research and development and our technology transfer office that we should register liquid culture as a private company. So the first step was we registered the company. We got our bank accounts. We sorted out all of our administrative systems, shareholders, contracts, everything between um, the partners. And it was at this point where we officially spun out of the university of the free state administrative system. 
which was a very big leap. We've kind of been nurtured, but now all of a sudden you have to run everything on your own. So we were seriously guided even through this spin out phase. We then entered into a rental agreement with the University of the Free Space for the use of the space and the equipment. Now, obviously this department isn't geared for commercial pro uh, propagation and commercialization and for sales. So we were lucky that there was a bit of empty space in a laboratory. So we entered into this rental agreement that we could rent out the space and use some of the equipment, as long as we don't interfere obviously with some of the big research programs going on. And of course, keeping a fine eye on our research for our projects, for our masters and our PhDs and everything to make sure that we weren't falling behind on this. This of course is nice for the university. It gives um, third stream revenue. And also it's a little bit of a bragging right amongst the departments, the microbiology departments, that at least this one has got a small business that went and, you know, job creation is very important to the university. So some of the things that we have learned from this experience, um, the entrepreneurship success starts with willingness. Willingness is absolutely one of the most important factors that will play a role in this. It's up to the institution. You, the university has to want this to work. You've got to have somebody in charge that knows the system that's willing to help you create a new system. I think one of the most important factors that we played through was uh, we were one of the first spin out companies. So there had to be a, a case study even within the University of the Free State where what happens when entrepreneurs approach you and to have a protocol in place for how to set up entities, where to go, who to speak to, because obviously it's um, a giant bureaucracy. You have to know which forms to fill out, which queues to stand in and who to see when you need different kinds of things done. And as you can imagine, financial systems, administrative systems, and various departments, the communication aren't always uh, that good between these departments because they very rarely have the need to actually communicate. So it's important for a company to be brought up in a university system, go through incubation and be spun out so that following companies will know exactly what need to be done. It's very up to the entrepreneur's willingness. We've, I've seen this with several projects. I was very lucky in the sense of um, my previous study leader is also a keen um, believer in commercialization of science. You know, you don't just do projects and publish and you go on to the next one. You do research, you find out this is something that's nice. This could add value to um, South Africa or to an even larger scale. And then you need to commercialize this. So I was lucky to be brought up in kind of this uh, mindset that once you figured something out that's nice, try and commercialize it. So I had an idea of the entrepreneurial mindset from the start. I mean, I never had formal training in entrepreneurship or anything like that. So it was nice to have a study leader who's keen on this. And if students do want to do something like this, I would definitely advise seeking out study leaders who encourage these kinds of entrepreneurial ventures. So the support staff in the administrative chain is also very, very important The willingness. It's up to the department head. For instance, I'm at the, at the Department of Microbiology. Our department head's always been very supportive, very excited, in fact, to help us get this started. And it was a great privilege to work with them through every step, have their guidance on scientific um, principles, on business etiquette, all of these kinds of things. The lecturers, you know, every student has got classes to run, he's got a study leader, and it's very important for these people to also understand that this isn't just a pipeline. Some students don't want to just come to university and get a degree and then move on and start climbing the corporate ladder. I saw in one of the previous ones that the corporate ladder isn't as well defined anymore anyways. So you have to make space for students who want to create something instead of just coming in, getting a degree and going out. So study leader support is extremely, um, extremely important. Infrastructure wise, you're obviously going to need space. You're going to need somebody who's going to be able to help you to find a little space somewhere. I've been to several other universities who have really good incubation programs where they have a separate building and you get a little space there and you get to run it and all the support is there. It's very important to get that set up. Um, the technology transfer office, you know, our director of research and development and our TTO have been instrumental to our success. They really push hard. They fight for the entrepreneurs to have leniency in certain systems to help them set up entities to get everything going. It's been an absolute pleasure working with them and I really we wouldn't be where we are without them. The administrative system, obviously, there's a lot of admin involved with these kinds of things. New paperwork that has to be done. Explanations. I mean, why all of a sudden is there an entity on campus that's now making money? And um, what's supposed to happen to that money? You know, you really need good conversations, good open communication. And that's also where the finance department was extremely important. So just for a little bit to wrap up, just to give a little bit of a future of liquid culture. Now that a business has spun out, but it's still partially involved with the university. 
in a collaborative way. So we are moving to our new production facility, which is at the University of the Free State Science Park. Now, the Science Park is being created to help entrepreneurs incubate and create their own space. It's at the test farm called the, called the Paradise Test Farm uh, on the grounds of the University of the Free State. And it's a very excellent place for upscaling, especially if you've got a modular kind of upscaling. For instance, we uh, are working with converted shipping containers to create new lab space and new areas for uh, entrepreneurs to work. This is nice because it creates a long-term rental agreement. So they allow you, certain of the containers will be there for a short period and then you spin out and go to your own. But in this case, because liquid culture is still connected with the university, is still connected with the brewery, and uh, my business partner is a lecturer at the University of the Free State, um, you know, it's nice to stay together. It's a, you're much stronger together. So currently we serve up to 10% of the South African craft beer sector. We're looking to really growing that more. We have experienced very consistent growth, even during the lockdown phase, when alcohol was completely under prohibition. Thanks to everybody who brewed a pineapple beer at home and had to buy yeast somewhere. We are very grateful for that. So thank you to all the brewers. Once again, I'd just like to say that the success of this entire project has been thanks to the University of the Free State, who have been instrumental in bringing us up, being willing to listen, willing to let us make mistakes, and then helping us correct them. Once again, the willingness is absolutely the key factor to this. So now I'd like to just say thank you to everyone. If you'd like to contact me ever, it's christopheradliquidculture.co.za. If you need any questions and if you want to get in touch with the people who have been so instrumental to helping us. And yeah, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Christopher. I, I don't note any questions that are in the chat room, but I, I thought I would ask you a question around the bureaucratic constraints that you alluded to within yes. universities, because we want to create an enabling third stream revenue model at all avenues. But if you could just give us three mm -hmm. takeaways that you think universities could do better to enable an entrepreneurial environment, specifically to enable third stream revenue as our income streams become more and more constrained, as money becomes economically, you know, the economic challenges we face is going to push us into a direction of are starting to rely on third stream revenue streams much more uh, concisely. So if we could just have your thoughts on that, I think that that would really be helpful. So I'd say one of the main issues is sometimes during this uh, chain in the bureaucracy that you have to follow is some people at the university aren't always so willing, you know, whether the company, the entrepreneurial venture succeeds or not, it's not going to influence their life in any way. So you always get people who are more into seeing problems than seeing solutions. So getting the correct team of um, positive, like-minded individuals to lead up these kinds of entrepreneurial ventures are very important. Also, the way that universities find the entrepreneurs. You know, many people don't even know that universities are willing to support them. So they come to class and they go home and they go do their thing. But uh, for instance, this um, intervarsity for the entrepreneurs that we had last year was absolutely profound. You know, many students heard for the first time that there is this kind of project and interestingly enough, you know, very few entrepreneurs come from entrepreneurship courses. You know, many students go to university and they study entrepreneurship for three or four years and they very rarely do anything with it. So entrepreneurs aren't necessarily in the financial departments on campus, on the business part. Sometimes there are a musician somewhere in that department, a microbiologist sitting lonely in his lab, something like that. So it's important to have these kinds of outreaches, people keeping an eye on research projects and what's going on. And identifying possible possible commercialization and enabling people to find that the last thing i would say is universities are governed by very strict bureaucratic rules like i said it's lots of paperwork lots of applications very poor communication between some of the departments so it's important to get a streamlined process get an idea of if a student approaches us with an idea who's the person they go see what's the next step in that so if you can only push through one entrepreneur to kind of be the pathfinder through this maze, then at least for next for the next entrepreneurs, you'll have an idea of what to go and you'll get better and better and better doing that. So I'd say that those would be my top three takeaways for universities to look at. Christopher, thank you so much. Very insightful and very helpful. And uh, please don't stop. I, I enjoy your beer tremendously. And I'm certainly one of your avid fans. So thank you very, thank you very much, much for your It's an absolute pleasure to hear about that and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll be moving on now to a very, uh, somebody that I respect deeply and is uh, well known to all of us, Professor Chetty from the University of the Witwatersrand. He's the Dean for the Faculty of Science and 
very humble and, and uh, a person with huge humility. I must say that his work, I don't think he knows how big his fan base is, but um, Professor Chetty is a theoretical physicist with a strong interest in education in next generation of science within Africa. He serves as the vice president of the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics. He is instrumental. He was instrumental in setting up the African School for Electronic Structure Methods and Applications. And his credentials go on and on, but what is of of particular importance is that he is a two-time winner of the American Fulbright Fellowship. So in preparation of Professor Chetty's uh, session, which is titled Growing University Commercialization Through the Postgraduate Research Pipeline, it is, it is important for us just to reflect on his achievements and also the value that he will bring to this discourse. So Professor Chetty, thank you and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Linda. Uh, is my audio coming through? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It's a pleasure for me to talk with you about enhancing innovation in the postgraduate pipeline. Uh, so, so I'm really mostly focused on the P on PhD production. You will know that currently the, the, the goal in South Africa is to produce on the order of 6,000 PhD students by around the year 2025. I see this as mostly aspirational. Currently, as a matter of fact, we're producing on the order of 3,000 PhDs per year across all disciplines in South Africa. So we have a way to go. At the University of Witwatersrand, where I'm, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science, we have also adopted a, a strategic plan to increase our postgraduate numbers. In fact, we're on track to increasing this to on the order of 45% of the total stu student population, where PhD production is obviously critically important in this context. Now, many of my comments are gonna be made in the context of PhD training. However, the notions that I will be presenting are, are really applicable to, to multiple levels within the university. As Dean, I think I'm mostly concerned about the well-being and the future of our PhD students because I do see a potential crisis looming in the future. The real question then is where are these PhD students going to be employed? Uh, I think that the system has become, the higher education system has become quite constrained. It's, it's, it's becoming saturated. You will know that we have basically only two new universities that ha have, been, have been set up. They're not necessarily growing at a, at an, at a significant rate. So the current system is, is, is somewhat saturated. If we're going to be increasing our PhD production, then we better find better ways to, to make our graduates more employable. The country, of course, needs this. There's no doubt about this, and this is a good thing. Uh, COVID-19 has highlighted the need for more creative thinking around the future of, of work. We've got to think about how it is that we should be approaching, approaching jobs for the future. I think that our current generation of, of, of graduates are much more intent on making a, a meaningful contribution to society, and we ought to capitalize on that. So we really talk about an age-old discussion, which is about not just simply occupying slots in the economy, we want our graduates to be able to create slots in the economy. And it's debatable the extent to which we've been able to achieve that over, over the decades. What we really don't want is more PhD students driving taxis in downtown Johannesburg. I'm sure it will make for an interesting backseat conversation, but that's really going to have quite an incredible back pressure on the higher education system, in my view. It will increasingly then call into question the relevance of our university system, especially in the context of our developing economy. We will lose societal support in the long term if we do not address this issue, the employability of all of our students, especially our increasing number of PhD graduates. So I think at this time, we, we have an incredible responsibility to address the question of the employability of our graduates. Obviously at the universities, we do have professional degrees. If you graduate with a degree in, uh, in dentistry, I expect you're gonna get a job in dentistry, but I'm mostly targeting general de uh, degrees as we would have say in the Faculty of Science or the Faculty of Humanities, but many of these ideas of course transfer quite quite naturally to, to all, all disciplines in the, in the university. Clearly, we want our graduates to be more entrepreneurial. This has been a clarion call for a long time. It's questionable as to how well we've been able to achieve, achieve this. And I'd like to explore some of the barriers to that. 
there is an implicit understanding when government and our funding agents and, and even industry talk about increasing our PhDs and supporting PhD uh, scholarships. There's this implicit understanding that our students will become more entrepreneurial one way or the other, that they would be more innovative in society. But the question is, are they? How can we make this connection more tangible? And that is a question that concerns me greatly as the Dean of Science. I want to explore, and we've begun this process at Wits University, as to how it is that we can integrate more formally the ideas of innovation into the science curriculum. Now, the innovation entrepreneurial commercial ecosystem does exist. It's arguable just how well that does indeed um, work, but, but there is a system in, in, in many countries, especially including South Africa, we do indeed have a system that is in place. Basically, the idea goes as follows. You arrive at, at step one with some kind of idea, hopefully an exciting one, a concept, it could be a prototype, and, and that you, you have a gut feeling is, is potentially uh, commercially viable. So, so you could arrive from many different disciplines, of course, and I often refer to science. I'm the Dean of Science and I might, might uh, come across as being parochial about science, but really I, I think of science more generally, just as we have with the Academy of Science. It pertains to all disciplines beyond the, the, the Faculty of Science, including especially engineering, health sciences and uh, humanities and so on. Uh, so you could arrive at step one with an exciting idea from, from, from any one of your disciplines, but of course we know full well that there have been many exciting ideas that have come to the fore through very informal means, through, through folk just thinking creatively about, uh, about solutions that are, are, are needed. So there are lots of steps um, that, are, that come into play, ma mainly in the business world, as has been suggested by the previous speaker, for, for instance, the need for, for, for funding and support and so on. And it's not sequential. It's a very complex environment. It, that environment is not always clear to scientists. There's great potential for things to go wrong. In fact, if you look at the probability of success, it's well, way less than 1%. So having the best intellectual idea does not necessarily mean automatic commercial success. So there is this broad ecosystem in South Africa that involves firstly the university system, if you're located in the university, but beyond there would be tier uh, NRF increasingly now with DSI uh, basically having changed from DST, they are being very important in this context, TRIP, CSR, there are many different systems in, in play that, that, uh, that can, can be called upon for, for assistance and support. It's not an easy journey as has been suggested by the by the previous speaker. And after a, a, a large number of steps, uh, by, by step N, where N is, is some large number, I suppose there is, is uh, the possibility of, of, uh, of commercial success. But, but really as, as, as a scientist and as, uh, as one who's deeply uh, consumed or interested in, 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 in addressing the challenges that we face, I want to ask what, is, what does step zero look like even before getting to step one? What is it that we ought to be doing, especially in our university systems to ensure that we have an increasing number of exciting ideas that come bubbling through the system? Uh, so, so what is wrong with the current system? Uh, I've said arguably we have, have an ecosystem that does work if, if we want to drive the system a little bit more stronger. I suppose one could ask for more efficiencies in the system, more money being available, more, uh, less barriers in terms of securing intellectual property and, and, and the like. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that that in itself is gonna give us a step change in the, in the outputs that we require. I think one of the big problems for me is that the system depends so critically on on ideas accidentally percolating through the system. And I want to ask as a scientist, how is it that we can increase this probability, not in a informal way, but in a formal way. Increasingly now I want for us to conceptualize more carefully what it is that step zero is, what, what it is or what should it be? And I think we need a conversation in South Africa as to what it is that we ought to be doing uh, more effectively well within our university system well before we even think about ideas percolating to step one. A further issue that I have with the current system is that, and, and this is true not just in South Africa, it's true all, all around the world. I feel that the funding system for many decades now has tried to encourage our scientists to work more on practical applications with greater societal impact. You look, you just need to look at an NRF application and you will see that there are sections that you need to fill out and complete that speak specifically to this. And of course, our supervisors, our senior academics don't necessarily want to dilute the disciplines. If you spend the, the if you spend 
spend the better part of your of your training, uh, your education and, and your career working on a theoretical subject such as quantum gravity, I think it is, is, it is very difficult for, for, for such an individual to change midstream. And I don't think that it's necessarily healthy for our higher education system to demand that. So, so we, for, for the, for the concerns around the current system that we have, we, I, I believe we need to be training scientists in the methods of business. I think it's a, it's a, that, that would be an easier route to take rather than increasingly try to, to get business folk to, to, to learn the methods and ideas of science. Science graduates obviously do have that option. For instance, many, many PhD graduates, and I'm still focusing mostly on, on PhD students, they do after, after graduating and looking around, not finding any, any job possibilities as an afterthought, almost after, out of an act of desperation, do tend to venture out into the business world that might consider an MBA, for instance. And that option has always existed. I'm not so sure whether that is gonna significantly change the environment that we're looking, looking at. Uh, we, we, we do tend currently to try to pull ideas out of science from the business world. And I, I feel that we increasingly now need to change the direction of that ve vector. From the science world, I'd like for us to push more ideas out into the business world. And that begins to conceptualize for me what step zero is. So innovation, in my view, lies in the ingenuity of science. That is what step zero really is. The university is a, is a great reservoir of potentially viable commercial ideas. We know that, but I don't believe we, we're exploiting this potential sufficiently, for, partly for the reasons that I've already suggested. I think the problem is cultural, that uh, we do not think about innovation in, in uh, or have not embraced innovation in a, in a sufficiently complete way, particularly at our major universities in, in South Africa, who have not given, given the sufficient thought. Uh, the, the mindset of, of typical, particularly senior, senior scientists in the system is that this is somebody else's problem. In particular, it could well be thought of that this is an issue that needs to be addressed increasingly by vocational training or perhaps even the universities of technology. I think we need to change this mindset and we seriously need to give this attention. We often say we want our best students to remain in academia, I'd like to ask the question, really, why? Why would you want that with, it, with a system that is becoming so increasingly inflated? So, so the future in, of innovation, I believe, I, I believe lies in, in, in our students. I think if we try to interrogate and push our senior academics in, in directions that they're not comfortable with, we're going to have a, have a difficulty. And that is where I think we've often been barking up the wrong tree, not, not just within South Africa. As I've indicated, I think this problem is, is worldwide. I, I think the real potential lies with our students. Our students are the ones whose futures are in their hands, they're in our hands, and we need to pay much attention, much more attention to their well-being. And I think they are at a stage where they need to be seriously thinking about their future. If they haven't, and if they're not doing so, then they are, then there clearly is a serious problem. We need to in inspire our students and young scientists to think much more creatively of the, uh, about the work with a view to to, to, uh, to more practical and viable applications. But I want to do this in a, in, in a particular way. I want to do this in a way that does not dilute the, the, the rigor of the academic degrees. I want to do this without turning our universities in technology centers, not entirely anyway, because I think innovation centers and hubs are important uh, add on to our, our universities. I still believe that the open, free and quarry based university should not be undermined through this process that is still very essential for the well being of the universities. The strongest basis, in my view, for, the, for innovation remains in basic fundamental research-led universities. This is the engine room for new ideas, but more importantly, this is the engine room for, uh, for bright students, and that's what I want to reach out to. It's, it's important that we try to, uh, try to do this uh, concurrently rather than sequentially, and that is an important idea that I'm, I'm trying to promote. We, we focus on our science students, and I talk about this more generally, of course, beyond the Faculty of Science. Students need to be exposed to the ideas of, of innovation during the course of the degrees, in particular during the PhD degrees, not at the end, not as an afterthought, not after... Uh, uh, after an act of, of desperately looking for a job, but right at the very outset, right from the very beginning. 
there's a need for formal training, uh, a training program in innovation on the science side, much more than the business side. I think we are covering the business aspects reasonably completely. So this has to be an, an intervention on the, on, the, on the academic side. I'd like to see this happen in parallel rather than subsequ uh, subsequently. Integration is very important here. This way, I believe students will be ins inspired to think innovatively about the work in real time uh, at the outset, uh, at the very outset rather than after the fact. And that I think needs to be given very, very uh, careful attention. And I don't think it's been given careful, sufficient attention in, in any, of, any of our universities currently. So, so at WITS, uh, we've embarked on, 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 a, on, on a new program. I've only arrived at WITS as Dean of Science in December of last year. And of course, through the COVID lockdown, it has set us back a little bit. But this is, this is in essence, what we have, uh, have, have put in place. We, we're looking at registering uh, students for a PhD or a selection of students. We want to choose those students very uh, stringently, simultaneously for a PhD and a new qualification. And this has to happen uh, concurrently. So initially then our, our, we want to grow this fairly, fairly gradually. We're looking at a semester course that will grow into a postgraduate diploma course over one year where we just look at the mechanics of things. But ultimately, and this has been my holy grail for a long time now, I would like to institute a Master of Science in Innovation uh, over 18 months that will include a real project uh, in innovation. So uh, this would entail basically a three plus one year commitment. It's not sequential, but parallel. And so in four years, the student graduates with two degrees. And of course, we, if we choose our, our, the very best of our students, the most ambitious and hardworking, then I think it is doable. The innovation part can, of course, be done part time. I mean, now COVID has suggested to us that we can do an awful lot on, online and in the evenings and so on. But this essentially should not impact negatively on, on, on the PhD. This is very important in the way in which I think about things. So, so uh, I'm looking at uh, um, selecting from around 450 PhD students that we have in the faculty, around 25 to 30 students. But to be fair, I do want to look, look beyond the Faculty of Science. So let's just say about 30 students drawn broadly from, from, from other disciplines, uh, science and, and, and beyond. And they've got to be students that demonstrate a strong ambition to grow in this direction. For me, it's a proof of concept. I want to demonstrate the success of this of this idea. All this needs is, is support from the supervisor that the student can work simultaneously on, an, on a different degree, but this will not uh, negate in any way or dilute the PhD degrees. Some folk have already said to me, not permissible, not advisable, same old, same old, I think is going to give rise to the same old solutions. I think we do need to look at administrative uh, constraints in the system that can try to enable uh, new ideas to work rather than uh, be constrained by, by current administrative and bureaucratic requirements. So what, what are the needs to make this happen? Very quickly, I'm looking for four years of bursary support, three plus one, for about 30 students. So, so that I, I certainly want to talk with, uh, with USAF and DHET about that specifically, NRF as well. Uh, we're currently in the process of, of uh, developing a curriculum. That's where, where we are at, at Wits University. This will be a new degree. What does a Master of Science in Innovation look like as different from, say, uh, an MBA, MBA in Innovation or, or Masters of Commerce in Innovation? I think that is what we need to focus on. There would always be an entrepreneurial aspect to the MSc in Innovation. And, and I think all of those elements are in place and we will always work uh, collaboratively with commerce to make this happen. It's innovation aspects that we need to give much more attention to. What does innovation training entail? We need to uh, contemplate that. How can we con uh, conceptualize this more definitively? I believe that the worldwide ideas that are emerging and we are already, uh, already considering many, many novel novel interventions. This is the beginnings of what I call step zero. So just to give you in a nutshell, some of the ideas that we are exploring, obviously the dual degree uh, based in the Faculty of Science, inviting other students, PhD students from other faculties, driven from the science side more than the business side, not in any way to undermine the business aspects. I think the ecosystem is in place. We talk about step zero, getting us getting us to base one in the baseball analogy or really step one, which is where I think we want to be. Uh, the business part can be taught by business experts. So we're not 
intending to duplicate those efforts. But in many ways, this is really the, the, uh, the uh, concept of what step zero looks, uh, looks like in, in, in my view. Of course, we've, we've, we've begun to flesh much of this out. Happy to share some, some ideas with, with folk if, the, if, if you wish to, to write to me. So basically, the science part should be taught by scientists, taught by innovators themselves. We want to uh, recruit individuals uh, from, from academia and also from industry, especially from industry, I would say. People who walk the journey from scientific principle all the way to successful enterprise. So that's, the, that's going to be our, our big resource. We want to teach by way of case examples, uh, much in the same way as laws taught by way of precedents. So work in syndicates of about five students, say, PhD students, uh, drawn from dis different disciplines, each led by a mentor, work on projects from start to finish, including building, actually doing things, building uh, prototypes, developing business plans, etc. That will be the core part of the theory, uh, theoretical practical part of the, of the project, of, of the degree rather where one is learning by doing and walking the path of successful innovators. But importantly, for the MSc degree, then one would need to work on a real innovation project for the MSc. And that, of course, has incredible uh, possibilities in terms of being able to get to step one and then being uh, being in a position to try to exploit the, the vast ecosystem that does exist for uh, that, that will hopefully result in, in success in however way you wish to uh, um, measure that. So colleagues, my last slide then, because I think my time is coming up. Students will be, in, in my view, they are asked uh, through this process, be inspired to think more smartly and innovatively about their PhD research. Of that, I have no doubt. Uh, to be doing this, uh, uh, doing this uh, during the time, not, not at the end in real time as they pursue their research. I believe it enhances excellence in research. It does not degrade, this, degrade your research project in any way. Students will be much more vigilant to new ideas, even very far removed from the, the PhD research. Of that, I'm sure. I expect science graduates, they're not to simply linger on at universities. They should look forward to entering the world beyond and they will be equipped, inspired to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Chetty. We have a number of questions, and I think I will start off with the, the first question around the session is titled Growing Commercialization and the Postgraduate Research Pipeline. So one of the elements that we see is that what is the incentive for students to bring their research to university institutions? Is the IP model and the shared research commercialization and operationalization of this research output? Is it fair and equitable? And more importantly, is it enabling for us to harness the postgraduate construct of the knowledge development and the product output that is then enabled? So, so that's, that's a, a long question, but an important one. I think personally, there are far too, too many barriers. I think our system's too hung up on IP. It is important, it, does, it, it is expensive, and that is a barrier for our universities, our students as well. I, I would rather that we take a much more practical approach. You have an idea, you start working very much on, on prototyping the idea and, and find the least, uh, least uh, possible path to, to commercialization. I think particularly in the developing world, I'd like to see that happen much more efficiently. Uh, students have an incentive. I, I've said that uh, by the time you get to a PhD, if you have not discovered, um, you would have largely been driven by, by your academic interests. And, and that is great. And we should not, uh, we should not try to, to change that. But by the time you get to, to around 25 years, 26 years old, and, and you're staring, uh, staring your future in, in a square on in the face, I think you ought to be asking yourself the question very seriously, what now? Uh, you could explore academic possibilities uh, in terms of jobs, but you better start thinking much more uh, creatively about, about innovation, because this is one way in which PhD students can, can contribute uh, to society, but, but really ultimately this incentive to students is to basically be successful and, and, and make, make money out of it. Thank you, Professor Chetty. The next question is, in what way do we measure research output working towards the commercialization agenda of universities? So, so at the, um, so, so that's, a, that's, a fair, that's a fair question. And I've, I've been very meticulous in saying that I do not want to 
impact on in any negative way on on the PhD. So the PhD should continue un, unhindered, and and all of the requirements in terms of a peer review, in terms of peer reviewed publications and. Uh, and in terms of uh, a thesis that is properly examined, it must continue unhindered. So it's this parallel process of, of learning skills and actually doing things in very practical ways that I want to impart to our students simultaneously whilst they're producing their, their, their PhDs. I don't necessarily think that this uh, uh, the second qualification needs to be uh, measured by way of, of research outputs, not necessarily, not necessarily in terms of IP and patents and so on, but I think in terms of very practical outputs. I think in South Africa, we need to take a much more practical approach to innovation, work on problems, get, get inspired by, by the path that has been traversed by previous successful innovators, get inspired that way, and, and hopefully that, uh, that uh, invokes in, 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 our, in, our, in the best of our students a, a creative spirit that gets them to think more smartly, more creatively, more innovatively about, about uh, the world around them. Thank you. I think then in closing, Professor Chetty, just your, your top three takeaways for us in, in giving universities advice about constructing programs that enable entrepreneurial mindsets as opposed to entrepreneurship as, as a singular activity? So, so I, I do think that the, the push from science into the business world, very important rather than the pull from the business, uh, from, uh, pull from the business, from science into the business world. I think scientists need to take the responsibility of educating our students and getting them more exposed to the, to the ideas of innovation. I think at WITS, we, we are embarking on something quite ambitious at the PhD le level, dual degree, it, it, it is, uh, it is tough. Uh, there are lots of barriers. There are lots of bureaucratic uh, constraints. The current system does not uh, does not permit this, uh, and and many folk are, are are pushing back and saying that this is not advisable. Try to go with the uh, with the sequential idea, and 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 I don't think that that's that's going to be very 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 uh, helpful. So so um, I would say that uh, changing the culture for innovation in, in our universities does not necessarily have to be as as uh, um, as ambitious as what we are trying to achieve, I, I, I am quite uh, focused on on, on 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 developing this proof of concept. But there's an awful lot that one can do at the undergraduate level. There's, there really is one. One could have a course, just a, a, a course that is an option that is uh, an elective to any student in science or engineering that focuses on uh, briefly on some of these topics. A, a single course is not going to cover all of the all of the aspects. So I would I would suggest very strongly that that you know as a point of entry, just simply have have a course available uh, that, that students can take. And, and thirdly, we're not alone in this. I think there are many institutions around the world that are grappling with very similar, similar uh, challenges and we can work collaboratively with, with other institutions. I, uh, at Wits University, we have a bi long-standing bilateral uh, arrangement with the University of Edinburgh and we've really struck up a very good conversation around this and it's really a, a, a situation where we both are learning from each other. It's not a matter of the, the age-old sort of uh, relationship where, where we come second best. I think the ideas that we're putting on the table are really intriguing to them. So we're jointly de de developing these ideas together. So international collaboration is important on this. Professor Chetty, thank you very much for an insightful session. And uh, we know that you're extremely busy. So we, we're most grateful for the time that you were able to make available to us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure indeed. Thank you so much indeed. Bye thank now. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. We are now moving on to our third insert, which is titled Venture Creation Programs, a dialogue on the success of teaching through entrepreneurship. So this is, a, this is going to be a highlight session for us because we have Professor Evan Larson and we have Mr. Anthony Hill, who is well known to us for getting things done. And we also have uh, Dr. van der Westeisen, one of our multi-award winning academic professionals that will be serving to summate the session for us and also to lead the question and answer session. So Professor Larson is from the NTNU School of Entrepreneurship, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And Mr. Larson is working as an assistant professor within that uh, institution. He is well-renowned and within the School of Management, he has 
contributed to major research and development in the country. Mr. Anthony Hill is the company director of Siat Yala and founder of the Future Managers Program at UCT. He holds an MA degree and, and a multiplicity of other, of other qualifications, and he is an industrial psychologist. His track record speaks for itself, and the UCT Genesis Program is well-renowned and has a proven track record of success. Dr. van der Westeisen, as I mentioned earlier, is a multi-award winning academic professional. She is the convener for the Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa to develop academic entrepreneurship. And she's also the founder of SHAPE, which is Shifting Hope, Activating Potential Entrepreneurship. And she is also, she's won a, a, a multiple array of, of awards and has led many flagship projects and uh, I'll, I'll be here for the entire session if I have to read through the rest of the credentials. So I'm handing over now for uh, Professor Larson to start the session. He will, it will then be followed by Mr. Hill and we will then have Dr. van der Vestes and th that will summarize the session for us and lead the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor thank Larson. You so, yes, thank you so much, uh, Linda. I'll, uh, I'll share my... Um, uh, screen uh, with you guys and first of all uh, congratulations with this great um, great digital event uh, it's uh, so great to to see that you can can have this uh, this event uh, run digitally so uh, congratulations on that and let's just see if I can share my screen uh, for some reason I'm actually now getting uh, uh, sorry for this um, for some reason, it's not. Is it okay if I can uh, present uh, as number two? Because it seems like uh, I cannot share on this computer. It, it counts now. Can I go as number two? Sure. Certain. Certainly. I'm sure Mr. Hill is ready. Thank you. Uh, you want to speak now, Linda? Please, if, if, that's, if that's convenient. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I was going to start off saying um, I didn't know we were allowed to smile here until I saw Dr. van der Westhuizen smile. So that was a nice beginning for me. And the next thing I was going to say is I was impressed by uh, Professor Larson's um, contribution. But I can't say that now because I haven't heard it yet. Okay, so I'm going to try sharing my screen and let's see how this goes. Uh, okay, and I've got three slides, which is a hell of a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Genesis today. Am I talking too loudly? Are you, are you all happy with, am I coming across fine? Perfect pitch, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Professor Larson, um, you're not from Africa, we know that. Genesis, at the bottom here, we've said Sia Chala, Sia Funda, Sia Kula. And what that actually means is we are planting, we're learning, we're growing. So if you want to start a business, you, you plant, you plant ideas, you plant new concepts. Hopefully you learn from your mistakes, uh, from what you do. And then most importantly, the business grows, but more important than that, you as individual people grow. Let me tell you a little bit about Genesis. First of all, um, I'm not affiliated to any university and I don't consult to any university. My involvement with Genesis program is from an external direct perspective. Genesis is the core program taught in the postgraduate diploma in entrepreneurship at the University of Cape Town, their commerce faculty. It's been going and people don't really know that for about 25 years now. And when I was in the corporate world, I actually employed a couple of people. So if we want to start a business, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to find seed capital. Yeah, we could go to our parents, um, we could go to our friends, not necessarily with much success. But part of students signing up for this program is finding seed capital to start a business because that's what they have to do. Um, 
And if you're going to run a business, it's not always a clever idea to go out on your own. It's really good to work with other people. So the first thing that students are required to do is network and get together a group of about six to seven people, um, fellow students. And it's ironic, but we found that over the years, uh, the dynamics and the mix, the demographics are almost perfect. Um, just for interest on the program, it's the mix. Uh, I think gender is about 47% female and 53% male. There's a nice wealth of cultures. People from all over the world attend the program, primarily from the continent of Africa. Um, so you find somebody to work with, you're required to do that. And then what do you do? You go sell cake. Well, actually not. They are required to have two cake sales at the beginning of the year and nobody sells cakes anymore. They sell hot dogs, hamburgers, health drinks, coffee to fellow students in order to get that seed capital they know to start off a business. So they require seed capital, they sell on campus and they get together something between 15 to 75,000 rand in order to get the business going. But hold on. Starting a business while studying, we're not talking about a business off campus here. It is the core requirement of the program. They have to start a business with the normal type of things, product ideation and development. Um, everybody comes to the table with their greatest idea um, and they learn about how do we manage conflict? How do we go through a process? They learn about the value chain from suppliers right through to consumers. And consumers are not always those easy to access students next year, they're sometimes outside. Often we find in this program, a lot of people will come along and say, oh, suppliers, okay. And then they say, we can get this component or the raw materials cheaper from China without thinking about what that means for inventory, what it means for um, um, cash flow, et cetera. So they then learn to develop stakeholder relationships. And this is, this is crucial because most of the stakeholders happen to be small entrepreneurs, often in townships, who are the people that they partner with to supply and develop their products. They also learn to take responsibility in this program. And that means taking responsibility. You're part of a business, you're running a business. Why didn't you get to the meeting? Oh, I had a tutorial. Oh, we all did. Why didn't you get to the next meeting and why didn't you present the report? Oh, I had a project for academics. Sorry, we all did. So they learn these things and they learn it primarily through action learning. And action learning, working in teams, they have to identify key roles and responsibilities and they have to learn not only as individuals, but as a group. Primarily the guide here uh, is real-time coaching and mentoring. And that's where people like the course convener come in and people like myself who are Genesis directors. They're made up of a board of experienced business leaders as well as people who have recently uh, completed the program. Now, coaching and mentoring is one thing, but part of the role is actually assessment for academic purposes. So who does the assessment? Well, that's the role of the Genesis directors in conjunction with academic staff, but separate to them, we assess how people are doing on the program. Finally, at the end of the year, hopefully they've passed all the academic courses, they've done well enough in Genesis to complete their qualification. But does it stop there? Well, our experience over the last 20, 25 years is that somebody takes the business forward. They're so excited by the idea. It might be one or two people. It might be all of them. Um, normally, the norm is about one, two, two to three people who take the business forward. So in essence, and I'd love to speak the whole day on it, what we have here is an integrated venture creation program driven by a university, assessed and academically rig rigorous that fits into the requirements of postgraduate studies, but it exists. 
And it also exists within the ecosystem, not only of the university, but the ecosystem of the country. And the course convener has taken special um, actions to make sure that students meet continuously with external stakeholders, from venture capitalists to people who in fact know what they're doing and can give good guidance to them, as well as invest in their, their products. Um, wow, I'm not used to speaking such a short time, but that'll do for now. So what I'd like to say to students who want to start their business and might have to in the future, rise up. There are many programs that already exist, rise up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Larson? Yes, I should be, uh, be ready to, uh, to share my screen now. Thank you for this, uh, Anthony. It's, it's super interesting to see the similarities with uh, how you think and also how we uh, work here in, um, in, in Norway, in the northern part of the world. So uh, yeah. at the end of the day, we have the same goal. So uh, if you can close your uh, presentation, Anthony. That, yes, uh, I will. Uh, to share mine. I will. Thank you. So, Sorry. Um, if we can go here. Um, hopefully you can see my presentation now. So um, thank you for, uh, for your presentations, Linda. Um, so my name is Evan Larsen and I'm an assistant professor at uh, and to new in Norway, uh, we're a technical and uh, scientific university of, of Norway. And uh, um, the way um, entrepreneurship, I just want to start there, is, is about entrepreneurial individuals creating innovative, uh, innovative organizations that grow and create value, either for the purpose of profit or not, just to, to frame our start here. Um, but entrepreneurship does not have to include the creation of new organization, it can also occur in existing organizations, more like intrapreneurship as uh, a term that uh, is well known. Um, although scientists are still debating whether entrepreneurial skills are inborn or can be taught, there is a growing consensus that certain entrepreneurial knowledges, skills and mindsets can be successfully taught. And uh, as I'm working in academia, I'm, I'm really glad that we actually can teach our students to become more entrepreneurial. Um, I just briefly want to talk about those, those three main ways of looking at uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, and how you actually teach entrepreneurship. Um, you classify them often in three different uh, stages. It's uh, either uh, about, for, or through. And uh, the way we teach is that we focus on learning entrepreneurship through entrepreneurship, not only about looking at, okay, what do they, the entrepreneurs do over there, not only for that, okay, maybe sometime, sometime in the future, you want to do entrepreneurship, but we focus on through. So it's more being an entrepreneur, taking action instead of right. learning how to be an entrepreneur and being more passive and being more on the side. Uh, within this, um, we have what's called the value creation uh, approach. It's uh, you have to create some kind of value. Um, and in education, it's about letting students learn by applying their knowledge to create something of value to external stakeholders. That's sort of the definition. It's not only for yourself, but it has to be some kind of external value that you are creating. And uh, this can be nonprofit, NGOs, or organization. And this is the, the more wide uh, definition of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurship. Um, in our program that I will uh, present a bit uh, more is uh, we talk about venture creation program and uh, our students, they have to start real companies. And there's no question, they have to start real companies and it's real life ventures. And we believe that you learn entrepreneurship through actually starting your own ventures. Um, just going back to the university setting where, where we have a lot of research going on, uh, we also uh, are familiar uh, internally with the, the term surrogate entrepreneurship, which is also a way to commercialize public research. research. Um, and through our program, we, we work closely with the TTO, the, the Technology Transfer Office, to make sure that the research is actually being uh, used and utilized in the market. 
and uh, our students are. Sorry, Prof. Larson, uh, your slides are not moving on the presentation. We they? just see currently your beautiful picture and name and an email. <laughs> I'm sure there's much more to, there's, to your there, presentation. There okay. Um, sorry for Thank that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Maybe this. Um, Fantastic. We're at the pedagogy. Okay. Value there we creation. Are. Sorry. Perfect. There we are. Great. So, um, Thank you for no, uh, notifying me. So, uh, as I said, you learn about entrepreneurship, for entrepreneurship, or through entrepreneurship. Um, so it's more, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, that's where we focus instead of uh, learning how to become an entrepreneur. Um, as I talked about, the value creation is, is more that, okay, you create some value to external stakeholders. Uh, and this can be non-profit, NGOs, or organization. But... Uh, we focus more on the venture creation, as also Anthony talked about, that uh, the students learn through starting real ventures. They learn the skills, the knowledges, and the mindset through actually starting uh, real ventures. Um, and since we are a part of a university, uh, we also look at commercializing the public research. So um, there are, uh, we have a technology transfer office that we work with, and uh, through our master program, which is a postgraduate program, uh, we uh, enable our students to actually work with real research from the university. And our university also acknowledged that this is a great resource to actually test and get the research out into the market. And that's where uh, we have this Antony School of Entrepreneurship, which is our master program. Uh, the pedagogy that we use, it's, it's all about acting. You have, to, you have to do something, engage with the doing. It's about interacting and engaging with others. You can't do it by yourself. It's about challenge and engage with the real world. It's not just a university setting. You have to talk to real people and real companies. You have to embrace uncertainty. And also we uh, use a lot of reflection to actually engage with the learning. We've been going on for about uh, 17 years uh, and 50% uh, of our students, they actually continue with their venture after graduation. And uh, based on our 17 year uh, lifespan, we have created uh, 140 companies that are still alive. Um, and it's not our program and venture creation program. It's not just about going into a lecture every Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to 12. It's, it's much more than that. Uh, we have an incubator where the students actually can sit and they can uh, share uh, ideas with each other. We have business mentors. We have an alumni network. All our courses are linked to uh, the venture that the, star, the students have to start. Um, we also have seed funding, workshops, uh, and, and so on. So it's all about all the resources around the program that makes it uh, essential and also enables our student to actually create real value and create real ventures. Um, so to sum up, a uh, venture creation program is educational programs where students learn through starting real ventures. And um, we are doing a lot of research uh, on this field and we've been in contact with almost 200 universities to map out uh, how do they teach entrepreneurship. Uh, are they teaching more about, more for, or through? And uh, my ask for, for all of you is actually if you know any university programs in Africa that teach entrepreneurship through entrepreneurship. Um, we want to uh, include African universities in our research. Uh, and uh, so my ask is if you know someone that teaches this way, please reach out to me. And uh, we would love to learn more about how you do it or in in that case if you're planning to to start an uh, a master program uh, where uh, students can learn entrepreneurship through entrepreneurship so that's my presentation uh, for now thank you thank you i'm handing over to dr van der westesen for the next five minutes to lead us on the q a session and then Give us a brief summation at the end of the session. Thank you. Dr. Van Westesen, we can't hear you. I think now you can. 
Clearly, uh, thank you. Anthony, even thank you so much for your, your fascinating uh, presentations. And I think what we see in common from both of you is that you both got uh, action learning and experiential learning, learning by doing approach going on, one at the bottom and one in, in Norway. Norway. So um, looking at the, the theme of the session, universities as catalysts for entrepreneurial change, we saw two case studies where applied learning is making a difference in student premier's lives and where the university academia are being incorporated to, uh, to train these students, not only in academic way, but in a much more practical applied way to getting the business off the, off the, gr off the ground. Um, at UCT, we've got planting, learning and, and growing. And what I liked from Anthony's words were, we are growing individuals. Therefore, it applies, we are growing human beings. We are not growing or manufacturing or producing, incubating just entrepreneurs. And that is quite important to think of ecosystem growth, growing human beings. There was a mention of uh, the program being gender balance. And that's often a case that we wonder in our institutes when we offer the programs, how many males versus female participate in the, in the program. And uh, we've seen different cases in South Africa where they, they are voluntary um, gender balance participation in these type of entrepreneurship offerings. Uh, also coming out from the case study is that studentpreneurs are encouraged to find seed funding and that is a quite a good element of the program because it enables the students not to be reliant on funding. Usually when we do the research and ask, what is your biggest barrier to entrepreneurship? And they say funding, uh, uh, training them to look for seed funding. And we made a joke on it, even through selling cakes and, and they move up to hamburgers or hot dogs, doesn't matter. Something that brings in its funds. Now, um, it, it seems also from this case study that there's a, a very large pedagogical investment in, to the student entrepreneurs familiarizing themselves with the ecosystem. A lot of ecosystemic support and we can define community whichever way we want. The, the community within the university or the larger community which in the student entrepreneur lives and, and doing business. And I think that was quite crucial to say that uh, we, we are fostering human beings, not only entrepreneurs, to create value within a, in a community. Um, I, I, I like the idea of, of the collective approach um, where student entrepreneurs uh, then learn in a group. And then the essence was, um, they one or more can 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 take it forward uh, the business and then apply it and then become real entrepreneurs on, on their own uh important note was for an applying to entrepreneurial mindset is when you do not have that confidence within the the system if you, you battle with entrepreneurial mindset as an entrepreneur the message from anthony was rise up um moving on to prof larson uh, he spoke about entrepreneurship versus intrapreneurship and then an important aspect of uh, entrepreneur creating an entrepreneurial university. Should student entrepreneurs create their own, uh, own business, it will be in collaboration with the university. Both the university academia and the student entrepreneurs uh, will be intrapreneurs within the bigger framework of, of the university. So definitely there's a strong component of academia and student premiers seeing themselves as, as entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, in Prof. Larson's case, also a very strong uh, element on act. Act, act, act. Action learning, um, experiential, learning, experiential learning. When I look through the slides, I, I relate back to, to the scholarship of Ribbon's uh, 9 and 11 step action learning process, going back to Corp's methods on, uh, on experiential learning. So there's some very good lessons to, to, take, uh, to take out of that. Um, the, uh, the, these two cases got also very in common that both institutes and uh, both programs uh, place a large emphasis on the, the ecosystem. 
that's being formed to support the, the student entrepreneurs. It's not only the task of the academia, but there's a, a massive framework within the university and in the larger community that support the, uh, the, the student entrepreneur. And it seems that the cornerstone of the success of both of these uh, programs might be the strong ecosystemic support that the communities come around and they move the, the student entrepreneurs forward. Um, the, the questions that, that come out, let's, let's let me go to, to Wuba is, um, and see what, what our audience uh, is, is asking on, on this side. Dr. van der Westeisen, we, we have a minute left for your session. So if we could just ask that you ask the seminal thematic question, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Seminal thematic que questions. Thematic, thematic. Just if there's a if there's a central theme in the in the questions that have been raised, just in the interest of time, if we could if we could just deal with that one specific question. At at the moment, there's student entrepreneurs that volunteer for in both of your cases to participate in your program, and it seems very a very good success. There's action learning and experiential learning being applied. What are we doing with the majority? of the undergrad students, perhaps students that's coming from not that privileged background that doesn't have th that spark within them, that's not st stepping up. What do we do as an institute to spark these uh, young student entrepreneurs to become involved and act and experience? It applies to both of you. Okay. Can I go first? May I go no. first? <laughs> of right. course you can. <laughs> um, university, it's very easy. Um, universities are already engaged with communities in terms of developing entrepreneurship. Um, they just have to relook at their policies um, and governance issues, but allow undergraduate students at universities to use the resources of universities to develop businesses while they're studying. And it's, it's, it's a problem at the moment, um, but they need to free them up. That's it. It's as simple as that. Um, as long as they've got good governance in place, relook at their policies in terms of allowing students studying at high learning institutions to start to run businesses on campus and provide them with the, with the resources required. And it's not extra resources. It's simple things like using campus meeting rooms. Okay, that's all I have to say. That's what they need to do. Ecosystem infrastructure. Thank you. That's and, it. And just quickly from my side, I think a lot of people, they have great ideas, uh, but uh, unfortunately they stop because they don't try. So uh, I just want to say, uh, you all have resources. Everyone has something. So start with something small and build on that. Uh, and if you just sit at home, don't do anything, you're passive, go out there, try something, learn and continue, and then step by step, hopefully you become an entrepreneur in some way or another. Just one question on that. So what if I do not want to try? What if I do not have energy? What then? I need to create a job for myself. I know I need to try. I know I need to step up. What is that piece of advice that you give to those student entrepreneurs that want, but they can't get themselves to try. That yeah. entrepreneurial self-efficacy is not there. Yes, uh, and then uh, don't be alone. Try to find something, someone to work with, just to get some kind of motivation, just to find someone that you can share your frustration with, your, your passion with, and so on, because there are people out there that do care, so find them, and then step by step, yeah. try yeah. to uh, increase your Nicely motivation. Said, yeah. And I assume that that would be then within the university. In the university, there's a support framework that can help the student entrepreneur backing with that. Anthony? I agree. I, I, I think he's covered it. Evan's covered everything. Find somebody else. No successful entrepreneur does it. Well, very few do it solely on their own. You need partners. Great, great input there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Larson, Mr. Hill, and Dr. van der Westeisen. I wish we had more time to engage critically in, in this content. Uh, we, we're running a few minutes over time, and just in the interest of, 
of uh, sticking to the program because we have with us uh, Professor Krobler. Professor Krobler, I just want to, before I, I read your resume, just ask, I see that you have three COVID-19 related products that are in proof of concept uh, mode and, and we'll be very excited to, to hear more about that. But uh, Professor Krobler is an Associate Professor at Northwest University. She has vast research experience in network modeling, planning, optimization, and she is a renowned academic and has numerous scholarly articles. I must say that um, I think she worked for the Secret Service before because I had to, <laughs> I had to make an extensive effort to, to, uh, to get her resume available to me because she had not uploaded it on the system. But I Dr. Did. Problem, oh, I, well, there must be my technological deficiency. But uh, I wanted to thank you very much for, for making time, for being with us today. And we look forward to, to your presentation. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just also trying to share my slides with you. Stop sharing. It worked and then it stopped. Can you see it now again or not? No, we can't see it. Okay, let's try again. Yes, it's showing now. Okay, great. So I grew up thinking that everyone was um, just like me and that everyone questioned the way in which the world worked. And maybe it was a result of the fact that my father indulged me to constantly question things and not ever accepting just because as an answer. I was always looking for the bigger picture and I was always trying to figure out how things fit together and how they could potentially be improved or work differently. And I only became aware of it many years later that I was creating my own problems just be able to be able to solve them. Um, I think at the age of 10, I had the first um, is, is the first memory I have of such an event where I lied to my mother that we had an assignment for school to um, create a or to sew a, a textile doll, which was not true. We never um, sewn anything more complicated than a pillowcase, but it was just because I wanted to know how these things are put together and how to be able to do this myself. Um, and then by the time I started studying engineering, I thought that now I would be surrounded by more people like me. And while there were a few, I again realized that many of the engineers studying with me were only trying to figure out what would be asked in the test. And I was focused on how things fit together and how the different subjects were related. And that unfortunately meant that I wasn't a straight A student because I didn't necessarily focus on, on, on the problems. Or, or, or on the problems in the textbook, but on the application of that textbook knowledge on a vast different um, things. But that gave me the advantage of context, and that is something that I find very useful when solving real world problems. I then started working at the university about 13 years ago, and as a lecturer, I thought, well, this is the ideal environment where I'll be allowed to play with the latest technology and where I would be able to come up with new products and solving real world problems. But I then also realized that again, I found myself as someone, the screen sharing stopped again. Let me just reshare it with you. Um, so again, I realized that um, there was a tremendous focus on publishing. And if you have to publish, you have to focus on um, fundamental research and um, coming up with uh, new solutions, which is good. But in the telecoms field where I was working, the problems that we were tackling in research were worlds away from the problems that people in the world uh, and specifically in South Africa was dealing with. So it became a very frustrating 
um, area for me to work in. So with a small number of students, I started working on product development and applying my skills in um, the, the different problem settings. And this is um, also where I realized how important it was that there should be a very tight connection between a tech transfer office and a faculty of engineering. So uh, while we came up with a lot of solutions that other people introduced to the market many years later, um, we weren't the ones bringing these ideas to the market. There was just this disconnect. And I think it was because there was a lot of people working within that office that believed that if they didn't believe something was a real problem, it wasn't a problem that existed at all and that they didn't need to do anything with the idea. My favorite example of this being my first um, project, project student. His name is Neil Maria. And he is a young man who was passionate about coffee and coffee roasting. So that is him with his first um, prototype of a small batch coffee roaster that would be able to uh, roast three kilograms of coffee at a, at a time. Professor at that Kabe, time, the, Professor yes. Kabe, sorry, we, we're not seeing the slide that you're referencing. We have a lion on the, on the screen. <laughs> okay, I think I'm going to um, stop. <laughs> The slides are in, in, in any case just decorative, so I'll continue speaking and stop sharing the screen if that's okay with you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, let me just get... So, um, uh, I was at Neil Maria. So, while he had a really good idea and while he was very innovative for his time, this didn't agree that this was something that um, had potential. They didn't believe it was innovative and they don't believe, didn't believe that this would go anywhere. And now, and about, so they assigned the IP to him and about a year later, he found an investor that believed um, in him and shared his love for coffee. And now, 10 years later, he's exporting these coffee roasters throughout the world. And he's employing 15 people on a full-time basis, just building coffee roasters. And I think the breakthrough that he made gave me the most confidence to start thinking outside the box and not look, and not to be um, bound by, by the, um, my, my, my colleagues and their um, ideas of what was innovative and whatnot. And then in 2011, my life changed for the better, but tremendously because it's, that's the year I became a mother. I became a mother of three or one at that time and twins two years later. And my eldest had a lot of problems growing up. So I spent a lot of my time in therapy sessions and during clinic visits. And I started noticing the significant lack of allied health professionals in us in the country, and also the vast difference that the experience of that therapist made in the outcome of the therapy process. And I also learned that me living in Poch as a rural town, um, I was at a significant disadvantage in, uh, dis disadvantage um, when compared to. Um, something like Johannesburg or Pretoria. And I definitely can't say Poch is rural. So even more so if we look at um, kids growing up in townships um, or in rural villages and not getting access to the same experienced um, healthcare professionals that um, I had access to. Um, and since I had a background in telecommunications and this experience in product development, Coupled with my interest in the healthcare industry, I, st I thought that digital health was a natural fit for me. And um, the more I read, the more I realized how appropriate digital health technology would be and how big of a game changer it could be in South Africa. 
and Africa as a whole. And while people always think about the pinnacle of IoT technology, I think um, we have the potential to implement small but significant um, products that are easy to use and easy to understand and use that as an example of made, making a huge um, difference in the world. So um, by this, we can um, enable remote care, but also provide some decision support. And that is something I think in South Africa uh, is something that, that South Africa can benefit the most of, about um, or uh, because we will have access to data that will enable us to make those decisions. But then I also learned that um, while there are amazing technology being developed um, in the USA and the UK in, for allied healthcare professionals, um, I realized that the price, but then also the way in which it functioned or the language in which it was presented um, made it inaccessible to people in, in Africa, um, whether it be rural or urban. And I then started working on solutions by immersing myself within that environment be um, between these healthcare professionals for which the technology was intended. And by making them part of my innovative team, we started coming up with a number of very innovative products. And so the idea behind our MediHive Institute was born, a technology incubator which will um, in um, enables data-driven screening, diagnostics, rehabilitation, and therapy in a multidisciplinary fashion. Some of the products that we've worked on before COVID was, for instance, for the um, clinic setting where we can digitally measure a baby uh, in terms of head circumference, weight, and length, or mid-upper arm circumference for um, older children to be able to measure their growth. And since we have this data digitally, we can automatically alarm those people that need to do something about this. Um, it's quite alarming to know that um, there's dietitians working in clinics in South Africa that don't know that there's a baby in the same clinic that are uh, severely malnourished. And if they were only made aware, they could act before the baby was admitted to hospital. And that is the kind of things that we have started building about four years ago. Um, the same in a therapy set, uh, setting where we have people that have to travel vast um, distances to get access to a healthcare professional. Um, by implementing technology that can administrate that therapy process, but then also um, uh, to keep record of how often a patient does his exercises, whether he's doing it correctly and um, whether those exercises are working. Um, or not working as a result of him not doing it often enough or the exercises being um, unuseful. So it, it, it was incredible the lessons we started learning. And this was even before um, we realized how important data and, and um, information about the healthcare setting in Africa would be um, in a COVID-19 situation. So we identified some um, isolated nodes of excellence in South Africa. Um, there's incredible work done by um, the Central University of Technology, Prof. Inkthe yesterday. Um, they've been printing faces, um, improving the facial structure of people who suffered um, uh, injury to their faces by harnessing 3D printing technology. Working with um, Child Language Africa at UCT, I realized how much we could do in terms of child literacy um, when we started focusing on a therapy context where we could train um, parents to have meaningful interactions with their children. And with the Mets Medical School, for instance, we worked on this rehabilitation device. Um, so there are these isolated nodes of excellence within the country, but what was really frustrating in trying to get all of them to work together is that it was I, these isolated nodes of excellence had no incentive to work together or to um, learn from each other. So trying to get collaboration going wasn't an easy process. That was all until um, we had, were forced to innovate during a pandemic. And in 
During COVID-19, one major thing changed in at university level, at least in engineering faculties in South Africa, and that is that we had to change our attitudes and start working together instead of against each other and competing with, with each other. And that enabled a number of things. Um, so apart from working on some ventilator technology, um, with, for instance, part of a um, uh, team with the um, uh, working on a Mascheta project um, with UJ, CUT, VUT, and TUT on skills development in um, ventilator and other medical device uh, de technologies. And for that, we have developed a remote ventilator monitoring solution that in a, uses these IoT technologies to monitor what's going on with a diverse set of ventilators, being able to automatically identify what's going on and not having to change anything to the ventilator itself, but getting that data that we can use um, from it. Um, we've also developed our health screening app, Chop Chop, and that was maybe our biggest success story of um, the pandemic where we had a product, our first paying client 15 days after we had the idea of the screening application. Um, it's currently being used at 200 schools and a number of large corporate clients within South Africa. And um, it, started, uh, it started as just a solution for a single school. And now it's being spun out um, by the university as a, a fully fledged company. Um, but still, I think people still don't realize the value that we can get from the screening information that we're all having to give at all of these um, stores and restaurants where we're going. If we had all of that data digitally, we would have a much bigger, a better idea of what's going on um, within South Africa and how to react to a pandemic and how to act much faster. So Chop Chop is currently also being um, piloted um, at in Gauteng um, in the taxi industry, where we want to see whether we can enable commuters, um, the, the, the tracking and tracing of commuters in that way. The third COVID-19 solution that we worked on is a remote test data interpretation solution where we could use these PCR machines that are located throughout the country for TB testing to augment that since both in the ventilator case and the um, test uh, PCR testing facility case, you are constrained by train, uh, the number of trained um, healthcare professionals who can actually do something about um, a patient. So if we can enable them by applying the correct technology in the right place, it could make a significant difference in South Africa. So there were four good things that came out of COVID-19. Um, the fifth one would maybe be that I learned how much one could do if you pushed yourself. So that was a personal one. But as a country, I think we benefited in four ways from um, in terms of healthcare innovation and IoT applications from this pandemic. The first being the community spirit and the collaboration between universities within the country and, and also companies collaborating with the universities. Secondly, a focus on homegrown health solutions. I think all of us now realize how important it is that as a country should be able to um, react um, and take responsibility for their own technology and not always rely on other countries. Then we had a number of um, changes to our legislation that will enable um, remote health gifts. Uh, before COVID, we had a lot of restrictions in terms of remote healthcare that were now removed as a necessity. So this enables us to take these technologies that we have ready for the past four years, but didn't really have the right people on board to take it to market, now be able to do that. And then also the telecommunication companies had to work tirelessly throughout COVID to um, improve the network infrastructure, to be able to accompany people working from home and also homeschooling. And that now enables us to harness this technology for healthcare. So now, um, not really now post COVID, but 
looking forward post COVID, aware that are there are a number of um, universities like mine that have uh, community projects um, where they take um, um, innovators from um, the field with no in, um, affiliation with the university and help them develop their ideas and actually provide some seed funding for them in the process as well. So um, most universities are actually very um, willing to accommodate um, uh, community innovators. And I think it's something that should be harnessed more. So um, with that being, being said, my conclusion, concluding remark would be, if you have an idea and you think you are too small to make a difference or too insignificant, just remember your last encounter with a mosquito and trying to, to, to sleep while one of them are around. Thank you very much. Professor Krobler, thank you so much. And uh, regrettably, we don't have any time to to field any questions, but I think critically what you have mentioned is about the future of tech health and most importantly, the element of social solidarity and how we start this functioning of when we speak about that we are harnessing joint innovation, how do we really catalyze on those elements? Because for us to create an innovation hub across universities that really works to deal with bureaucracy and neutralizing that so that we can optimize medical technology. You know, for, for teachers and, and medical professionals and engineers that change our world on a daily basis, we can't, we can't have an environment that is so constrictive that it is detrimental to society at large. So I thank you for the work that you do. I wish you every success in, in all of your projects that you are busy with, and you are truly one of South Africa's great, great success stories. So thank you so much for, for sharing your time. And in concluding the session, I just want to, to thank all of our speakers that participated today, Mr. Rothman, Professor Chetty, uh, Professor Larson, Mr. Hill, very importantly, Dr. van der Vestes, and thank you for bringing it all together for us in that session. It's really regrettable that we didn't have more time and we, we could, it's, it's, it's a session that really warrants to be on its own. And then Professor Krobler, I just thanked you, but I'm thanking you again, because you, you are an inspiration to us and we are very grateful for the work that you're doing, not only for the sector, but for our society at large. Thank you colleagues. And we now draw the session to a conclusion. Goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mayer, for facilitating that um, awesome, session there uh, as you have uh, also appreciated the speakers as well um, it is good to see um, you know what is happening within the university space as well as how the universities are supporting some of the projects that are coming out of there um, it's been an interesting day so thank you very much to all those that are watching uh, on Hoover as well as on Facebook. Uh, thank you for staying tuned, uh, tuned in and you can still follow us uh, on EDHE Student Entrepreneurs. Use the hashtag EDHE Lochotla 2020 as well as the hashtag Afrotech. We have uploaded some videos uh, on Facebook as well as on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you missed the speech by uh, the keynote address by our minister yesterday, that is also available on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. So please do go there and read up on what was shared. Uh, we will take a break shortly uh, just to stretch our legs and uh, get a bit of water, get some lunch. It is lunchtime already. And we will be having our video again uh, from the UP Choir, Let the River Dry, composed by Carly Simmons and conducted by uh, Michael Barrett and Matt Wright as well. It's the Javits Arts Center video.
Jason, did you see professional background information? And say hi with a click or even start chatting through private in-app messages. And here, you can invite more people to join to the conversation. Just convert it to a private group chat. Okay. Here, what's this? Ah, that's the meeting schedule. You can use it to suggest a time and a place to meet someone. If your request is accepted, you'll see a notification, and it'll also show up in your agenda. Good thing. Now here's the community board. I love this for posting things like, hey, let's have a dinner together. Any good places to hang out? Or, I lost my wallet. Has anybody seen it? And post a job, too. Here, create any topics that you'd like to talk about with other attendees. It's a good place for networking, even before an event. Wow, that'll be useful. Of course, there are other cool features. Things like exhibitors, showing coupons and giveaways. Live polling, indoor maps, and surveys. Looks like I'm all set. Great, now enjoy the app. If you have any questions, here, contact Whova right through the app. We'll be back again tomorrow morning. Um, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow and for another incredible day of valuable insights that we're looking forward to sharing with you. Until then, I'm Ziggy Mkize. And I am Linda Sasa. And we'll and see you tomorrow. <laughs> Cheers. Good afternoon and welcome. We're still here at the EDHE Lohotla 2020. I'm exploring African entrepreneurship through technology. Um, during the break, you saw a video there of the UP Javid Center, which opened last year, September. Um, so if you are into art, if you are an artist and you'd like to be part of that space, then do go pay them a visit um, and see what they're up to over there. We also had our highlights video of all that happened yesterday. So if you want to see more of the happenings behind the scenes um, and just different things that happened in the program, please go to our Facebook page at EDHE Student Entrepreneurship um, and you'll be able to find some videos there as well. Um, on Hoover, there's lots of activity happening, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and I believe there's polls that people can engage in. What do we have up there at the moment? So the poll that we currently have there is can entrepreneurship be taught and how 
you should teach entrepreneurship. So I think people can just go there, submit uh, their responses, and join over 800 people today who have been engaging on Hoover. That's amazing. That's a lot of people That's engaging. That's a lot of people. I, my, one of my hopes is that I hope people have been in the sort of breakaway rooms, connecting with each yeah. other, sharing yeah. virtual business cards, so that communication mm -hmm. and engagement and collaboration can happen beyond this event. No, that's what we're really hoping for. That's the space that the Lakhotla provides. Uh, you know, unfortunately, when we have a physical uh, event, you, you see people spending time, even in evenings, uh, there's social events that happen. But uh, also, I guess it's a blessing that virtually we're able to do that throughout the day. Cool. So we are moving on to our third session for today, which is breaking new ground through entrepreneurship. And if you have comments for this section, um, or if you have any questions, please post those on the Q&A section in the Hoover app um, underneath this particular session. But also remember to engage us on social media, across all social media platforms. I mean, you can share your comments using the hashtag EDHE 2020 and hashtag Afrotech. I'm going to hand over to our session chair, Ms. Charlene Duncan, who is the director for the Center of entrepreneurship at the University of the Western Cape. Um, she also currently serves as the chairperson of the board of um, directors of Community Chess of the Western Cape. The CEI is active in developing short courses in entrepreneurship training at the University of the Western Cape, which has a footprint across all seven faculties, and that's absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. Um, its objective is addressing the student entrepreneurship agenda. Ms. Duncan has developed a global network for centers for entrepreneurship on the African continent um, in the USA as well as across Europe. She is the co-convener of the Community of Practice for the Entrepreneurial University for the mm -hmm. national platform representing all 26 South African African universities for entrepreneurial development in higher education reporting into University South Africa. Ms. Duncan also recently completed her master's degree and she graduated that with cum laude, so congratulations on that. And the focus for that was in development studies with a focus on the informal economy. So I'm sure mm -hmm. she has lots of insights to share as she facilitates this next session for us. Over to you, Ms. Duncan. I'll just ask that you unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. What an exciting journey this has been for the past three days. It's always the highlight for me um, when we are talking about entrepreneurship development in higher education. All right, sorry about the, that challenge. There was just a bit of a tech issue over there. We'll get Ms. Charlene back online. Um, she was going to introduce the plenary section that she is facilitating for us. And the first interview in that session um, is a pre-recorded interview. And the guest who's speaking there is somebody that I admire a lot, just looking at um, entrepreneurs within agriculture in particular, and young women especially going out there. Um, throughout this week, we've been talking a lot about people pivoting from being in the academic space or being in the professional space and starting their own businesses. And she's someone who's been able to do that particularly well. So we're going to hear from her first. This is Ms. Mbali Nwoko, who is the chief executive farmer and multiple award winner. She runs a company called um, Green, Green Tech, and she'll be speaking to us about smart farming, agri-tech, and entrepreneurship. So here's the playback for that. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Nora. My name is Mbali Nwoko, and I am a farmer. My business is called Green Terrace, and um, thank you for allowing me the pleasure to speak to you this um, just to give you a brief background of where Green Terrace started and how it started is that um, we were established in 2016 and started off producing vegetables, particularly Swiss chard, baby marrows, green beans, as well as peppers um, on a two hectare plot. And then we grew there to full um, producing on an eight hectare uh, 
farm. Um, the total um, size of the farm was 14 hectares, but in terms of arable land, we started at eight hectares. Um, so we grew to eight hectares, apologies. Most of our clients predominantly were in the, vet, uh, in the f uh, retail space, food processing companies who then processed for retailers, mining companies, catering hotel companies, as well as we would supply our produce through to the fresh produce markets um, now nationally and um, green terrace primary uh, production is that we are a primary producing agricultural business and so therefore we don't do any form of processing at this stage however this is the backdrop and background of green terrace and this is how we started when we um, first uh, produced our first crop back in 2016. So I am the sole owner of Green Terrace, just by the way. So I'm the farmer and um, have a full team of um, eight employees. And we would hire anything between 10 to 15 employees on, a, um, on peak harvesting seasons. And I can definitely say that being a first generation farmer without having any prior experience or background in farming, I definitely started farming going into the traditional farming methods, as much as we might have used irrigation system produced in tunnels, in shade nets and in open fields. Uh, our approach to the way we farmed was still very traditional. Um, and what I mean by that is general crop rotation. Um, we were focused really on scaling and all about volumes, simply because we wanted to get a good name out there, you know, um, and by getting a good name out there. We ha I had to break certain stereotypes um, as well as certain barriers. You know, uh, when you read about farming today, you'd hear about farmers struggling to supply through to the retail chains um, or getting markets, having access to market information, finance, etc. So I'm still a, um, a self-starter, uh, um, an entrepreneur in the agri-space. I'm still self-funded as well. So my primary objective back when I started in 2016 was really to get the name out there, ensure that we could produce good quality crop on a consistent basis so that the buyers and the off takers could really um, like us and want to procure, procure from us on an ongoing basis. So the, the strategy for Green Terrace, and I could say definitely for 2016, in 2017 was just really trying to produce make sure that we are at um, uh, at our clients premises in terms of our product and that we're just establishing a good name and brand for green terrace so there wasn't any um specific strategy um um yeah strategy yeah strategy to to be able to uh, gain a specific market share um but it was just mainly about getting the good crop um the clients approving our spec the quality and really trying to produce in volumes from there on. Today, Green Terrace is something completely different. As mentioned in the previous slide is that we produced um, from a mix, we, our production was encompassed a mixed farming production where we were producing in greenhouses, in shade net structures, as well as in open field. Um, right now, what I've done is, I think it's late, um, late 2019, I bought a new pre of property. Um, so the previous farm that we're farming on was on a 10 year fixed lease and it was on a rented property. And so what um, I then decided is that I wanted to procure my own, uh, buy my own farm so that I could establish, um, cert, uh, put in, 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 in certain infrastructure that would meet, meet to our needs because what I had done is that I started to look at the general trends back, back in 2016, 2017, everything that occurred on the farm, even in 2018, looking at the way we serviced our clients, um, we definitely had major challenges and setbacks in the old farm. And those, some of them were um, through, because of climate change. Um, in the later parts of our summer production, we had excessive rain, excessive hailstorms, which then also destroyed our crops. So at a time I'd find myself um, completely in debt within 24 hours because we would have planted one day and then the next day the hail would have completely wiped out our crops, especially in the open field production. And what, that, that, what then that did to the business was um, halt certain supply which then affected our, affected our ability um, to 
ensure ca cash flow and li the liquidity of the business. And it was really quite straining having to speak to the clients and say, today we can't bring our produce on your floor or on the market or on the shelves simply because um, we've been destroyed by hell and therefore we have to resuscitate our plants and then start again. So the strategy was to develop my own farm where we could have full on uh, um, infrastructure that will prevent us from stop to stopping to pro, uh, stopping our produce um, season after season through because of things like hailstorms etc so uh, right now how green terrace looks like today is that we are uh, one hectare full-on production niche hydroponic farm and the word niche specifically comes from the types of crops that we will be producing on the farm which is sweet peppers we will be farming red green and yellow sweet peppers simply because those are high value crops looking at the previous date and the past historical records from a sales perspective um, green beans and the peppers were the crops that stood out but um, from a location point of view i then the strategy was to definitely start producing sweet peppers simply because we're not too far from major um, processing facilities as well as we're very close from the to the airport and the strategy for green terrace within the next three to five years is to start exporting. And so the sweet peppers and focusing on a niche crop is a way that we could diversify ourselves and being able to position ourselves in the market from a competitive perspective. And then um, I think today, even farmers are put under immense pressure to be able to still produce, but still maintaining the um, looking after the environment and our surroundings and also preserving our natural resources. So this farm is definitely going to be a hydroponic farm and this is what we're building now. Um, not growing directly in soil, but using a, a growing method called growing medium using cocoa peat. So it is an intensive production. Our summer season is going to start in September, end in May. And the intention is there from there on is to start um, producing throughout winter as well, so that we can ensure that to our clients, we have consistent uh, produce or peppers being supplied to them. We are definitely using the principles of smart farming and what we're going to be doing is that farming um, through our irrigation and how we fertilize all that inf infrastructure and systems is going to be automated. So I'm leveraging off the use of technology through farming apps. So previously on the old farm, we would have to um, directly measure how much um, fertilizers or insecticides we were putting onto the ground. However, with this new farm, the systems that are put in place will automatically read that for us. And I would get that through, I would get that information through my phone and it will determine what the pH level of our water, um, the EC, the humidity, the environment, ensuring that our crop throughout the growing season is definitely a healthy crop to, to be able to produce the amount of tons that we project for that specific season. And Looking at farming today, as opposed to when I started, I think there's a great opportunity for farmers to leverage off technology. Yes, when you put certain infrastructure systems or software in your production methods, it may come at a cost, which you need to budget accordingly for that. However, what we're doing at Green Terrace is also leveraging off the free technology apps that are, that are available. And... Um, um, with that, we're able to record certain data, our planting and our harvesting cycles, the tonnage as well that we've recorded on the farm, any pests and diseases that we've also um, been able to see on the farm and be able to correct that. Uh, and also share that information with our agronomists, um, which are certain exp experts that we um, liaise from a consulting basis on a monthly basis as well, um, to be able to um, ensure that we have a good season and we achieve our required tonnage from a harvesting perspective. So the applications is one way um, as, that we as Green Terrace are leveraging off to ensure that we can make good strategic decisions in the next and forecast for the following seasons on um, how we're going to farm, how we can improve, how we can better ourselves and um, and also take out any um, production methods that really don't contribute towards the success of the business. So um, 
I think the opportunity for farmers today is definitely leverage also a lot of technology and make use of free farming apps. The opportunity in, Af in South Africa and in Africa predominantly is that we still um, a continent that is rich with untapped land. Um, so there's a lot of land that is yet to be cultivated. Uh, and this is regardless of any land or policies um, specific to um, how land is used and distributed in, in South Africa particularly as well. But the opportunity still exists for new farmers and new entrants wanting to cultivate the lands, whether they focus on crop production, um, field crops or um, livestock. And the opportunity as well for young individuals like myself being a first generation farmer is that we can now take control of all these opportunities and um, new innovative things that are coming into the agricultural sector and make sure that our farming enterprises succeed. Um, and I think with a high unemployment rate now in South Africa, almost reaching 50%, and with the demographics being mostly youth, I think there's a great um, opportunity that lies with the agricultural sector because it is one sector that is not, not only serves as a backdrop of other sectors. However, I think agriculture is an industry or a sector that can absorb a lot, a lot of professions. Today, um, there are many farmers who are experiencing challenges like access to market, information, inputs, finance. And in those problems, an opportunity lies for people in finance, for example, coming up with different um, funding models or mechanisms as opposed to the traditional um, funding uh, mechanisms to come up with innovative lending solutions that could be attractive to farmers. Today, um, farmers that are struggling in, in, in the ability to access certain markets is because some of them um, don't, do not have the selling abilities. So you find that they are fantastic farmers on the field, but when it has to come to skills, sales, marketing and negotiations, they don't um, score highly on those points. So there's an opportunity as well for marketers to enter into the space to be able to market uh, the fresh produce on behalf of farmers to external clients. Um, the opportunity also lies within um, those that are passionate with law. There's many um, contracts agreements that uh, come into play from a farmer to an off taker. And there's so many, uh, um, uh, I suppose, fine lines and specific writings that also complicate the process from there on. Furthermore, from um, a research perspective, season after season, farmers also find challenges in being able to um, grow their enterprises because of um, the setbacks that they receive from a pest and disease perspective. And so um, there's a number of institutions that are there to help um, provide and give, um, uh, I suppose, support um, to farmers where research and development is concerned. And so there's an opportunity as well for people who are studying, um, uh, who want to become researchers or scientists to add value into the agricultural chain. And most importantly, leveraging of technology. Technology, I think, could, could be the central point in combining all these professions, these skills, these expertise, um, and being able to bring uh, a certain um, level of service to the farmers in which they can then position themselves and grow their businesses from there on. Um, and then furthermore, I, I definitely put the last point there as it's an opportunity to make money and in addition to making money, make an impact. An impact not only from the farmers but to their neighboring communities and to the agricultural sector and its value chain as a whole because the global food demand is rising and it's it's quite sad to also know that as much as there's a lot of food wastage and food being grown um, there are a number a lot of farmers exiting the the, the sector um, because of an array of reasons but most importantly a lot of households especially in South Africa still do not have access to particular food items so I think the sector is one that is diverse, that has a myriad of, of challenges. But within those challenges, I think that we could definitely take, um, take note of those challenges and turn them into something positive and um, come up with different solutions as well to grow the sector and the industry at large. Part of my social responsibility as a farmer, especially a new generation farmer, is to ensure that I share my experiences and learnings. So I am a columnist for Farmers Weekly and all those articles predominantly relate to um, business articles, business 
articles related to farming, how farmers can leverage off their resources, how they can grow their businesses, but most importantly, serve as a reference point for new entrants coming into the industry. My YouTube videos as well, where I answer frequently asked questions on how to access markets, land, um, what to do with water, how to farm without soil, etc. And I've just recently announced um, my podcast, which is where I'll be having uh, meaningful conversations with industry experts in agriculture and across its value chain. And all these serve as a platform to give back to the agricultural community because when I started, it was very difficult to get certain information around farming and um, agriculture in South Africa over and above the already um, uh, art written articles. But I found that there was a lack in the industry where farmers didn't talk about their experiences, didn't share about their experiences for new entrants like myself to then read up and and learn to say, okay, um, this is how I can uh, position myself in the market, or these are the challenges that most farmers face. Therefore, if I wanted to become a new farmer, these are the things that I'll be experiencing in the industry. So this is part of my social responsibility, giving back through my farmers, my articles on Farmers Weekly, my blogs on a personal page, the podcasts and the YouTube videos. And it's just about educating and inspiring and giving information out to people who want to start farming um, or grow their farms in in, in essence and so I really hope you found value in today's talk in my keynote and I'm happy to um, respond to any questions. Thank you so much for your time and for your participation and I'm available to take any questions. That was award-winning win Chief Executive Farmer Mbali Nwoko, who is the CEO of Green Terrace. Now, colleagues, I do apologize for that technical glitch that we had earlier on just before Mbali's session. Um, I had introduced our session convener, but I would like to uh, briefly introduce her again before I hand back to uh, Ms. Charlene Duncan, who is the co-convener of the EDHE Community of Practice at, of Entrepreneurial Universities and the director um, at the University of the Western Cape Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, back to you, Ms. Duncan. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm not going to take too much time contextualizing the session, but I just want to say that um, the session is about breaking new ground through entrepreneurship. Uh, earlier on in session two, we heard Professor Larson speak about the importance of what it means to develop through entrepreneurship. And um, through entrepreneurship for me is about active entrepreneurship and it's about creating new opportunities in relation to your own identity. And today we have four very dynamic speakers um, who are looking at four areas. We've just listened to Mbali talk about agri-tech. Um, Ellen will be speaking about market opportunities. Alana Hopkinson will be speaking about human capital and Professor Mikey Yankees will be speaking about digital inclusion. I think it's an exciting session and I'm very excited to be chairing the session because we're talking to some change makers and some game changers. And I always think that as student premiers in particular, when we're exposed to people who are active in the space, we're exposed to excellent role models, people who are passionate and driven about what they do, it really makes a difference to how we approach our own entrepreneurial journeys. I um, uh, we've listened to the pre-recording of Mbali and, and I don't see any questions um, in the, on the app, but I'd like to just say that I think there were some really good lessons that came out of um, her presentation. We, we listened to her speak about resilience, we listened to her speak about um, risk management. I think yesterday we heard Professor Mike Morris speak about that as a country, we are naturally um, used to being resilient as a nation and how we can use this resilience to develop an entrepreneurial mindset and to develop entrepreneurship is becoming quite an important message, I think, that we can give to studentpreneurs. I think another important message that Mbali shared with us was about, about ensuring that our products and our offerings are niche and about finding those niche offerings and those new products that we can take to market. Um, there was a lot of talk about smart farming and technology, and more recently we started using the word techpreneur or technopreneur, and that is just simply how do we use technology more smartly to develop our, our businesses. I think the, the other thing that struck me about what she spoke about was about opportunity, and I think the two very big important messages that have come through, and particularly now having been exposed to COVID, 
and the one is around um, the global food challenge that we have and how we need to be active citizens in terms of addressing the global food challenge. I think the second thing, and I think we can all talk about this at length, so I'm just going to highlight it and mention it, is the high unemployment rate. And that when we get involved in active entrepreneurship, that job creation and particularly job creation for youth is an important part of the conversation. We've been very privileged to have very important voices um, from all 26 universities, both students and academics, both from the African continent and globally. Yusuf, um, Eddie, um, the Department of Higher Education and Training. And I'd like to encourage everybody as we think through and think through our questions that we want to pose to our panelists, um, to our presenters today, that we really bear in mind that we're always looking for opportunity to create job creation and to solve some of the global challenges that we are faced as a South African community. I'm now going to introduce um, Ellen, who is also somebody that I'm very well acquainted with, and I'm extremely excited to listen to your presentation, Ellen. Welcome to, um, to Eddie and welcome um, to, to, to participate in this event. If I may just take two minutes to introduce you, I'm just going to pick up on some of the things that I always find quite passionate and exciting when I listen to you and when I explore the ventures alongside of you. Ellen, you are an extremely self-motivated and driven person. And I know, because I've experienced this, that you're extremely um, passionate about people, development, transformation, and economic development. Over the past 20 years, she's been working with people both a social, from a socioeconomic development perspective and a digital transformation perspective. Her focus is always on identifying, developing potential and skills for either her clients and her colleagues. She's passionate about any project that she undertakes on a personal or professional level and thrives on problem solving and finding mutual beneficial solutions. Welcome, and I know that you're a change maker and that we're going to be um, entertained and, and enlightened um, by the message that you're going to be sharing with us. Thank you. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Aline. I really appreciate that. Um, my screen is just loading. Just give me a second. It's very nice to see some familiar faces. Excuse me. To see some familiar faces and some names. I see that my old university, uh, the Nelson Mandela University, is on board as well. Can you see my screen? Charlene, can you see my screen? I can, yes. Uh, the full screen? Yes, Ellen, you can go ahead. Okay. So thank you once again for um, the introduction, um, Charlene. It's really, it's really it been critical in my journey to uh, be part of this network um, from, on the one hand, I wouldn't say academic uh, perspective, but I have studied and I worked very closely with the Nelson Mandela University. And throughout um, the last couple of years that I've been living in Cape Town, I've been doing a lot of work um, with the University of Western Cape as well. So it's good to be on board. I've just set a timer because if you don't stop me, I will continue speaking. So thank you once again. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak among such amazing um, minds, I have to say. I've been following the program and looking at all the topics. And I would, um, this, what I'm presenting to you is really very much uh, about the practical opportunities that there are for, for Africans and that, that there are, I think also then within the global community. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ellen Fishett and I'm the founder of Story Room, which is, um, a business that I own, a consulting agency. We are three years old now, but I also wear very many different hats and, and I'm involved in very many different projects. So for those of you who don't know me, and I would say that's the majority of people sitting in, you are probably wondering why did they ask this woman? And um, I'm very honored that I've been questioned. And I, I think it could potentially be because of um, this very unusual journey that I've been on. Um, Charlene said, you know, I come from a I'm very much focused on personal development and, and social development. The truth is, is that um, I'm a trained social worker. 
and uh, I got my degree. I studied in the Netherlands. I got my degree in 1999, many years ago, and uh, I started working as a social worker. So the first 10 years of my career were very much focused on how do you help families, um, how do you run charities, how do you empower people, but very much from a giving perspective. And this was in, in Amsterdam. In 2006, I returned back to South Africa and um, I set up my home here and I started working in the township. And the pictures that I show you, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen are really Ellen in her role working in the township. I come from a, a colored area in, in uh, Port Elizabeth called Corston. Um, not the greatest of areas, not a very wealthy area. Um, and, and, and that's where I was born and I spent the first seven years of my life and then the reason I suppose why I'm standing here today is that I've managed to make some shift. And in making that shift, um, I've not only created all sorts of opportunity for myself, um, I've also created a business and, uh, you know, I'm self-employed. So if you go to the right hand side, and I always share this slide because I think it's important that people know where it is that we come from. No one just wakes up and is successful, you know, unless maybe your Beyonce and Jay-Z's child, or you know, you were born into the right family. But most of us uh, that are speaking and that have the opportunity to share our journey with you today have really gone through a process um, that looks beautiful on the outside now, but we've gone through a lot of work. And I think just what I want to share with people today is that as a social worker who no one ever would have thought would be in business and, and, and traveling the world, I've come from very humble beginnings uh, I still am in humble beginnings, but so quite often I get to spend a lot of time, uh, not anymore with COVID, so the past uh, six months I've been at home, but otherwise uh, I'd like to show you that, for example, if you look at the bottom right hand picture, something I'm very proud of is um, that was Le Bourget last year, which is the Paris Air Show, and uh, I am one of the two women that designed the, that designed the Africa for Future program, which is an aerospace accelerator program. So I just want you to keep this in mind. Social work, aerospace accelerator program. And it's taken me uh, what I currently do, and that is uh, by really actively pursuing opportunities that there are in the markets for us as Africans has taken me to many places, um, dinners, uh, five-star dinners, Michelin-star dinners in Paris with, uh, with, with ministers, uh, with, with ambassadors, really to the most insane places that I never could have dreamt about. But it's not only me, um, there are many South Africans. And something that I noticed is that in general, as South Africans, we tend to look outside of ourselves. So we tend to look at what do we see in Europe or what do we see in America? Um, we're not often focused on, on, on the abundance of resource and uh, that we have in South Africa. So for example, I'd like you to meet um, Lelemba Piri. She's the first lady with the yellow jacket on, on the left-hand side uh, top screen of, of my screen. Uh, she uh, runs an, an, an a, a VC firm, Enigma Ventures. So that's about a hundred uh, million US dollars. And, uh, you know, she's from Zambia, lives in South Africa, uh, has always been into impact in um, impact work and used to work for quite a well-known startup. And now has, you know, with a few other groups, runs a, a venture capital firm. Another personal favorite of mine is Dr. Adriana Marie. Um, you may know her as the lady that's going to Mars. Um, well, one of the, the hundred people that have been selected to go on the first journey to Mars, and she's a quantum physicist, she travels the world, she speaks at all sorts of platforms, gets paid a lot of money uh, to be talking about her journey, and she's South African. Then I believe, uh, I didn't hear her speak, but I saw early on the program that we also had um, Nelly Mokilize, she's IMED, uh, the founder of IMED Technologies, um, South African. Uh, travels the world is known is 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 world renowned for what she does and and the impact that she's had in in healthcare, um, but we don't see posters of her uh, all over the place. Um, then Marlon Parker uh, at the bottom, he hails from uh, the Cape Flatty in Cape Town, runs a social enterprise uh, and a for-profit business. Uh, he has literally traveled all over the world. He's kind of a bit of a, a, a superhero and. Um, you know, his business, he still operates from, um, from the Cape Flats. 
Um, I'm very proud also to have worked with Sia Kuza. He is from the Eastern Cape and he's an, he's an African rocket scientist. And last but not least, another uh, example that I'd like to give you is Vinnie Lingham uh, from Durban, South Africa. He was the founder of the Silicon Cape Initiative. Um, but prior to all of that, he, he made his money inside and then outside of South Africa um, in 2014, exiting, as they call it. So he sold his business gift, which was a, a platform of uh, ensuring that, you know, you could send a gift to someone and, and using technology to, to accelerate that growth and, and to give it scale. People always talk about scale in technology. And what that basically means is the more people you can reach, um, the more business you're going to do, the more, the more money you're going to make. And um, yeah, he actually comes from East London as well, uh, lived there before he moved to San Francisco to make his money. And the reason why I say that you need to know their names is because I think it's important that um, as aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe your studentpreneurs have got some side hustles on the side, you need to know that if you look around you, there is greatness. You, you don't have to wait until you, you reach somewhere someday. And, and a lot of the topics uh, that were discussed today, uh, besides entrepreneurship, are really all about innovation. And those of you that are privileged enough to be studying at these universities, uh, this is a word you hear all the time, innovation. Uh, it used to be something for scientists, but now, you know, everyone uh, from uh, in community initi initiatives, they talk about innovation. And, and there's something I'd like to demystify about that, because making the transition from a social worker to a social entrepreneur, to uh, an impact entrepreneur, to a businesswoman, to working in technology, um, I made all sorts of um, iterations. I, I evolved, I changed as the market, as, 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 as time changed, I also changed. And I used to think that innovation was not for me. So I'll never forget my first session that I attended at the Nelson Mandela University, which was then NMMU. And it was a lecture on um, IP, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was intellectual properties. I don't know if it was, there was a workshop and I'm not quite sure if it was the legal side of the workshop, I don't remember, but I remember everyone speaking a language I did not understand. And I didn't know anyone there and I just, you know, I just wondered how am I ever going to figure this out? And, and these people have studied for years. Innovation in my mind, and especially when we're talking about entrepreneurship, is really about um, the ability to adapt and the ability to use that adaptation to your benefit and the benefit of other people, so opportunity. So it is nothing that you strategize. You may have a five-year strategy. We may as a country think like in 10 years time, this is where we see South Africa um, on in the map in terms of tech development, but it's really about the doing because it's in doing um, that we fail and that we learn. And, and the only reason, the only way that you're actually going to test any of these assumptions that you make or any of these clever strategies that you have is actually by implementing and executing them. So um, bearing time in mind, going to uh, the problem. So one thing we don't lack in South Africa, we don't lack in Africa at all, is uh, just the enormous amount of problems that we have. And if I was to speak uh, specifically about South Africa, but I think it's no different in, in, in the other countries in Africa that I've traveled and worked in, is the first, uh, one of the huge problems that we have is around, uh, is around uh, literacy. And that could be um, just the ability to read. So just normal literacy. Uh, we have a huge problem with math uh, literacy uh, in this country. And then on top of that, we have digital literacy. And, um, that poses even a greater problem because if you're not part of the digital economy, you know, what economy are you part of? So literacy is a huge problem that we have in our country. The next is unemployment. Um, uh, Dr. Charlene Duncan also spoke about that when she introduced me and, and you know, if, if people can come up with solutions that will address issues such as unemployment, and we're all familiar with the you know, with the scenes on the road, these people, uh, these gentlemen still have, have signs, but sometimes there's just someone just standing there. And I always wonder, like, what are you hoping? Who are you hoping is going to stop and, and, and who stops it? I, I'm always intrigued by this phenomena. Uh, we have no shortage of, of, of food security in this country. So the top uh, right-hand picture is um, 
you know, uh, food being delivered because supply chains broke down, especially during COVID. But if it wasn't for COVID, you'll see that in a lot of areas, um, rural South Africa and the rest of Africa, that there's a lot of problems around um, logistics and, and supply chain. Um, I like to use the image of um, the lady who's actually literally with a bucky, uh, you know, feeding, not feeding, but watering her plants. So uh, agriculture, uh, we have enough land, uh, we have uh, people, uh, foreigners buy land, and I'm not talking about African foreigners, but the entire world buys land and, and that they develop in Africa. And yet we have these tiny little bits of land that we are not thoroughly um, leveraging. We have problems with healthcare in the country and transport. I mean, the pictures you see are a daily sight. They, they're unfortunately uh, not a problem for just a few people. And um, the good news is because this could make one very depressed and and I have this conversation all the time because and especially now you know with the economic state that we're in but not only that the reality that that COVID has highlighted and the fact that we have so many unemployed people and there are more to come because you know there are no jobs being created at the moment I think opportunity for um, yourselves as students but uh, you know even in the lecturers the, the colleagues that are on this is is to how do you turn these problems into opportunities and basically that's what I spend my days doing so I uh, was once as I mentioned a uh, a problem solver a fixer you know I went into communities I handed out bread I spoke to people about not abusing alcohol drugs uh, their children their spouses all of these things getting people to go to school and um, it was a very difficult job to do uh, now, uh, the opportunity, because we have so many illiterate people, is uh, to focus on education. And I use technology because that places me in a niche market. There are many women in technology, but they're not at the forefront, they're not visible, and they're definitely not, um, we just don't see them being part of a business community. So one of the um, opportunities that there is, is definitely in, in education, ed tech, and specifically if you're looking at vernacular languages. So where there is, because we have such a huge problem with digital literacy or, or literacy in general, there's opportunity for you um, today as your side hustle, if you're good at editing, if you're good in your own home language, and you'll see if you go onto the app store or to any website actually, how many, um, educational sites are there in our own uh, mother tongues. Uh, something we don't lack in Africa is waste as well. If it's not the foreign world that's coming to dump it here, then it's ourselves that is dumping it or there are no systems. And uh, actually uh, legislation, so those of you that are thinking ahead of time, legislation is going to determine, well, it's already happening, uh, what is going to happen with waste. So first of all, uh, climate change, uh, we, we can't afford to continue, we can't afford to uh, fill our oceans with plastic. Um, so what do you see in your environment as an opportunity? And it would really do you a great service to, for example, if you go into the city of Cape Town, but actually any municipality uh, website in the country, look at local economic development, look at public works infrastructure and look at what strategies they have in place, for example, waste. And, and it's up to you to see where the opportunity is. Healthcare, I don't need to repeat that. Um, that we, have, uh, we don't have a shortage of sick people. We don't have a shortage of unhealthy people. What we do have a shortage is offering people um, local. That's my family. What we do have a problem is, sorry, is offering people Sorry, I'm getting distracted by this. Um, so what we do have a problem is offering affordable health care. And I'm always interested, I do some work with, uh, with Merck, which is a, a German um, pharmaceutical company. And I'm their specialist. I speak to them about like, what does health care in a community look like? And how do they access that? So it makes me wonder why we, as Africans who live in these communities, are actually not telling these these international and these multi-corporates, uh, what kind of healthcare we need and how it should be delivered. And for one person that's through an app, but for someone else it could be setting up a, a system in, in a healthcare clinic, a public clinic, healthcare clinic, so that we don't have to wait for so long. Logistics and supply chain, huge opportunity. Current project that I'm working on is looking at how do we use remote sensing in infrastructure and then specifically within logistics because with borders shutting down 
and they're being more focused on, on local uh, economic development, local opportunity. How do we still get our goods to the people? So if you understand your area very well, you would also know what the challenges are and therefore also the opportunities. Um, I was very pleased to hear that Mbalo had spoken before me, Agritech. So the one project that I'm doing is uh, remote sensing and AI, tech, artificial intelli intelligence technologies. And the other one I'm working on is looking at how drone technologies um, and remote sensing technologies uh, assist us, inform us, inform us about the weather. Um, Charlene mentioned earlier about, you know, smart, smart agriculture. Um, they are very low cost solutions and that require very low cost infrastructure. And I mean, you know, I'm a school social worker and I'm now talking to you about remote sensing uh, uh, technologies and the opportunities that they are because, you know, the outside world wants to come to Africa and it's not because Africa is, you know, only wonderful and beautiful seas. There's a lot of problems and people know where there's problems, there's opportunities. A FinTech is a huge opportunity as well. And again, I'd like to say, you don't need to be a computer scientist to work in FinTech. You don't need to be uh, a chartered accountant to work in FinTech, but you do need to have those skills and make sure that you surround yourself with people that understand it. Um, the other picture I'd like to point out to you is fashion. Most of us are, are, are very, you know, we're, we're tech savvy, we are online. You would be amazed at how many people want to buy our designs, want to buy our beautiful materials. And um, there's nothing stopping you actually from selling that online and actually creating e-commerce opportunities. And then housing is another uh, issue where we have more than enough people. We don't have enough shelter for them and also um, supply of energy. So what sort of solutions do you see with a very simple infrastructure around uh, offering energy solutions in local communities? Um, last but not least, something I'd like to share with you because uh, people you know, think I woke up like this, but I didn't. <laughs> so the secrets that have taken me from social worker, um, not earning a lot of money, but at, having working very hard and having a very uh, fulfilling life, which I still have, but with uh, less hard work, I would say, less trauma from the communities is that I've always been willing to work very hard and I've always been willing um, to do what no one else is willing to do. So that means put myself out there, be the one who asks the stupid question and to question those that uh, seem to know everything because uh, what I've learned now about uh, the clever people or technology and innovation, the big bosses, the CEOs, is that uh, we assume that they know everything, uh, but they don't. So asking questions and being curious will definitely get you noticed. And again, what you don't know, partner with people. Find, get, get a financial account and find your cousin who's uh, maybe a uh, you know, tech nerd. Um, understand the rules of the game that you're playing. So make sure that you do your research, you speak to companies, you pick up the phone and you, you, you dare to be uh, rejected because that also happens. It's important that you grow wealth, not only in your bank account, but in your heart. I think if you can solve real human problems and you're really truly passionate about changing the world, that there is market opportunity and therefore financial opportunity in that as well. Um, something that we're not raised with in, in, in South Africa or in Africa is failing. You know, we're always being taught you've got you've to be the best. And I think we are our best selves and that's all we can do. But you only really learn by moving out of your comfort zone and, and making mistakes and being the only one in the room that has no idea what anyone's talking about. But, you know, that's why we have Google, because you make your notes and you go and Google it afterwards. And um, the last lesson that I'd like to share, and it's something that the world has always needed and that we have an abundance in, but that we seem to think is very uh, difficult is to always be kind. Um, it's an infant resource. It's not gonna cost you anything. And you'll be amazed at what tables this will take you to in the world and, and how successful you can be. And um, that was it for me, Charlene. Did you see opportunity? Thank you very much for, for that, Ellen. I think you shared a great source of knowledge. I mean, before you got to your last slide, Secrets of Success, I had made a note to, to say, um, you know, the question I wanted to ask you, but you've already answered it. I think you did a great, um, you, you gave a great example of how our studentpreneurs or entrepreneurs in general can, be, can develop an opportunity-driven mindset. 
-hmm. I think that there are many opportunities, but it's that mindset that we need to develop. And, um, you know, two powerful things I think that you shared around that is um, that came through was your passion, your confidence. I think that's also part of developing that set of competencies that we talk about, um, as well as the fear of failure. Um, uh, I think that's a, a topic on its own, but I'd like to encourage the audience to engage with you on the Hoover app. I think that you can you can share a lot of wisdom. I like the story, um, you know, that you've told um, from a social worker to working in the kind of techno spaces that you're working in. I think that's powerful. It's breaking down the silos. It's breaking down the stereotypes. And that's exactly what we're wanting to do in, in, in this mm -hmm. space. So I want to encourage you to continue um, sharing your story and to empower. I know that you do this already, but to empower the women that you encounter and the students that you encounter um, to, to develop this opportunity-driven mindset. Thank you very much, Ellen. And like Thank I said you. to the audience, please go ahead and engage with Ellen via the Hoover app. Thank I'm you, not going to into it's an absolute pleasure. I'm now going to introduce um, our next speaker to you, Ms. Lana Hopkinson. Um, Lana Hopkinson is an international economic development practitioner with over 30 years of experience in the private sector development, competitiveness and innovation cluster, and value chain development, as well as education and training. She's currently working as the SMME policy component leader of ecosystem development for small enterprise, that's EDSE, budget support program funded by the EU, and it is a fourth project in South Africa since 2005, sorry, 2004. Over the past 25 years, Lana has worked on SME development and innovation projects in the UK, Ireland, Ukraine, China, Russia, Turkey, um, and the list goes on and on. And um, Lana, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you, to share with us here today. It's always great to have different voices um, from across the globe sharing your wisdom. Um, and I'm very excited about the, the value that you will bring in terms of the human component to this conversation. So welcome, Lana. Um, please feel free to share and I'll communicate with you in the chat box with regards to your time. Thanks very much, Lana. Thank you very much, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to have an opportunity to participate in this exciting event today. Not sure about my wisdom, but uh, I certainly am learning a lot. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, the organizers, and uh, particularly Nora, uh, for inviting me. Uh, the theme of human capital and digital economy is a very broad topic, and 20 minutes uh, can only allow me to scratch the surface. Uh, discover a few key points. The agenda already shows a lot of uh, different uh, approaches to human capital and great stories, very inspirational stories. Um, I would like to focus not so much on skills and technical capabilities as addressed by many other presentations. I'd like to look at this through the lens of culture and mindsets and institutions and discuss the implications for the development of human capital for the digital economy. And with my multicultural background, um, I'm British, but I was born in Russia, and I'm married to an American, and I've worked in a lot of countries. Uh, cross-cultural differences, cross-cultural management, and um, institutions and culture are a great uh, topic that I think uh, people are underestimating and undervaluing in understanding how entrepreneurship and innovation works. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, thank you. We can see your screen, Lana. You may go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to talk about uh, human capital. Um, I'll try uh, to focus on just key issues. Uh, I will skip a few slides because I have a lot of them once I start making presentations. Uh, I want to share a lot more than uh, the time can afford us. Um, so the role of the university, uh, it's a good reminder that uh, Bologna Charter uh, specifically says that universities play a vast and a very important role in culture development. It produces culture and it hands it down from generation to generation. So uh, 
let's not forget that culture is really pivotal to a lot of things. Very quickly, just to agree on the terms, because sometimes culture is understood narrowly. Um, by culture in institutional economics, uh, we understand uh, the set of norms, behaviors, beliefs, and customs that exist within a population of a nation. So it's really uh, the uh, beliefs and behaviors which can be shaped by technology, but also can shape the technology adoption. Uh, and institution is a broader definition of, uh, as a rule, the rules of the game. And the rules of the game can be formal uh, in, the, in the shape of rules, laws, and constitutions that are written down, but also informal. And culture is an informal institution. It's a uh, set of constraints that are uh, uh, imposed in terms of behavior, conventions, or self-imposed codes of conduct. Uh, also, institutions imply characteristics and mechanisms of enforcement of these formal and informal constraints. Um, we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, according to the World Economic Forum. But I like uh, Carlotta Perez's uh, definition of technological revolution. And what she's saying is that we're in the middle of the fifth technological in, uh, revolution after uh, the Industrial Revolution, Age of Steam and Railways, Age of Steel, Electricity and Heavy Engineering, uh, Age of Oil, uh, Mass Production of Automobiles, uh, and now is the Age of Information and Telecommunications, and we're kind of in the middle with the potential of this turning point providing golden opportunities for the humanity if we uh, play our cards right. And the next uh, technological revolution is uh, around the corner. It could be bio, nano technologies, but it's too early to predict what it's going to be. Um, first of all, in terms of technologies, very, uh, very often you can hear that digital economy is all about new technologies and digital technologies. But technologies have existed for long, a lot longer than revolutions have been happening. Um, we are talking about three centuries before uh, our era and uh, Archimedes and Thucydides and Heron of Alexandria have come up with a lot of different inventions, including steam power and uh, including uh, pneumatic applications. Uh, Heron of Alexandria, an amazing uh, inventor, developed uh, the first vending machine in the first century BC. It was dispensing holy water. So a lot, a lot of uh, inventions have already existed. But why a revolution didn't follow? Um, even though th these were really widely spread and uh, Alexandria had about 400,000 people and Heron displayed his machines in the middle of the uh, square. But the revolution didn't happen. So why is that? So the scholars have looked at this from different angles. And uh, basically, there are a few conditions that are necessary for technology to take off. Uh, so to create significant economic effects, uh, first of all, the cultural barrier needs to be overcome. Uh, and digital economy, it's not just about uh, new technologies. The cultural aspect is very important. Uh, and uh, what is happening is when there is broad cultural acceptance of technology, the cultural shift can really lead to technological transformation. <clears throat> For example, uh, in Heron's time, a free person who is not a slave uh, was normally engaged in uh, wars, arts, sports, philosophy, and it was unbecoming for a, an aristocrat or a free man at that time to uh, be concerned about economy and labor and how it's going to increase productivity. That wasn't on the agenda. It's only in those times when uh, the elites and the aristocracy and a broader uh, population uh, started taking uh, interest, cultural interest in technology, that shifts could happen. You can see on the right, uh, a, a picture of Queen Elizabeth, who during the Second World War was actually a car mechanic. Uh, so it was absolutely uh, appropriate uh, and culturally acceptable. The good news about uh, digital economy is that in terms of technology, it has already overcome the cultural barrier. And it was overcome uh, in, in the case of digital, uh, digital economy, with the emergence of the generation, which is called Generation Z. 
Uh, it was born around 1995, 2012, and followed the millennials. <clears throat> These people grow up in a very sophisticated media environment and uh, very internet savvy. Uh, we can say that they're born with a mobile phone in their hands, so they're very comfortable with technology and uh, any, anything digital. And even the older generation uh, is completely infected with this new technological culture. And the COVID has helped us all to uh, smoothly transition into the digital world. So uh, we feel uncomfortable when we leave our gadgets somewhere else and um, we're not connected. Um, I will come back to the Generation Z briefly uh, uh, in a few minutes, but basically this is a very important shift and on the right you can see the graph where which shows that the difference between acceptance of cultural acceptance of technology uh, between general population and technological executives is not that large. General population is catching up with technologies and accepting them. Uh, institutions generally matter, not just the cultural barrier, which is informal institutions, but formal institutions are also very important. One of the examples I can give you from history, which uh, some, some of us might not be aware of, we all know about the first uh, industrial revolution that began, began with a steam engine and gave England world leadership for a long time. And uh, Watt and Bolton, who, who invented it, uh, their common practice to sell their machines was to help mine owners uh, to build engines. They supplied men, uh, so their knowledge, their specialized force to erect them, and they supplied some specialized parts. But the money-making part of their model was not that. It was actually a business model, or which in itself is an institution in the business speak, because the main profit was derived from a license fee uh, based on the cost of the fuel that uh, their customers paid. So they, the customers, by saving on the fuel, had to give them a proportion of that saving. And that was quite an innovative uh, business model and, and an innovative institution, which actually allowed uh, the broader spread of this technology and uh, was quite uh, interesting to observe in terms of institutional changes. I don't have much time to go through everything that I wanted to share with you, so I'll just focus on very important things that I think uh, we make, need to make sure that we don't miss. So I promise to come back to the Generation Z. Generation Z has been studied quite extensively in spite of the fact that it is a very young generation. And there have been a lot of interesting studies, um, which basically they are just approaching universities now, but they are already very different. Uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, the researchers have found that this generation finds difficulty in concentrating. Uh, there are different studies. Some of them say that the attention span is about 18 minutes, then they lose uh, the track. So the lecturers uh, who have 90 minutes lectures in Russia, it's 90 minutes, uh, have to change the topic or make a joke or break it up so that uh, the chunks of no more than 20 minutes are, are allowed. So I totally understand why I have only 20 minutes. Uh, some scholars say that this attention span is even lower. They have difficulty in working with large texts. Uh, they don't read volumes uh, of books that we are used to reading and processing large amounts of information. Uh, they are used to what is called clip mentality. They, they're working on social media a lot. They switch attention from small pieces of text all the time. They deal with those small pieces and abbreviations. Uh, LOL, uh, as one of the comedians said, well, what's wrong with H-A-H-A? -A -A? Uh, ha ha, it actually is uh, also very short, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so they, they're used to that uh, language, which uh, affects the way they express themselves and, uh, and what they read and how they read it. They have difficulty making decisions. They are uh, born with huge amount of choices, too many choices, and uh, navigating through those choices is very difficult. Also, they have a flaw in the sense that they don't deal with difficulties very well. They perceive that success should be guaranteed because they're so used to computer games, and in computer games, uh, if you encounter, encounter difficulty, normally it means that you're doing something wrong, you're in the wrong path. So uh, they're not really used to 
overcoming and going through pains, uh, they, they take the path of least resistance if they can. Systemic thinking is also missing. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lack uh, of um, a lot of skills, really. Uh, basically, it is related to that clip mentality that I mentioned and uh, fragmented attention span. But systemic thinking is the ability to link uh, concepts and notions and facts and phenomena which are not necessarily uh, immediately linkable. And this is where the creativity is very important. A lot of innovation comes from the convergence of different areas of creativity or science uh, and, and uh, disciplines. And systemic thinking is uh, really a, a challenge. Uh, as one of the old, uh, old professors uh, said, uh, well, guys, it's not bad for us old people because we have systemic thinking. We will have this advantage for a while. But uh, the problem is that how do you actually transfer that skill of systemic thinking to the new generation, which is uh, brought up on completely different models and different uh, ways to process information? Multitasking is often quoted as the real talent of the new generation. I, well, yes and no, because uh, multitasking, uh, as again one of the professors said uh, to his students, uh, well, guys, I, I envy you because you multitask, you're Googling in my lectures, you're pretending to listen to my lecture, and you're chatting online at the same time. And one of the students responded saying, yes, we are like ducks. Ducks walk, they swim, they fly, but they don't do any of those tasks very well. So this is also a kind of flaw. It's not great, um, a great skill that can be polished and achieved by everybody. Uh, the challenges to humanity as a whole also exist. Uh, so artificial intelligence has started uh, winning. Uh, it started winning uh, against chess players uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, who was beaten by the machine, said that he was the first knowledge worker who, whose job was threatened by a machine. But uh, it went to quiet for 20 years, and then in 2016, Artificial intelligence won against the world champion in Go. And Go is a very sophisticated game with a lot more options than chess. Uh, that was very worrying. And it learned uh, to play uh, by uh, examining 100,000 human games. And it won. But the real shock came in uh, a year later when AlphaGo Zero developed its own skill by simply playing itself over and over. And this is where the baby started work walking. This is where the real scare, scary uh, steps happen. Uh, so the, some of the challenges uh, are perceived uh, like unemployment. Uh, it's not necessarily true because other evolutions have shown that there's a shift normally in employment. There are new jobs uh, created. So it is really important for the government and for education to catch up and update the skill sets. But the real challenge is that the humanity can become completely irrelevant. The whole of humanity is superfluous, as uh, Yuval uh, Harari has said, the rise of useless class. So this is where it's very important to understand and compete and cooperate with the artificial intelligence. And the current educational systems are not really working very well in that, because they are based on teaching on patterns, based on patterns and algorithms. And you can't compete in algorithm with the machine. So uh, humans need to be continuously reinventing themselves and changing careers. Um, the convenience of manipulation is another threat uh, because there are too many choices. And the artificial intelligence, uh, by stealing your data, can very happily provide your choices for you. Uh, the good news is that algorithms are quite limited. Uh, and I'm aware of my time, so I'll, I'll go very fast through this. Uh, the uh, algorithms are limited, uh, uh, and uh, the right hemispheric uh, thinking is very important. So culture is very important as well, as we're saying. So cultural norms can shape a variety of, um, a variety of uh, choices and behaviors and beliefs which affect innovation and competitiveness of whole countries. This is one of uh, the maps of cultural maps uh, and one of the measurements of 
culture. Ronald Inglehart, you can see South Africa is right in the middle there. Uh, it is uh, halfway on the traditional versus rational values, and it's halfway on the survival versus self-expression values. Uh, another uh, system that I like very much and is very applicable and uh, useful and practical is the cultural dimensions developed by uh, Gerd Hofstede. Um, he started with four dimensions, now there are six of them. And very unfortunately, I don't have uh, enough time to, uh, to cover all this. Uh, but uh, this is something that is really worth looking at because uh, these dimensions really predetermine. China and US are very different on these dimensions. Uh, and they, uh, to a large degree, predetermine how uh, whole countries or groups of people or companies uh, uh, can learn and what values they have uh, and uh, what, um, uh, what particular choices they will make and uh, in, under the uh, economy that is emerging. Uh, last but not least, uh, the, there are already quite a few opportunities provided by the COVID crisis. Uh, a lot of them are quite obvious uh, and they're listed. I'm not going to read them out. I'll read what is in red. And I think what is important and the implications for the uh, educational system is that by changing the educational system values, which the university is supposed to change, uh, the culture that the university is supposed to uh, uh, share and pass on, uh, it will be possible to produce new type of human capital. And there are three key areas here. One is very important to uh, educate multidisciplinary and, um, sorry, this is my own, my own uh, timer, I'm finishing. Uh, multidisciplinary and balanced approach to education. And uh, left hand and right hand, uh, right hand hemisphere intelligence needs to be balanced and developed. Long term orientation is very important. It's one of the dimensions, latest dimensions in the Hofstede's uh, uh, framework that I mentioned before. We need to develop uh, people who think 20 years ahead, who are thinking beyond their own generation. Family businesses might be one of those areas where this is possible naturally. And the last but not least, Socially motivated and interested in social environmental gains, people are the people of the future. It's not just people who are interested in economic development, growth uh, at any cost, but growth which is sustainable, inclusive, and smart. It's socially motivated humans. So these are the key challenges and opportunities for the uh, educational system. And I, I have finished my presentation, but I just wanted to take this opportunity for a few seconds to draw attention to the projects that I'm working on with my colleagues in South Africa. It's a project funded by the European Union. It's a budget support program, uh, which is called Ecosystem Development for Small Enterprise. And this is how we um, met with Nora uh, through one of our uh, webinars. Its objective is to support inclusive and sustainable growth and employment creation uh, with specific objectives related to the competitiveness of SMEs, access to finance, and improvement of regulatory and administrative environment, uh, this component I'm, I'm responsible for. And you can learn a lot more about it by going to the edsmes.org.za. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and for bearing with me. Uh, it, it's, it's a great pleasure to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana. Um, maybe just in two minutes, um, can you give, can you share some thoughts? And I think in your in your slide, uh, the one just before this, the area highlighted in red, maybe spoke a bit um, about that. But many of us at um, universities have a Generation Z um, students that we um, are, are are dealing with in in our classrooms. What are your thoughts around how we can teach and how we can change through creativity and through entrepreneurship? Um, some of those areas that you highlighted in terms of concentration, in terms of multitasking, um, in terms of, of, of the ability to, to, to manage change. Is there, is, do you have any thoughts on that that you can just um, leave behind that we can take back with us?
Can you unmute yourself, Lana? Unfortunately, you're still muted. No worries. Apologies for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's a little bit difficult. I, I can, of course, try to give some examples, but uh, in my previous career, I was a teacher and I also uh, uh, taught at the university college for some time before I changed my career and reinvented myself. Uh, there are no easy solutions, I'm afraid. Uh, there are certain things that uh, teachers can do in the classroom, but uh, the vast majority of cultural values and attitudes and behaviors uh, are formed well before uh, the students uh, enter the university. And um, early education is extremely important, uh, increasingly important. I think there is a lot uh, that has been written already uh, about South Africa, how uh, how education, the quality, not so much quantity, the quality of education is very important. Started with very early age, stimulating kids, keeping them away from screens, interacting with them, uh, developing the, their their uh, psychomotoric uh, uh, aptitude. In the uh, in every class, it is possible to make choices how you challenge your students. And in terms of culture, unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to look at the cultural dimensions. In some countries, it comes naturally, and the educational system reflects that. For example, cultures which are low on uncertainty avoidance, on low on power distance, they encourage this flat level of cooperation, and uh, the students feel free to challenge their tutors. Uh, to uh, ask questions, uh, it's not um, uh, the cultures which are low on power distance uh, value independence of students more and not respect necessarily. So uh, if it is not intrinsic to the culture, then it's very hard to advise how to do that because uh, this is a slower process. Uh, in countries where uh, uncertainty avoidance is quite high, uh, Students and teachers as well prefer closed end solutions. They want to give a, a definitive answer. They don't like answers which are open ended. Um, uh, let me give you an example. When I worked uh, 20 years ago, we had a project in Russia uh, where a, a lot of British uh, professors came to Russia and they were teaching entrepreneurship. And uh, they, they had really a big problem because Russia had a higher level of uncertainty avoidance at that time. It has changed now, uh, and uh, than England. And they didn't like answers which were not providing a very definitive answer. Uh, it, it, they left uh, some room for for thought or consideration, or I don't know, was not really an option. So uh, we had very frustrated British professors who said. Well, I can't give them an answer, and it should be okay. I can't know everything, and uh, they are so disappointed. So, uh, cultural dimensions like uncertainty avoidance. In some cultures, it's very easy uh, for kids, and they're comfortable with uncertainty. They're comfortable with taking new risks uh, or taking exploring new things. Some kids in uh, high uncertainty avoidance uh, countries prefer to be given the answer, uh, and uh, they prefer to to uh, learn through algorithms, something predictable, memorization, uh, reciting back, uh, providing answers that already were given to them. So it really is very culture embedded, uh, but the shifts in this culture need to happen, uh, and this is where the professors need to be creative themselves and aware of their own culture, what kind of cultural values they are promoting. So Thank you for that. Answer. Yes, thanks, Lana. I think it's 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 great that there's a recognition that it's a two-way process, both um, you know from um, from the the professor to the student and from the student to the professor. I also think that um, you spot on when you speak about the importance of, of of basic education, and we often talk about 
from just an entrepreneurship perspective where we talk about the, the importance of in the pipeline that many of those processes begin to start when they are at school level and that, you know, it just becomes reiterated um, in the pipeline when they get to, to higher education. Lana, thank you very much for, for talking to us about the importance of, of cultural values and, and beginning to understand the importance that um, uh, that plays in, in, in terms of the conversation where we speak about um, the human capital. And um, I think it's great that you also touched on the fact that um, a fourth industrial revolution, fifth industrial revolution doesn't always speak to un about unemployment, but it's how the world of work evolves and how we are able to, to redesign and repurpose ourselves. And I think through COVID, we've been exposed to a lot of that. So thank you very much for coming to share with us. Um, we thank look you. forward thank to you. continuing the conversation with you in various capacities okay. and um, Thank you very much. I'm now Thank going to into it's an absolute pleasure. I'm now going to introduce you um, to our final speaker for session three. It's a pre-recorded session. Um, if you allow me just to pull out her CV, uh, it's Professor Mikey Yankees. Professor Mikey Yankees is a technology specialist, researcher, and advisor. She holds a PhD in computer science and has held various st strategic positions in the field. Mikey Yankees is also an academic at the University of the Western Cape and a former W20 South African representative of the W20 Digitization Group, which is a G20 working group looking at the effect of technology on human personal in the digital era. She has been recognized for her contributions to the South African technology sector, and there are various awards. I'm not going to go through um, all of the awards that Mikey's being awarded. She's going to be speaking to us about the digital inclusion. Um, it's always exciting to listen to Mikey. She speaks across um, university students, basic education, as well as the SME sector. And um, I'm now going to allow you to listen to the pre-recorded session that Mikey has prepared for us. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Mikey Jankis from the University of the Western Cape. And today I'll be sharing on the importance of digital inclusion within the South African context. Um, as mentioned, I work in the Department of Information Systems at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, I'm also on social media if you want to connect on anything that um, I talk about today in this presentation, which is titled Digital Inclusion. What do we understand by the term digital inclusion? Well, digital inclusion simply means um, the ability for the community to be able to access digital platforms and fully benefit from digital products and services that are available from different organizations. Now, in order for the community to be able to benefit fully from digital inclusion, digital skills become so pertinent. Digital skills are also quite critical in helping young children aspire to careers and innovation within the field of technology, because it is only through this exposure to digital skills that we can have children from all sorts of backgrounds, from school, from high school to college to university, innovating within the new fourth industrial revolution technology field, and in essence, contributing to that perspective. The power of um, uh, digital platforms and the power of digital inclusion is that education, business and health can benefit from giving the society products um, that are available on digital platforms and in essence have a far greater reach to our different community members within South Africa. Now the realities that we then have to contend with is the challenges of what we can consider as digital inequalities. So what are digital inequalities when we start speaking about digital inclusion? South Africa has a complex history where um, different provinces, different cities, different municipalities were not equally funded and did not equally receive the same sort of resources. So in one part of South Africa, you will have great internet access, you will have good high-speed internet access, you will have schools that are equipped to give children the digital skills um, that they require to move through schools and be exposed to digital skills. You will have community members highly benefiting from um, 
digital platforms and resources because there's good connectivity within those contexts. On the other hand, we then have communities that cannot be able to effectively use the different digital resources and the different digital platforms because there's simply not enough good connectivity. There's not good infrastructure in some schools to enable any form of access to the internet and thus enjoy um, digital platforms. And so offering any service from um, different small business sectors becomes quite difficult uh, because we have these inequalities that sits across our country. One stark reality that we also have to contend with is the reality of South Africa having some of the highest data costs in Africa, being one of the leading countries with high data costs, making it virtually impossible for uh, low income earning South Africans to fully benefit from um, digital platforms and technology as a whole. The South African context in laying down the foundation of our presentation today is also a reality of 30% of youth which are termed youth which is out of school and which is out of work. You also have a, a known uh, figure of 31% unemployment rate. These sit as challenges um, for digital inclusion in a sense that the 30% of youth which sit out of school and out of work may not have had the opportunity for getting digital skills to can be exposed to the benefits that come with um, having digital products and most importantly, accessing education, which can uh, open up or unlock doors for them to be able to innovate in uh, the field of technology or what we call the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so while for, for some youth who are probably have gone through good university or have just gone through a good high school where they've got the required digital skills that can equip them to start thinking and innovating within areas um, around technology in the fourth industrial revolution, you have a huge or a large number of students who cannot benefit from this or large number of youth which cannot benefit from this. So this sits as, as, as a, a very important group of people that we always need to consider when we think about uh, digital products, when we think about the power of, uh, and the importance of digital inclusion within our context and the far reaching implication of having a huge group of the population not being able to access um, digital technologies or products or effectively benefit um, from the digital world. We need to consider the power of being able to gain digital skills throughout your, your, your primary schooling and high schooling, because it is in this opportunity then you can decide that I want to register for a short course on edX. I may not want to get a degree. I want to register on edX and be able to learn more about what artificial intelligence is. Um, I may want to be an entrepreneur within um, the area of, 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 of drones or the area of artificial intelligence. And the power then of digital inclusion across our educational system becomes quite pertinent as the country really moves um, towards the fourth industrial revolution as we cannot really leave anyone behind in this context. Now, according to the Johannesburg Center for Software Engineering, the skills that are currently, um, when we look at the demand and supply and the scarcity, um, software developers, uh, that's a skill that is in high demand currently, uh, computer systems engineers, programmer analysts, um, security experts, so cybersecurity experts, we could see um, in the past weeks, they was in the media, um, data bridges and, and showing the need for South Africa's appreciation of the cybersecurity field and the need uh, for experts within the field, database designers and telecommunications engineers. And we can start thinking of areas such as data scientists and other emerging quite pertinent roles that South Africa is in large um, shortage of. Now what's starting to happen or what has been happening over the years is that because we do not have enough requisite skills or we then face these challenges, you then have small businesses um, having to contend with large organizations 
for uh, people who are highly skilled in technology and technical fields and small businesses starting to be innovative about how can they be able to sustain themselves and yet be competitive in the digital world when they are fighting for a pool of a skill set of employees and innovators um, compared to large well-established organizations which could probably have the financial muscle to be able to pay well these skill sets um, sometimes go to an extent of actually importing skill sets from other countries so it kind of forces small businesses to start thinking and, and startups to start thinking about with minimal resources that the startup or, or the small business has or the medium organization has, how does it then have a competitive advantage um, of competing on, on, on digital products, yet considering the reality of um, the, the digital exclusion of South Africans in, in, in the products that they're able to give out? Now, skills development then play, play such a critical role um, in ensuring that uh, the digital inclusion perspective considers the, the, the critical role of skills development that ultimately can help South African be either innovators or consumers of the digital products and the digital innovation that starts to emerge or that is already emerging um, within the country. And so while we can think of skills development in terms of the many um, in, in, innovations or in terms of the many interventions that both the government and private sector has brought in through different organizations which do um, digital skills development and move beyond digital skills where they start training um, programmers, they start uh, training data scientists, they start filling the gap of the skills that I have mentioned earlier. Um, we need to also think about skills development and ensuring digital inclusion beyond brick and mortar of classroom um, and seeing how we can actually leverage of um, online learning platforms with COVID really thrusting us into uh, having a greater appreciation of online learning platforms and uh, places for young South Africans to actually be able to acquire their, their requisite digital skills um, freely and be able to use them within their startup enterprises. And so um, what we do at the University of the Western Cape is focus on digital skills development um, from the teacher's perspective and young children's perspective. We run what we call technology clubs in different high schools where we teach teachers basic digital literacy skills and help them with innovation on how they can incorporate different tools and in essence teach young children within the different schools how to effectively use different technologies um, to support their learning process. We also have volunteer students who are all graduates of information systems and computer science who run what we call technology clubs within the schools. Now the motivation of running technology clubs was to build um, innovators, what to build entrepreneurs, was to build a pipeline of young children who will ultimately, whether they go to university or whether they don't go to university, be able to solve contextual problems utilizing the skill set that they have. Because it's only once you start getting exposed to the power of artificial intelligence, to the power of robotics, to the power of any of the new areas of technology that we're talking about, then you can start thinking about what are the contextual problems to our community? What are the contextual problems to our society? And looking at where I grew up, how do I then take the skills and the knowledge that I have to address the local South African societal challenges and problems that we actually have? So it's been a journey. Um, we started these clubs in 2016, working to foster innovation right from schooling, because we realized that fostering innovation in university, by the time the students get to university, um, we, may, we have a missed opportunity of making sure that from a young age, we bring role models to the children in schools and expose them to entrepreneurs or people who 
are quite equipped in, in highly technical technology skills um, and innovating um, within their areas. From a university perspective, um, we also incorporate um, innovation in our uh, information systems um, and our technology related subjects. However, teaching our students the power and the importance of using the technology and the digital skills that they have to go back to our community. And we do this um, through service learning uh, programs that we have, for example, in our project management class, the principles of project management for information systems that they've learned, they have to choose social enterprises within our community and work hand in hand with the social enterprises to be able to support those communities um, with the skills that they have and grow, help grow those enterprises within that context. So this is just an example on um, the critical role that digital skills um, play in later on fostering innovation, fostering entrepreneurship, and how digital skills can really thrust the country um, to the next level. When we consider the fourth industrial revolution, um, the new technologies that come into play, um, the internet of things, the use of sensors, sensors, um, robotics, the area of what is called augmented and virtual reality, which is something I'm going to expand on in the next slide, and the area of artificial intelligence. These are often considered probably the high-end um, technology areas of, 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 of the fourth industrial revolution. However, they play such a critical role in ensuring that um, they play such a critical role in ensuring that um, as South Africans, we move towards um, an era of not only being just consumers, but innovators. Um, and we're able to give our gift back to the world of the innovations that come from us um, within the context. And so it's very important that throughout um, schooling, be it from primary education, be it from high school education, be it at university and college, we expose young children to be able to ultimately innovate within these areas and become contributors uh, to the digital economy. And so at the University of the Western Cape, we've begun a, a postgraduate diploma um, that aim to address the skills shortage or that aim to contribute to the emerging area of augmented and virtual reality because we wanted students to start gaining a skill whereby they can ultimately become innovators um, and entrepreneurs within the field of augmented and virtual reality. Now, augmented reality is um, a technology where we use either our smartphone or we use um, head-mounted gear to overlay our real reality with 3D objects. Virtual reality, on the other hand, is where we are completely immersed in a 3D world, um, which is a simulation of uh, a real world. And we are seeing the emergence of augmented and virtual reality technologies being used in advertising sector, where if you want to buy a house, for example, uh, you don't actually have to go to the house physically, but with virtual reality technology, you can have a walkthrough of the full house um, to be able to get a clear understanding of what the seller is actually selling. We also see the use of augmented and virtual reality in esports. So during the lockdown, when trainers couldn't train um, and when uh, sports personnel couldn't go onto the field, through augmented and through virtual reality, they were able to be um, playing with the teammates um, within those uh, 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 different sporting codes. We also um, see uh, uh, developments of augmented reality in educating and exposing um, young children. One of the pictures there is a, a nail picker where you had to pick, virtually pick a nail from one of the red cubicles and moving it to the next one. And with that um, hollow lens, um, you were able to see the different nails um, coming out uh, from the uh, uh, cubicles and uh, moving to the next cubicle without actually holding any physical nail.
And so we, we, we started a program that will enable students coming in from uh, graphic design backgrounds, um, students coming in from programming backgrounds, who ultimately work in the end as a team um, to look at a societal problem and working um, on that societal problem, bring augmented reality or virtual reality innovation that will ultimately be able to use um, within that context. And it has been a great experience to see how young people have gone on to either starting up their own businesses um, or working within organizations, actually introducing this technology as an, a competitive edge to the organization. And so we strive towards ensuring that um, young children become more of innovators and, and not necessarily just consumers, particularly in the fourth industrial revolution, which is critical if we're going to have technology innovations that speak to our South African society. Thank you so much um, for tuning into this presentation. If you'd like to connect on any of the social media platforms where I'm at, please feel free to do that. You can connect also by e email. I'd really like to thank the production team and the conference organizers for such a spectacular conference. And I hope you'll be, you'll, you have been following all the sessions. Thank you very much. where I'm at, please feel free to do that. You can connect also by e email. I'd really like to thank the production team and the conference organizers for such a spectacular conference. And I hope you'll be, you, you have been following all the sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mikey. I think that was a, a great um, presentation, pre-recorded session. And um, it was interesting to, to um, listen to um, the importance around digital um, inequalities. I'm just going to make some few closing com comments. I'd like to thank um, everybody who presented in the session. I think it was a great opportunity to talk um, about breaking new ground through entrepreneurship. Um, just to highlight some of the things that came out of the session that I think is important as takeaways. There was a, um, Bali spoke about the importance of job creation. We all, we all know that we have high unemployment challenges in our country and that if we don't think about entrepreneurship as creating employment opportunities and creating job op opportunities, um, you know, then, then um, we should really look at why we're involved in the sector. There was a focus on African resources, and I, I really enjoyed that um, idea about knowing the names, making a, a conscious decision to know who those people are who have contributed to the African agenda um, on entrepreneurship and how to really utilize those resources. Another important takeaway was around uh, unique value propositions and finding niche areas and how we can use those niche areas to grow and scale our business. And um, for the student premiers, I think the idea of an opportunity driven mindset becomes very important when we talk about the development of an entrepreneurial mindset. And if we don't have an opportunity driven mindset, how that could impact our growth as an entrepreneur. Um, one other um, nugget that I like, which Ellen shared, was around grow wealth in your heart. Um, I think when, when Lana started speaking and spoke, of, she spoke about cultural values and she spoke about um, the importance of, of, of being socially motivated um, in a multidisciplinary fashion. And, and there was a nice link to that whole cultural awareness and, and um, social motivation around growing wealth in, in, your, in your heart. In closure, Mikey spoke about the digital um, um, inequalities. And I think with, uh, with COVID, uh, we've all experienced that. We've seen how access to online learning, um, to schools, and we've, we've been part of the debates and, and the media has allowed all of our voices and given us a space to speak extensively about the inequalities, uh, the high um, cost um, of data. And, and, and one other thing that I think is important as a takeaway, and both Lana and Mikey Yankee spoke about this, was about the importance of fostering innovation 
from school levels and that often when we when students get to university it's almost too late to talk about entrepreneurship and and innovation so how do we build this culture and how do we foster um, a culture of innovation and a culture of entrepreneurship and a development of an entrepreneurial mindset within the in the school system i think um there's a lot of power in in in, in digital um in, in if we want to include um digital learning across various sectors and 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 build that within um various spaces i think it was this was a very a powerful session we had four powerful voices um four women coming to share the the journey um with with us today and um on that note i'd like to close the session i i'd like to thank all the presenters for making the time to be to be part of this to share a bit of yourself i think what was quite unique was that everybody came to share a bit of their own journey um, through the session thank you very much for the opportunity and i wish to the eddie team well with the rest of the conference thank you Thank you so much to Ms. Duncan and the team that spoke um, on that particular session. It was wonderful to hear all your insights. And thank you to you colleagues for being part of today's proceedings and engaging with us on social media and on the Hoover app. Remember, you can continue to ask questions on the app. Um, and you can continue to engage and meet other people on the app. I just want to draw your attention quickly to... Um, some of the meetups that are happening, so coffee or wine or whatever you want to call your networking session. But if you click on your community page on the main screen of the Hoover app, you'll see a number of different sessions. You can create or suggest a session if you'd like to do that. But there's about 20 or so sessions that you can find on here. And just to run through a few of those, um, there's virtual meetups that you'll then see there. And then there's a group that's meeting from Swan North College. Um, if you're looking to find clients, there's a group titled Find Your Clients. There's online incubators and accelerators. Um, there's Balanced Business Platform. There's a couple of COPs on development and academia. Um, there's a business planning group. There's studentpreneurs in technology. There's another meetup on taking control of your business. Um, there's one on the food sector. If you're in Limpopo, there's entrepreneur group just meeting for people in Limpopo, right? <laughs> um, there's how to source funding. There's entrepreneurs in rural areas and how to create an ecosystem for incubators. So if you're interested in joining one of those meetup sessions, do go into your Hoover app, click on community, click on virtual meetups and find a group that you want to be part of. If that group doesn't exist yet, you can suggest a group. I mean, just to take you through a few other things that you can do on Hoover, here's a quick tutorial on how to use Hoover. Jason, did you see the email from the conference organizers? They're asking us to download the Whova event app. Yep. Actually, I used the app in my last conference. Really? What can the app provide that a paper event brochure and website can't? For starters, you can set up your personal schedule and set up reminders. You won't need Wi-Fi or data service to check the schedule. You can see who else is attending the event, send messages, and set up meetings. Planning fun things to do together, sharing a ride, exploring job opportunities, asking for help, all is easy with the community board. Wow, please show me how to use it. Sure, to sign in, enter the email address you used for event registration or your social media account. That'll take you to a profile page. Other attendees will see your profile and network with you, so make it look good. All right, done. That's it. As you are an attendee, now it will show the event page automatically. Oh, but I registered late. See, it doesn't show the event. No worries. You can search for the event here by typing the name. Click the Join button and enter the event invitation code the organizer sent us or request a new one and wait a bit. I remember the code. Perfect. Now we see the basic event information. And on the bottom of the screen, here is the agenda tab. Hoova lists all the sessions on each event day. And we can search an individual session by keyword. The session includes all the details like overview and handouts. You can add this session into your own personal agenda and set a reminder. All the sessions you saved are in my agenda. Now that is handy. During the session, you can click like, ask questions or leave comments and rate the session. Here you can take down your personal notes too. Cool, look at that, speaker profile. Not only for speakers, you can see all the attendees' information. Here's the attendee list. With a little planning, you can make many valuable connections. Here, we can search by keywords including company name or title. See? Here's me. 
there's you. You can see my professional background information and say hi with a click or even start chatting through private in-app messages. And here, you can invite more people to join to the conversation. Just convert it to a private group chat. Okay. Here, what's this? Ah, that's the meeting schedule. You can use it to suggest a time and a place to meet someone. If your request is accepted, you'll see a notification, and it'll also show up in your agenda. Good thing. Now here's the community board. I love this for posting things like, hey, let's have a dinner together. Any good places to hang out? Or, I lost my wallet. Has anybody seen it? And post a job, too. Here, create any topics that you'd like to talk about with other attendees. It's a good place for networking, even before an event. Wow, that'll be useful. Of course, there are other cool features. Things like exhibitors showing coupons and giveaways, live polling, photo sharing, tweets, indoor maps, and surveys. Looks like I'm all set. Great, now enjoy the app. If you have any questions, here, contact Whova right through the app. Welcome back and that was a video tutorial on how to use the Whova app, which we've been using uh, since day one and we'll continue to use it for the rest of today's session as well as day four and day five before we close off this year's EDHE Lhotla 2020. Now we are on to the last session of the day, which will look at rethinking the role of business schools. And we have our session chair, which is Ms. Yoga Veli Nambir, uh, the chief executive officer of Ellen Gray Orbis Foundation. Um, Yogi, famously known as Yogi at Ellen Gray Obus Foundation, was previously the founder and director of the Enterprise Development Academy at Gibbs, which she created to offer scholarship business, uh, based business uh, education and support to entrepreneurs of startups, micro and small enterprises. Just over two years old, the academy team has worked with close to a thousand entrepreneurs across multiple sectors and levels of business uh, so sophistications from spaza shops to owners through to ict startups the academy well thought out and comprehensive design has led to its winning uh, led to it winning an award for most innovative training program at the Women in Construction Award, and that was in 2015. Other accolades include being invited to the present and to present the Academy's model at the annual conference of the Global Con Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers in uh, United States of America, and representing Gibbs as content partner for Global Entrepreneurship Congress in 2017. Prior to this, Yogi was South, Afri South Africa country director of successful Goldman Sachs, a, a 10,000 women initiative, one of the largest and most popular women entrepreneurship program in the world. This $100 million program provides women entrepre entrepreneurs with business and management training and support services to scale up. Uh, welcome, Ms. Yogi. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, it's always um, awkward sitting and listening to your own biography, but uh, thank you so much for, for outlining some of my um, experience there. Um, I'm really excited to join you all and um, welcome and thank you all for joining this session. I know it's the last session for the day, but I'm sure it's going to be an interesting and provocative discussion and is going to keep you at the edge of your seats. So. Um, I'm really excited about this topic for discussion today and that we have such a knowledgeable and powerful um, a group of people assembled. There are stalwarts in the business school sphere who can help us unpack it further. So um, they're good to see some familiar faces uh, around our virtual table as well. So as you know, um, the topic is rethinking the role of business schools as uh, specifically as it relates to entrepreneurship, education, and development. Um, just to open it and to, to lay some context, I think with the precarious condition of the economy and the frightening levels of um, unemployment and inequality in the country, 
a critical component of development is education. And yet it appears that through the ages that this is one sector that has not been sort of fundamentally disrupted. Uh, whether it's in its methodologies, and, and yes, I, I know that there have been some incremental changes, but not significantly so, nor in the content. Now, business schools, as a newer part of the mainstream education system, are facing questions on the same. An article by Ashish Sinha, I think one of our, um, one of our uh, participants had also actually mentioned uh, this article in the um, uh, in in a comment that was made uh, on on the Hoover app had spoken about the potential death of the business school and and the reason that he spoke about this was that he raised some important points with regards to whether business schools were operating on an old model or whether they were keeping relevant based on the trends that uh, that were taking place. Business schools appear to be only or mostly dealing with the needs of big business. And, and this may be related to the, the business model being heavily dependent on corporate um, education and, and, and payments from big business. And yet we know that entrepreneurship we often speak about is the rump of the economy, as Prof. Nick Benadel used to say, um, and, and is required for economic growth and job creation. So this is this generic question that we may need to, to answer within the session or at least seek to, to answer to some degree. But why is it that business schools tend to still have entrepreneurship as a side dish um, rather than at the core of their main menu, uh, such as international institutions, for example, like the Babson College in the US. So um, I'm throwing in some thoughts, but but I think there are other questions that are coming through the app as well already and, the, and that would come up during the discussion. So to help us answer this and other questions um, will be a panel of business school heavy hitters, as, as we mentioned, but first to help us understand how an MBA can be customized to entrepreneurs, we will hear from Dr. Jonathan Marks. Jonathan is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria's um, Gordon Institute of Business Science, where he holds responsibility for the entrepreneurship-focused MBA. He holds a PhD focused on entrepreneurship education from UCT's Faculty of Engineering. And he was a founding director of the Raymond Ackerman Academy of Entrepreneurial Development and his teaching has crossed various disciplines. So also um, note that, that he has the ability to translate entrepreneurship across different sectors and, and has been uh, or is an experienced entrepreneur as well. So welcome, Jonathan. I'll hand over to you. We'll hear from you and then we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Yogi. I'm just gonna share my screen and my presentation. So give me a, a moment. Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm going to be um, sharing a little bit about the um, the, the Gibbs uh, entrepreneurship focused MBA as really a case study of um, of how to engage uh, an ecosystem in um, in building um, this kind of focus area within a business school. I think the intention behind this is to um, to show that one can build relevance with the external community. I really um, loved your point, Yogi about the relevance of business schools to entrepreneurs and that it's often shown as a side dish rather than uh, than the main part of the meal and I think that was always the intention behind this uh, this program was to show how we could create entrepreneurship as a central point of the uh, of an MBA program um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of conceptual underpinning because it shows that this work um, that we've done at Gibbs is not necessarily uh, theoretically or conceptually new and and also that that this isn't just a, a knee-jerk reaction to trying to read what's going on in the market, but rather recognizing that there are strong theoretical underpinnings that, uh, that drive this work. Um, the, um, the work that came out of Babson, which, um, which Yogi mentioned, uh, particularly um, 
professors Neck and Green, um, uh, wrote extensively about uh, known worlds and new frontiers. And this influenced uh, certainly my thinking uh, enormously as I, um, as I thought about this, uh, the design of this, um, this MBA focus. Um, they, they recognize that our thinking around entrepreneurship um, has to some extent progressed across, um, across three worlds. That we began thinking about the, uh, the monolithic personality of the entrepreneur, the world of the entrepreneur, uh, thinking that if we could somehow dissect and understand the personality of that individual and, and their, their traits, we'd be able to build a, a better entrepreneurship program or a more successful entrepreneur. This in some way gave way to the, uh, the process world of entrepreneurship. Um, and this is really the world of, of understanding that entrepreneurship is a process, it's a world of planning and prediction, and it's often categorized by the notion of a business plan. Um, certainly as I've uh, worked with uh, universities around South Africa and a few around the world, I've noticed that most programs tend to stop here. Um, and, and both Nick and Green uh, agree that the reason why they do is that the business plan usually presents a, a beautiful document to assess, uh, that further down it becomes more and more difficult to assess. So we we often stop at this point, but we do see some programs focused far more on the uh, the process world. Um, and I think particularly um, Yogi's work with the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation is deeply um, immersed in the space around entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial motivation. And so this is really the world of, of how do we think? And if you could understand some of the thinking and cognitive ability of an entrepreneur, we could then begin to construct a different kind of program. Um, where we've tried to uh, locate the program um, at Gibbs is, is around this notion of new frontiers, um, recognizing that entrepreneurship is in fact not a process but rather a method. Um, and that if we can teach a set of uh, principles, um, that would far better suit um, the work that entrepreneurs are going to do in the world around them, given the fact that entrepreneurship is simply not predictable. And providing, um, if you will, a recipe uh, that they must somehow apply um, usually falls down with the first encounter with the real world. Um, I also began this with the belief that, um, that entrepreneurship could be taught, but it was both a science uh, and an art, and that we needed to somehow recognize that both of these uh, disciplines and inputs um, were, were necessary. Um, and so the approaches with the design of this program is uh, to the extent possible, the beginnings or starting of a business. Um, I've tried to create as much uh, design-based learning as possible, realizing that links with things like uh, design thinking and the lean startup as, as methods were very useful, uh, providing um, sort of serious games and simulations, and then a bias towards uh, reflective practice. Um, I have a deep interest in Kolb, as I know many people do who teach entrepreneurship and they understand the necessary um, inputs for, for experiential learning. But I've tried to build this program uh, somewhat beyond Kolb, knowing that his work largely rests uh, within workplace-based learning rather than um, higher education. And so um, I'll, I'll first just go through a few of the bullet points and then discuss the, uh, the diagram on the right. Um, and so the intention was to try and create learning in as authentic and real world and a setting as possible to try and um, make each classroom encounter each engagement through um, the MBA a connection to something real that students could anchor their learning within that real life uh, experience um, also to try and spread teaching methods and pedagogical approaches across a range of, of methods and that's really what the diagram on the right um, alludes to and then um, also trying to move students from, from being uh, sort of passive consumers of content to active co-creators of knowledge. Um, this proves, has proven to be one of the most difficult tasks because uh, so much knowledge comes at students rather than them helping to co-create and seeing uh, experiential learning as the act of co-creation. So with respect to the pedagogical approaches, uh, this, this diagram on the right really attempts to show um, not necessarily a hierarchy of learning, but rather a spread of learning activity, that some learning is uh, theoretically or reflective theoretical learning. Um, and, and this could be uh, very traditional didactic approaches. Um, some of it is more active theoretical, and an example of this could, for instance, be um, a case study discussion in the class. Then uh, reflective uh, um, applies 
side learning uh, would be, for instance, the, um, the engagement with um, uh, on a consulting project, sort of a live engagement with, uh, with the external environment. And then active applied is where, where students are actually taking that learning and building something that's meaningful to them. And so rather than trying to create everything in one quadru quadrant that we often think it should be active applied, um, really where I try to focus was um, finding a spread um, across those, uh, those four domains. So let me quickly run through the structure of this program and also give you a sense of um, how I've built links to the ecosystem and what the intention was. The program is not particularly complex in its design, and I think there's some elegance in the simplicity. We go through some recruitment and selection. Students complete a series of core courses along with the rest of the MBA cohort. We then have a, a set of electives that students uh, complete, a global module, and then a summative portfolio, which replaces the traditional research report. Um, the recruitment and selection, the intention here is what I'm really looking for is uh, attitude, motivation and commitment. Far, I'm far less interested in the nature of the business idea or what the aspirations are as, as an entrepreneur, but I'm really interested in, in their sense of commitment. Um, the MBA electives are a curated set of electives that students engage with. So we've ring-fenced a set of um, three electives out of the five that students would take that are uh, purely entrepreneurship focused. Um, with the global module, um, we have groups that visit either Israel or Chile, and this is to see a very active uh, ecosystems in, um, in play. Obviously, this year, we haven't undertaken those trips. And then the summative portfolio um, uh, consists of five elements, and the intention here is to um, have a portfolio that shows what a student can achieve, what they can do, not only in the given time, but that they can take that into the world, ideally as an entrepreneur and start a business, but also within their own business environments and show what, the, uh, what their abilities are. In terms of building structures with the um, uh, with the ecosystem. Um, we'll only begin that this year because um, we, we only graduated our first cohort last year, but I'll begin to include uh, selected alumni in some of that selection process to try and get a sense from students who've been through the program to help them sort of help me guide who they think will survive through this process. Um, the MBA electives is probably one of the, uh, the best areas to, to engage with the ecosystem. And, and what I've tried to do is to design electives uh, that don't include guest speakers, but rather include practitioners as co-deliverers of content. And I'll give one example of an elective in, the mo uh, in a moment that really has made, um, made great use of, uh, of this approach. And also the same elective has used um, uh, active live projects as part of the assessment. And this has worked uh, exceptionally well from, uh, from 2019 to 2020. We've almost doubled the intake into the single elective. And I think because of this, um, this approach, um, the, the global module really exposes them to a much broader entrepreneurial ecosystem. And again, the choice of those uh, organizations we meet are very much focused on capacitating um, students' understanding of, um, of entrepreneurship and also helping them to build uh, global networks. And then Finally, the, um, uh, the, the summative portfolio, um, the, the major input here is around uh, selecting the right set of supervisors who come out of this ecosystem. We've also uh, now just in the last, uh, the last month uh, appointed an entrepreneur in residence, um, a successful entrepreneur based in Johannesburg is playing a role not only within this program, but across the school with respect to, uh, to entrepreneurship. And then something that many of you do is uh, judging and pitching uh, competitions. Um, and, um, and part of that is around um, building relevance with a, um, a, a, with, a, with a, a community, really, of, um, uh, of investors. So um, I'd like to just uh, go through the, the, the example first. So my, my entrepreneurial finance elective, um, what I've done is I've split the content up into various topic areas and had uh, investors actually develop and deliver some of this content. So they, they get involved in a little, bit case, a little bit of case delivery and conversation, and they also get involved in actual uh, delivery of content. And I think the great advantage here is that um, it becomes profoundly relevant to students when, uh, when they can actually hear about what a term sheet is from an actual investor who uses this technology. Um, and this tool. And then, um, for instance, we run a due diligence project with an angel investing group. These are live investment deals that students run a due diligence on as part of their, um, their assessment. We do some pitching to, to investors. And then we attempt to make these links from, uh, from theory to practice in real time in, um, in the classroom. 
I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip to uh, a, some quick lessons learned, which might be useful for those listening in. Um, I think the first is to have a, a really purposeful ask from the ecosystem when you begin to engage. I think it's, it's far better to go out and say, I'd like you to teach on a program than say, can you become involved in the school? Um, I've found that uh, a few high value links is far greater than a very broad set of links, which often don't activate. Um, I think I've tried to focus on links that are valuable to students post the MBA, not just through the, um, the program cycle. And then um, I've, I've remained very close to students through this program. I meet with them every single week. Um, and this really helps me understand what they need. And I, I think this is a sort of axiomatic thing for all of us in entrepreneurship, the idea of being uh, close to customers. Um, as a final uh, um, quote, I just wanted to put this up, um, and it's, it's something that I think should guide all of us in business schools. Um, it's intriguing to notice that this is 30 years old, uh, this quotation, um, but I, I, I feel so strongly that the world has become um, more complex and, and more unstructured, and really what we should be looking for is mechanisms that allow us to educate students in this way, and I'm convinced that um, this entrepreneurship program and its links to between the school and, and the outside world, creating these porous boundaries is really what, uh, what helps to, uh, to create that relevance. Um, Yogi, I think that's probably my time. So um, I'll stop there. Sure, thank you so much, Jonathan. That's really interesting. And, and I see a lot of um, uh, you know, application for others who are working in the space and who are trying to to uh, look for the lessons, the learnings within what others are doing um, to, to be able to just make their programs more robust. So I think um, that that was a really great presentation. It gives us a couple of minutes to just take some um, questions. And I noted that there was a question um, on the app, which was by Simon Gifford and his um, ask was how do we adapt an MIT based approach to entrepreneurship in an African context? The book recently released by Edward Roberts, Celebrating Entrepreneurs, gives some great ideas, but not all are directly replicable to SA. Mm. Thanks, uh, thanks, Yogi, and thanks for that question from Simon. Um, yeah, I think the beginning point is to not try and adapt a program from MIT and think about how that works here. I think our context and ecosystem is unique as it is everywhere in the world. And I think uh, scholars in the ecosystem space will tell you almost the beginning point is you cannot uh, um, adopt wholesale any program from anywhere in the world, take ideas, but you've got to build something that's very much homegrown. And so I think the context at, at uh, MIT and the context in, uh, let's just take it in, in Johannesburg, it gives is so profoundly, profoundly different. Our needs are different. The kind of students we get into the programs are different. And the contribution we have to make back into the ecosystem is so different. It's probably the wrong the wrong point uh, to uh, to begin. Um, but that said, there are probably uh, some great learnings that, you know, I think that one could strip out of programs anywhere in the world. And then I think the best beginning point is to gather a group of students together and say, what do you need? What What's going to be meaningful for you uh, as, as an entrepreneur? I see there's a which, question. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, which is exactly how one would start a business, right? Exactly, so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. so, exactly yeah. right. Uh, did you know to another question coming? Yes, um, on our chat, there's a question from Anthony Hill saying, why is finance only elec an elective? Is there a core MBA course mm -hmm. in finance that, um, so yeah, Anthony, um, this, this is an elective called entrepreneurial finance. There's absolutely a core course in finance, uh, but uh, I, pre I present this uh, sort of spin on finance and very much focused on um, how to raise capital, how to deal with investors um, and, and really how to build a, a sort of economic logic around uh, your, your finances, projecting them forward for a, a business that has no revenues yet. So, so that's really the focus of that elective. Um, great. Thank you for that. I have a question, um, Jonathan, with regards to, you know, and you spoke to the entrepreneurial mindset and you know that's something that we work with young people on. Um, mm. What is the balance in your program between the entrepreneurial mindset and, and getting and nurturing that versus mm. the actual sort of business management side of it? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Yogi. Um, you guys have done incredible work around mindset, and I think in many ways leading the pack in South Africa for our understanding of it. Um, I, I've tried this year to begin to build that, that mindset and uh, internal capability. Students are getting fr f about um, uh, somewhere between 70 and 80 hours of input around that. So it's substantial. It happens every single week. Every week we have a Zoom call for 45 minutes. It's been going on since March and it'll continue on until December um, as a way of building that um, that external capacity or that sort of internal capacity that helps drive your, your business success. I've assumed that a lot of the skill to start a business is quite easy to to adapt quite or adopt quite easy to reach for and and we can find that in so many places but i guess building capacity and mindset is really my my great focus yeah yeah thank you very much for that um i uh i don't see any other questions but please audience if you have any please keep them um coming um but thank you very much for uh, that presentation Jonathan, um, I hope that all those who have the means to um, actually register for this program. It's something I think that we've needed in South Africa. So, um, so thank you for putting that together. Um, just perhaps you. you could give some quick details on how someone could find out more about it. Yes, of course. Um, so the MBA entrepreneurship focus uh, is part of our core MBA program. And so you would apply for the MBA um, at Gibbs, you would go through your, your first year, and then you'd get a chance to, uh, to participate in the entrepreneurship focus. We also have a consulting focus, which runs in a similar way. Um, we, we have quite a strict selection criteria. Um, we, we get about, last year, we got about 90 um, applications for our program and selected just under 40. Um, and so, yes, of course, we'd, we'd love to have people uh, participate in our MBA and then choose this as their specialization in their second year. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Jonathan Mark. Thanks, Yogi. Um, great to hear from you. So we're going to go on to the panel discussion now. And so I'm going to just introduce you to Dr. Randall Jonas, and he's a highly respected uh, leader and consultant in strategy, leadership, business modeling, entrepreneurship, and management development. Um, he's also, uh, and, and maybe more importantly, a, the director of the Nelson Mandela University's Business School, located in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. He is also the chairperson of the National Association of Business Schools in South Africa, SAPSA. And he's a former CEO and a current director of a private company. So, Randall, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce your guests and to facilitate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yogi. And um, Eric, I'm very, very pleased to be with all of you people on this Lahota this afternoon. Let me first introduce to you our panel, our esteemed panel. Uh, first of all, Professor Nicola Klein, one of our panelists from all the way from Rotterdam. She's the Dean for Executive Education at the Rotterdam School of Management. Uh, then followed by her is uh, Professor Fulu Nitswere. He is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Management Sciences at the University of, of Technology, Durban University of Technology. And is also the Vice Chair of SAPSA. And together with uh, them is Professor Jonathan Postapelli, he is also the Dean and Director of Henley Business School, as well as the second Vice Chair of SAPSA. So that is our panel for today. My name is Randall Jonas, and I will be leading the discussion with my esteemed colleagues around the role of business schools in entrepreneurship development. I recall distinctly last year when I had a chat with Dr. Clark, and she asked me about the role of business schools, and if we could become more prominent in the work that Eddie is doing to really inculcate uh, entrepreneurial mindset and develop the entrepreneurial economy in our country. So I think, you know, to start off, you know, just about a few weeks ago, we had our second or third Lakotla or dialogue as deans and directors talk about the relevance of business schools in the country, and particularly in a country that faces so many deficits in terms of unemployment, inequality, and poverty, and battling with SMEs that are not able to make the great as far as the business startups are concerned. And we then, of course, pin down our philosophy of social prosperity and the ethos of leaders that are actually building a culture of economic development and 
an equal economic system that really translates this prosperity for all the people. And out of that came the idea of working with big business and not just big business, all businesses, in fact, to actually help the country on the road to recovery, particularly in the post-COVID world or in the so-called low-touch economy. We had a speaker from Belgium to help us understand the dynamics of that. So today we are asked to look at a number of questions and some of them are actually perceptions around the role of business schools and what they are. So I thought maybe I should frame the questions to my colleagues more generally as follows. And the question, the first of all is, of course, should business education be redeveloped to build business leadership for the 21st century? In other words, should we relook at our role in the ecosystem that Jonathan actually has alluded to and how should we do that? Jonathan has actually prompted our, our thoughts around what we can be done. And then the second more important question, which is linked to that, of course, is how can we blueprint a cutting edge curriculum for business education that develops entrepreneurial mindsets and entrepreneurial culture to develop and make a contribution to the entrepreneurial economy? I'm going to put this as an open question to my colleagues now. I'm not going to go into the detail yet. I'm going to ask maybe John, if you want to fire the first salvo, and then maybe we can look at Nicola and Fulu after that. John? Sure. Thanks, Rana. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jay. Uh, great, uh, great talk and wonderful work you're doing at Gibbs. I have to say that Nicola is still a Gibbs aficionado, having been the head of it now in Rotterdam. So um, I really enjoy this subject because when you think about what entrepreneurship is, it's, uh, we, we tend to think it's a thing, like you can pick it up somewhere. I mean, it, it really isn't. I mean, what is it? I mean, and we make this, I remember when I first came across an academic who started talking about entrepreneurship, I was quite sort of angry with him because he made this thing about something I thought was in us all. It's a bit like creativity or innovation. Um, and so it's been broken down through various research and studies in all sorts of different ways. And we're also, we, we're launching a program now. So it's a level five program, a high certificate in entrepreneurship for, for people who are learning, but haven't got the capacity, haven't had the chance to get onto the academic sort of pathway yet. And um, we're doing this with a guy called Alan Rays, who I'm sure most people know. And, and Alan's a really cool guy because he's be, he, he talks about these ideas of prosperators, of, of building people's energy um, throughout different stages of entrepreneurship. And I also ran an innovation and incubation center in New Zealand for a while and sat on the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor board there. And um, so I've thought a lot about this and how business schools should, should encourage it. I don't think it's something that in some sense people haven't done for many, many years. Good business schools have always encouraged people to be innovative, to build their own businesses, to think about things in sort of startup ways. But I think part of the problem over time is that business schools became overly institutionalized, both in their, in their management, but also in their knowledge and, and the way they taught. Um, so while case studies are wonderful simulations reality, there's a stage beyond where there's reality itself. And that's where you push action learning, experiential learning, and all the reflective work that Jonathan was talking about there into practice. Um, it's fascinating, I think, that a large part of entrepreneurship is resilience. You know, how do you build a study showing that if you teach resilience rather than, than traditional entrepreneurial skills, you do well in terms of revenue growth and margins. Um, so how do we get people to become more resilient and more engaged in the world? And how do you get people to see opportunities from all the mess? How do you quieten yourself um, to see what's around and, and not leap at the first thing without thought, but how do you do that without becoming, you know, embedded in sort of analysis paralysis? So there's a lot of personal work in being an entrepreneur that I think is really important. Beyond that, there's a whole lot of frameworks that really help you understand. Because what academics do, they talk to clever people who've done things. So they'll talk to Yogi, who runs that, uh, the, the Orbis Foundation, which is a great thing. Um, and they'll talk to other people who've made things happen. And they'll interview them and they'll draw out sort of patterns of good behavior from them. And they'll create a, a model of causality and they'll call it the theory. And so you learn the theory. And the idea is that if you learn that from all these good people who've invented it, you will learn much faster than they did. But the, the thing to remember, it wasn't the academics who invented that. Uh, it's the entrepreneurs who invented a good practice. The academics are very good at interpreting it and packaging it for fast learning. So the really important thing, if you want to learn about entrepreneurship, is talk to entrepreneurs. 
and be your own researcher, really develop your own capability to understand it. The business schools can give you frameworks to see things. I mean, if you look at the night sky, the first thing you'll look around all the stars and you'll say, wow, there's Orion, or there's Scorpio, or there's the Southern Cross. And that's because somebody has made patterns in the night sky for you. And now when you look at the night sky, you see those patterns. And that's what frameworks do. They help you see those patterns, but they also blind you to the rest. So you've got to watch out with academics like us, because otherwise we'll give you loads and loads of theory that you'll think is truth, but it's not. It's just a way of looking at the world. You've got to learn to unpack all that. So what great business schools do and great educators do, they give you the theory, but they make you skeptical about it. And they say, work out your own stuff and challenge your theory. And that's why the experiential work that um, Jonathan was talking about there is so important. You give people an idea, you make them reflect, they try it out, and then they say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't work exactly. You don't make a god of the academics. Forget that. We're just servants for your learning. And what you do then is you push them into practice and you make them try things out and you build their confidence. And the final thing you do with, with academics is um, when, well, when learning as well, you've got to, I used to be a pilot and pilots make a lot of mistakes, you know, but luckily for you, they don't make mistakes that are big. They're very good at catching mistakes early. And that's what entrepreneurs need to do too. They need to be very good at observing, seeing unintended consequences, seeing reality as it is, not as they would wish it to be. And from that, patterning what's going on and immediately leaping forward. And the final thing I think entrepreneurs really need is they need to have some knowledge. And it's not about loving money. You've got to love your purpose, but you've got to know money because the money is a bit, the thing that you use to sustain this enterprise and this mission you're doing. So learn about money, not like an accountant, but how to use it properly. And I think the great educators weave all those things into something that when you're part of it, you feel vital and engaged and you feel yourself growing. And that's what the great business schools can do. And luckily we have some very good business schools in South Africa and SABSA represents them all and promotes them all. And um, so with Gibbs and UCT and Fulu School and um, you know, Stellenbosch and so many more, we're, we're gifted with wonderful educators in South Africa. So please use them to help you with your entrepreneurship endeavors, but don't worship them, whatever you do. You know, Thank you, John. Purpose. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to get to the other panelists now, and I want to pose a very, very important question that was posed to us in the brief for this uh, discussion today. There seems to be the perception that we are rather absent in, in, in developing entrepreneurs or being active in developing uh, in entrepreneurship development. Is that true, Nicola? Do you think we as a sector have been absent or, or we've not been as impactful? What's your view? Yes and no. Hi, Randall. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be seeing so many colleagues here and to be participating in this conversation. Thank you. I, I think just as John has spoken about what is entrepreneurship, this question of is, is about what are business schools and what are business schools good for and who do we serve needs to be thought of. So I think there's been progress made in advancing um, the entrepreneurial agenda, and I'll, I'll come back to what I think that might mean. Um, but certainly it's, uh, it's not enough. So um, I, I think a few comments, if I may, Randall, just around business schools. I think the first thing that um, is, is perhaps a little different from us in our South African context is that traditionally our business schools have been for post-experience learners. So when we look at a business school, um, uh, like Babson, for example, it's also including undergraduate learners. And so when we look at business schools, I think what we need to do in the South African context is look a little more broadly than who we call business schools, Gibbs. So for example, if I look at Gibbs as part of the University of Pretoria, there's a faculty of um, commerce uh, and economic sciences um, that is working extensively with undergraduate students, and we shouldn't be ignoring that. Um, so, so that's the first point is that we're often serving these post experience learners. I think traditionally, um, the focus on business schools and the flagship program of business schools has been their MBA. Uh, and um, I, I think it would be folly. I often see people confusing MBA equals business school. It's a critical part of a business school, but there's an awful lot of other things that business schools are doing. Um, I think what is absolutely critical is that business schools have to vest in their local communities. So it's all very well serving um, a, a market of people who are going to get an MBA. And Jonathan's presentation has been a great example of showing a trend which 
um, I think manifests in certain parts of the world. Um, we see it, for example, I've seen the same um, engaging with students, for example, at Stanford who start an MBA wanting to become entrepreneurs. Um, here in Rotterdam, where I recently moved, I was having a conversation today with the careers office and they were speaking about getting a job in corporate. And I said, but surely some of our MBAs here at, at Rotterdam want to become entrepreneurs. Oh, minute, tiny. And I compare that to a group that I met at Stanford some years ago who started their MBA with the specific purpose in mind. So I think that varies, but we do so much more as business schools in serving the advancement of entrepreneurship. And I think that there are three very important roles that we play. Um, the one is this question of teaching. And I've been interested, and I'm sure it's come up here at this conference, these terms that I, I um, came across, this notion of are we ab about entrepreneurship, for entrepreneurship, or through entrepreneurship? And I think we are trying to advance the agenda from something that is purely these entrepreneurs as some sort of uh, objective thing that we look at over there, as opposed to saying that we are working with entrepreneurs. Have we done enough in terms of Jonathan is exposing the Gibbs entrepreneurs to um, nuances and practicalities around funding? Have we taken it the step that it should be going that Jonathan has been pushing for for years and certainly that I think Yogi mentioned when she was at Gibbs, this question of actually, well, what are we doing to help them find the funding and actually start those funding pots in collaboration? So there is this question around learning to become an entrepreneur and how we enable that. That happens in the MBA, it happens beyond the MBA. There's the question of advancing thought leadership. Jonathan's spoken eloquently about constellations and about frameworks and about us learning about what we need to be doing and whether that's about benchmarking studies or entrepreneurial mindset or all of the other things that um, people who are experts in entrepreneurship do. And the third thing um, that um, perhaps links into the teaching is this notion of capacitating entrepreneurs, but also um, uh, convening ca capability. Um, business schools really need to be playing a role in being core in those broader entrepreneurial ecosystems. And so coming together in a conversation like today's is really important. It's not just about teaching entrepreneurship um, and researching entrepreneurship. Um, Randall, if I may, I'm going to make two very quick points and then I'll, I'll keep quiet. Um, the one point is if we don't see more interdisciplinary, interfaculty work on entrepreneurship, we're not going to push the needle as far as we can. So, for example, the University of Pretoria, um, a year, a year and a half ago, we started forming a very, con very con taking very concrete actions to ensure that the Faculty of Engineering and the built environment, economic and management sciences and Gibbs work together. We need faculties collaborating. The second point I want to make, and I think Yogi alluded to it, is I see quite a lot of confusion about this term, the entrepreneurial university. Um, it's very hard to um, focus on entrepreneurship when actually we are not particularly entrepreneurial in our own thinking and our own ways of doing and our own mindsets. And so I think ultimately, if we are to be authentic in our pursuits to promote entrepreneurship, we are going to have to think about how to become more entrepreneurial in our own thinking. Um, and certainly that is something that I experienced at the University of Pretoria, a desire to unlock some of the ossification in the systems. But I see it here at, um, at Erasmus University of which Rotterdam School of Management is, is their undergrad and postgraduate business school. Also this desire to make sure that we are challenging the sort of old orders around these things. Thanks, Randall. Thank you very much, Nicola. Very, very thoughtful uh, uh, of your contribution there for, for us to understand exactly what needs to be done in our teaching, learning, and research. But also, more importantly, the fourth element, our engagement. And Fulu, uh, maybe it's about time that you tell us what you think. Uh, are we engaging enough or too little or none at all with SMMEs, uh, particularly that are in, in, in great need of, of assistance to develop the entrepreneurial system uh, or the entrepreneurial acumen as it were. Your thoughts on that, Fulu? Thank you very much, Randall, and uh, nice to meet you colleagues once more. Uh, well, I think uh, there are quite a number of issues associated with um, engagement. One of those is uh, relevance. Uh, business school ought to be relevant so that they service uh, the context within which they operate. Now, a business school that operates in New York ought to be slightly different from a business school that is operating in Johannesburg or in, in Soweto for argument's sake. 
because the needs and the interest of the society and the economy generally varies. Now we uh, in South Africa for argument's sake are faced uh, with a society that is uh, uh, of rampant unemployment, specifically among the youth. And we ought therefore to respond to that particular challenge. And the best way we could respond to that is uh, prioritize entrepreneurship. A lot of these youth who sit down, some with qualification, basic qualification, some without, uh, could become uh, the biggest source of um, uh, uh, spanning the, 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 the future economic growth of this particular country. The other big question is that of social responsibility. Uh, it is an important element uh, and relates closely to, to, to impact. And it is an element that many associations of business schools uh, have over time tried to prioritize that business schools ought to be socially responsible in other words, we are not there only to make money and uh, churn out publications, and, but let's do work that is relevant to, 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 to the society and communities in which we find ourselves. So that is uh, extremely important. Now, I think business school historically have been very rigid uh, in form and uh, as, as structure and as well as systems. Uh, that they operate. I mean, historically, business schools were meant to uh, service uh, the corporate sector, um, making it a, a little bit uh, difficult uh, to service those that cannot easily access um, a, a, a business school outside of the corporate sector. Now, the idea is how do we make sure that those outside of the corporate sector have got access to business school? Uh, some of the practical examples are um, business schools that work with uh, um, uh, um, business chambers for argument's sake. Uh, you find business chambers operating uh, in alliance with business schools and uh, uh, small businesses that are affiliated to those business chambers are able to access some of the programs of the, 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 the business school. I think Nikolai made a very uh, important point that when we look at the business school, we've always associated it with the MBA and the business school is not the MBA. So accessing the business school might imply accessing short learning program that advance and support entrepreneurship. Uh, beyond just the MBA program. So there are quite a lot of uh, uh, engagements that we ought to enter in order to make sure that the business school is relevant, it is responsive, and it is impactful uh, in our societies and addresses the most pertinent questions that confront our, our communities. Thanks, Randall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fulu. And just maybe just on a follow-up on the whole story of SME engagement, uh, from my side at the University of Nelson Mandela University Business School, we've been quite active in actually engaging in collaboration with the local business chamber and the local municipality to actually engage SMEs and looking at their training and skill development needs to actually empower them to be more successful in their businesses. And we've been running a program for the last four years. Uh, our funding, of course, has dried up as far as the municipality is concerned. But our business chamber and ourselves have been looking towards other funders to do that. And there is a clear need for, for that kind of engagement. And we acknowledge it freely from our sector that we have got a very important role to play to develop the SME sector to be more successful. Jonathan's proposal uh, and uh, the concept that is actually put together speaks to one of the most important uh, problems China faced by the SMEs is, of course, accessing finance. And I think you've gone, come together with some very, very practical ways in which that, that could be done. Another element and should be an important elective is marketing, how to access markets, you know. And I think again there, Jonathan, the whole idea of, <laughs> I think I like your word, practitioners, bringing practitioners to the, and not guest speakers, you know, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the class is important and to develop that sector. You know, um, I thought it's also maybe important to share some you know, useful information with our audience today, uh, Yogi. The, the uh, Financial Mail annually does a survey on the MBA and executive education. 
And both reports are quite comprehensive and covers all aspects of executive education and MBA. And they, they really uh, survey a cross section of role players and stakeholders in our sector to really measure the true impact of business education on, on, on the economy and, and in business, and so to speak. And, 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 you know, we have actually just looked at our 2019 figures, and it is quite interesting to note that a lot of students that actually do the MBA and just come into a business school actually come and, and participate in our education offering simply because they want to start their own business. They want to become entrepreneurs, and they believe that a, a postgraduate or executive education, whether it's an MBA or a short learning program, will give them the necessary skills because we understand that entrepreneurship is teachable. Um, it is only how we actually do that that is important. If it's teacher-centered, forget about it. You are teaching a job seeker. If it's student-centered, you can rest your bottom dollar on it. That person will become an entrepreneur, so to speak. And so what we did was we looked at some of the statistics and I would like to share that with you, but I'm gonna maybe ask some of our panelists, I think Kulu or John, I, I don't think Nicola has got the statistics with her because she left our shores. <laughs> um, but maybe just to share some of the information, su such as the throughput rates, for example, many people that have finished the MBA with an entrepreneurship elective, for example, have actually become entrepreneurs, very successful at their business. I, for example, had the privilege this year to actually sit down with, um, with uh, David Furlong of the, Fur of the Financial Mail with some of our entrepreneurs and he interviewed them and to find out what impact the course had on them going into business and succeeding at their business, so to speak. I don't know, John, maybe you want to share some of the data coming from the Financial Mail and maybe then Fuller as well. Let's start with John. Well, um, I, I won't talk so much about the financial data because the financial mail data, because that's interesting. But what I would like to add to that before we dive into that is that business schools are more are broader than accredited programs. And there was some very interesting research by a group called Heavy Chefs, who, who help entrepreneurs, and, and Jay will know those, um, saying that a lot of entrepreneurs have got about 2,000 rand a month to spend on, on self-study, and they do it between 12 at night and 3 in the morning. Um, and so it's a very, very different environment. You've got some people who will come through the entrepreneurship uh, way, but there's two or three other ways. One is short programs, credentialization programs. You can get them online. You can get through the government. You can go internationally and find those things. They're all over the place. Um, and you, you can get them on Udemy, Coursera, and those sort of places. And th they will help you build, so you can build your own academy. The other thing is executive programs, well-designed executive programs, allow you to take people and you can do entrepreneurship. I mean, I'm sure the other business schools have done it. We've certainly done it with some of our clients where they've developed projects and businesses through their unaccredited programs and they've turned into businesses. So you've got a wealth of capability as business schools and options open for you to inspire people to build businesses and also to fail in business because the big thing about, the big thing about learning is that you know, long, long learning costs a lot of effort and time and money. If you can accelerate the learning by creating flight simulators, you can have small failures in contained environments. So the design of the learning is what really, really matters. And I think if you looked across the broad sway of the business schools and you saw what they were doing in multiple ways, you would see a lot of entrepreneurial people emerging who might change in their own companies, build businesses, or even do side hustling, which then employs other people as well. So it's a very wide church, if you like, this idea of entrepreneurship. So let's think about it broadly and creatively, because in that way, we can start building the people to build the jobs we need in South Africa. Thank you very much, John. Wonderful. Colleagues, I think we've reached the end of our contribution. There's a number of questions coming in. And I'm going to put this first question to Nicola. Um, I think there is a perception, Nicola, that our schools are uh, elitist. We serve a corporate business only. We have no time and place for, for small businesses. So the question asked here, is why are business schools so expensive if their goal is to create future entrepreneurs? Do you have a take on that? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a really important question. So there are two issues there. The one is the sense that business only serves, that business schools only serve big business. I think it's interesting to look back in the history of business schools. So business schools went through, they were founded in the late 1800s, early 1900s, with a focus really on 
the profession of management. It was never about serving big corporates. It was about making sure that we tried to professionalize management. And then we went through a phase as schools, particularly after the, the Second World War, where as businesses grew, so we became more corporate. And, and that word, of course, has its own background, but corporate in nature and, and became quite technocratic. I and mean, there was a period where you went to business school as an engineer to learn finance, to go and work for a big bank. Um, and that was what you were doing. And I think we're seeing a major swing away from that um, to include, yes, corporate, but to accommodate entrepreneurship and accommodate um, smaller size businesses. So I think that's part of the evolution of business schools. I think when it comes to um, the costs of business um, education, as somebody who um, was held accountable for Gibbs's um, finances um, acutely over the years, um, we have quite high cost models of education in business schools. So I think this notion um, that prevails internationally that business schools are somehow cash cows and uh, delivering significant profitability back to their universities, I really would question. I was very pr profoundly grateful for the University of Pretoria that they were never actually gouging Gibbs. Um, but these are expensive programs to run. So our challenge is how do we use technology to start changing some of these things. I think John makes really good points about credentializing. So I don't think it's that business schools are price gouging. I don't think it's that we are selling things and making obscene profits at all. Um, I do think that our programs are expensive to deliver. Um, and we're going to have to try and use that agility to think about different ways of doing this. Otherwise, we are going to become increasingly irrelevant. I think the other thing that's important is the relationship that we have with business is, is really critical here. If we look, Yogi mentioned the well in the introduction of her, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program, a lot of the entrepreneurship work that we do at Gibbs, particularly where it's fostering micro-entrepreneurship, is only thanks to the funding of big corporates in the case of, you know, Alan Gray and um, the role that the foundation has played. So the question here is not only to look at business, uh, business schools, it's to also look at business and say, to what extent can business schools actually do this job for business, but we need to be in partnership. We don't have a great history of endowments in South Africa. Um, that comes from the US and uh, I wish it were different and it's not going to be different for a while, but we've got to work with business to try and make this happen. Thank you very much, uh, um, Nicola, for that. I've got another question coming through and I think we've got just about three minutes left. Uh, Yogi, is that fine? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. Uh, there's another question here that seems to speak to what would business schools need to do? And I'm going to ask Kulu to maybe answer this question. To, 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 to do differently to support entrepreneurs. In other words, what would decolonization mean with respect to entrepreneurs education, especially within the realm of a business school? Kulu, would you like to challenge, take that one on? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, um, uh, Randall, I think uh, Jonathan did talk to that when he made his presentation earlier on, that uh, the, education provision of the business school ought to be looked at um, differently. Uh, that the teacher, and, and I think John uh, Foster, uh, Peggy also, also uh, did allude to this uh, partially, that the educator in as far as uh, business education is concerned, uh, ought to be the learner sometime. Uh, so that you are able to use your lenses uh, to introspect, to understand, and perhaps to develop theories uh, uh, on how entrepreneurship formulates and how entrepreneurs are able to champion certain ideals that you ordinarily would not have thought about. Now, I think that requires a totally different uh, frame of reference. Uh, because a lot of scholars who teach in business school are uh, taught the traditional route <clears throat> of looking at theory and the implementation of theory or evaluation of theory and uh, not the other way around. So there is quite a lot that we can learn uh, from business schools and we ought to document uh, how entrepreneurship manifests, how uh, 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 small businesses um, uh, and ideas um, 
uh, mushroom and manifest and become uh, big ideas and big corporates in the future. I mean, the, the same could be said about the, if we use the analogy of the banking system. Banking system used to bank only corporates, uh, but over time, uh, they've learned and, and even new banks had to emerge uh, to cater for the needs of those who were uh, locked out of the banking system because uh, they could not be supported because their ideas were deemed to be uh, not aligned to uh, corporate uh, or the general uh, corporate, co corporate hegemony. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, Randall. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. For, there's just one question that I want to put to, to, to Nicola. Um, so, um, and, and this question came up now, and I think it's an important question that we need to deal with before we close off the session. Um, the, the, the whole subsidization or subsidy system of higher education uh, seems to have been a very, very controversial matter in the last number of years. And the core business of, of universities is to provide and wider access to higher education to the marginalized and so on. And yet we find that business schools our sector are charging so-called exorbitant prices for its courses. How do we sort of bridge that gap uh, in a way? What can government do, big business do, and what can business schools do? Nicola, maybe you could maybe just finally just give us that sort of a chart, how we can do that. And maybe some, some of your experiences in Rotterdam. So I think some of the mandate uh, or some of the questions for this goes to what is the mandate of business schools. And I think what's really important is that skills um, capacitation um, does not only sit with business schools. It does not only sit with universities. And I think we do come from a, a, a space um, in the country where I don't think we're thinking broadly enough about how we gain the requisite skills um, to ensure that we can serve the economy and grow the economy. Um, so I, I think it's important that business schools are not going to solve everything here. I mean, my point, um, Randall, around um, how we start looking at delivering costs more effectively is, is I think, critical. But what I, what I worry about is that um, I, I think scholarship and the creation of thought leadership needs to be directed in terms of practical impact. I think having people dreaming up new theories that nobody can use um, is dangerous. But at the same time, if we lose all of the scholarship, a significant amount of costs that goes to running universities, uh, of which business schools are part, um, uh, goes towards funding that the development of that thought leadership. And my, my, my concern is that if we lose that, and if we lose sight of the fact that business schools are part of the academy and are part of universities, and we only look at the aspect of the learning programs, um, we're going to miss out on being able to actually develop solutions for tomorrow as well, because that's what the research should be generating. So I don't, I don't have an answer here, um, Randall, in terms of, well, they must just cut things. And I think practically government can't afford to fund much more. Um, so how we, how we think about this over the longer run, we're going to have to put our heads together and get smart about it. Thank you very, very much, Nicola, uh, for, for taking on that last question. I want to thank my panel for, 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 for the time and for the contribution this afternoon, also to Eddie and particularly to Nora Clark and her team for allowing us and giving us this platform as a sector to put together some of our thoughts as how we see the, 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 the business school of the future in the new normal. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity, Yogi, to your facilitating the session. And Jonathan, thank you very much for the thought-provoking new model that you are developing for the uh, entrepreneurship focused MBA. I wish you good luck. And we will certainly invite you to a session at SAPSA to maybe present to our other deans and directors because as it is, we want to work together as a sector in the, for the benefit of our country. Once again, Yogi, thank you very much. And thank you to our panel and to our audiences. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Um, that was um, a, a great panel and lots of um, insights. I was going to summarize some of the highlights, but I have so many notes, it's hard to get mm -hmm. through everything um, and, and to uh, just be repeating everything you've said. But, but thank you all. Um, I think uh, just if I could give just two or three tidbits about entrepreneurship being both a science and an art. It's something we say at the foundation uh, uh, quite a lot as well. So to balance that in your programming, um, you know, design-based um, thinking and learning is important. I think very uh, crucially anchoring learning in, in the real world. 
um, someone had said in, in the chats uh, before this session, you can't learn to swim in a library. And, and I think that's exactly yeah, that's exactly yeah. it and, and what um, Jonathan was conveying as well. So, so there needs to be, in his words, porous boundaries between the real world and, and the learning. I think it's, it's really important, this idea of, uh, of, of business schools being entrepreneurial um, in their own thinking uh, as much as they want to be teaching um, entrepreneurship. And, and John's point about business schools can only give you a framework to see the patterns, but they can blind you to the rest. Uh, so I really like the point about, I think I'm going to use that, John, um, make you skeptical about the theory. And, and academics are only servants of the learning and they present that to you. And, and entrepreneurship is really about the critical thinking that follows. So thank you all for this engaging discussion. I think we could we could have mined um, wisdom from you for a few more days uh, if we just spoke on this uh, topic, but uh, time is limited. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you, Eddie, for allowing us to have this, uh, this important discussion and uh, wish you a good day further. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, Yogi, for facilitating that session for us. And that brings us to the end of today's program. Um, it's really been an engaging uh, day. And uh, we welcome everybody to continue having a conversation on the Hoover app. Share your thoughts. Let us know uh, what you think on the different sessions. You're welcome to also uh, message our speakers just to get more information from their sides, ask them more questions. And who knows, you might get more points. 100%. Please also do connect with us on all social media at EDHE, Student Entrepreneurship. Um, and remember, you can join the conversation there using the hashtag EDHE Lakhotla 2020. Um, and you can also hashtag Afrotech. Now, while we're going to be ending the virtual stream, the event doesn't end because we are online. I mean, there's a few meetups, virtual meetups that are happening. So if you go onto your app and you click on community and then you click on virtual meetup, um, you'll find three events happening this afternoon. Afternoon. So at 4.30, there's a group meeting to help you with finding your clients. Um, at 4.30 as well, there's another group meeting on online incubators and accelerators. So if you're interested in that, you can join them. And then at 6 p.m., there's a group meeting um, to discuss balanced business platforms. So if you're interested in any of those topics, do RSVP to either one of those groups, and you'll see in the groups is details on where the meeting will be. So for example, um, the one on finding your clients is happening on WhatsApp because of the person who's um, suggested it, and that's where they want to have the meeting. So really, you can just connect with people in that way. And if there's something there that doesn't exist, that you would like to connect and meet with people on, that you'd like to network with people about, you can definitely go ahead and create your own session um, to have your own virtual meet up in the virtual lobby with our guests. Um, I know people have been engaging with us and sharing with us, and we've got a winner to announce. So, Ntigi, uh, earlier on we mentioned a photo competition, a selfie competition, and we have a winner. And that is Tlo Chilopo who will also get a 150 rands take a lot uh, voucher and she has won for the day. Awesome, and she can just contact us via the app yes. um, or someone from the team will reach out to you to help make sure that you receive your take a lot voucher. Indeed, indeed. Cool, and we're still watching that leaderboard. If you haven't managed to get your points up, you have all night to do that. Um, go to the exhibitors section, like the, ver the various um, exhibits, um, click on their individual pages and you can enter a draw to win a lucky prize from them. Um, comment, ask questions. Uh, you can also go to the sponsors section and engage with the sponsors. You can go to the documents and video section and everything you do has points attached to it. So that's how you can get your name up on the leaderboard and we'll be announcing that winner tomorrow. And until tomorrow, where we are meeting tomorrow at eight o'clock in the morning, we will be going live on our live stream. We will see you there and thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>